Section 17 The Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant Transcendental Doctrine of Elements Part 2nd Transcendental Logic First Division Transcendental Analytic Book 2 Transcendental Doctrine of the Faculty of Judgment or Analytic of Principles Chapter 3 of the ground of the division of all objects into phenomena and noumena. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lisa Cho. The Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant, Section 7. Chapter 3 of the ground of the division of all objects into phenomena and noumena. We have now not only traversed the region of the pure understanding and carefully surveyed every part of it, but we have also measured it and assigned to everything therein its proper place. But this land is an island and enclosed by nature herself within unchangeable limits. It is the land of truth, an attractive word, surrounded by a wide and stormy ocean, the region of illusion, where many a fog bank, many an iceberg, seems to the mariner, on his voyage of discovery, a new country, and, while constantly deluding him with vain hopes, engages him in dangerous adventures, from which he never can desist, and which yet he never can bring to a termination. But before venturing upon this sea, in order to explore it and its whole extent, and to arrive at a certainty whether anything is to be discovered there, it will not be without advantage if we cast our eyes upon the chart of the land that we are about to leave, and to ask ourselves, firstly, whether we cannot rest perfectly contented with what it contains, or whether we must not of necessity be contented with it, if we can find nowhere else a solid foundation to build upon, and, secondly, by what title we possess this land itself, and how we hold it secure against all hostile claims. Although in the course of our analytic we have already given sufficient answers to these questions, yet a summary recapitulation of these solutions may be useful in strengthening our conviction by uniting in one point the momenta of the arguments. We have seen that everything which the understanding draws from itself, without borrowing from experience, it nevertheless possesses only for the behoof and use of experience. The principles of the pure understanding, whether constitutive a priori, as the mathematical principles, or merely regulative, as the dynamical, contain nothing but the pure schema, as it were, of possible experience. For experience possesses its unity from the synthetical unity which the understanding, originally and from itself, imparts to the synthesis of the imagination in relation to apperception, and in a priori relation to and agreement with which phenomena, as data for a possible cognition, must stand. But although these rules of the understanding are not only a priori true, but the very source of all truth, that is, of the accordance of our cognition with objects, and on this ground that they contain the basis of the possibility of experience, as the ensemble of all cognition, it seems to us not enough to propound what is true. We desire also to be told what we want to know. If, then, we learn nothing more by this critical examination than what we should have practiced in the merely empirical use of the understanding, without any such subtle inquiry, the presumption is that the advantage we reap from it is not worth the labor bestowed upon it. It may certainly be answered that no rash curiosity is more prejudicial to the enlargement of our knowledge than that which must know beforehand the utility of this or that piece of information which we seek, before we have entered on the needful investigations, and before one could form the least conception of its utility, even though it were placed before our eyes. But there is one advantage in such transcendental inquiries which can be made comprehensible to the dullest and most reluctant learner. 
This, namely, that the understanding which is occupied merely with empirical exercise and does not reflect on the sources of its own cognition, may exercise its functions very well and very successfully, but is quite unable to do one thing, and that of very great importance, to determine, namely, the bounds that limit its employment, and to know what lies within or without its own sphere. This purpose can be obtained only by such profound investigations as we have instituted. But if it cannot distinguish whether certain questions lie within its horizon or not, it can never be sure either as to its claims or possessions, but must lay its account with many humiliating corrections when it transgresses, as it unavoidably will, the limits of its own territory, and loses itself in fanciful opinions and blinding illusions. That the understanding, therefore, cannot make of its a priori principles, or even of its conceptions, other than an empirical use, is a proposition which leads to the most important results. A transcendental use is made of a conception in a fundamental proposition or principle, when it is referred to things in general and considered as things in themselves. An empirical use, when it is referred merely to phenomena, that is, to objects of a possible experience. That the latter use of a conception is the only admissible one is evident from the reasons following. For every conception are requisite, firstly, the logical form of a conception, of thought, general. And, secondly, the possibility of presenting to this an object to which it may apply. Failing this latter, it has no sense, and utterly void of content, although it may contain the logical function for constructing a conception from certain data. Now, object cannot be given to a conception otherwise than by intuition, and, even if a pure intuition antecedent to the object is a priori possible, this pure intuition can itself obtain objective validity only from empirical intuition, of which it is itself but the form. All conceptions, therefore, and with them all principles, however high the degree of their a priori possibility, relate to empirical intuitions, that is, to data towards a possible experience. Without this, they possess no objective validity, but are mere play of imagination or of understanding with images or notions. Let us take, for example, the conceptions of mathematics, and first in its pure intuitions. Space has three dimensions. Between two points, there can be only one straight line, etc. Although all these principles and the representation of the object with which this science occupies itself are generated in the mind entirely a priori, they would nevertheless have no significance if we were not always able to exhibit their significance in and by means of phenomena, empirical objects. Hence, it is requisite that an abstract conception be made sensuous, that is, that an object corresponding to it in intuition be forthcoming, otherwise the conception remains, as we say, without sense, that is, without meaning. Mathematics fulfills this requirement by the construction of the figure, which is a phenomenon evident to the senses. The same science finds support and significance in number. This, in turn, finds it in the fingers, or in counters, or in lines and points. The conception itself is always produced a priori, together with the synthetical principles or formulas from such conceptions, but the proper employment of them, and their application to objects, can exist nowhere but in experience, the possibility of which, as regards its form, they contain a priori. That this is also the case with all of the categories and the principles based upon them is evident from the fact that we cannot render intelligible the possibility of an object corresponding to them without having recourse to the conditions of sensibility. Consequently, to the form of phenomena to which, as their only proper objects, their use must therefore be confined, inasmuch as, if this condition is removed, all significance, that is, all relation to an object, disappears, 
and no example can be found to make it comprehensible what sort of things we ought to think under such conceptions. The conception of quantity cannot be explained except by saying that it is the determination of a thing whereby it can be cogitated how many times one is placed in it. But this how many times is based upon successive repetition, consequently upon time and the synthesis of the homogeneous therein. Reality, in contradistinction to negation, can be explained only by cogitating a time which is either filled therewith or is void. If I leave out the notion of permanence, which is existence in all time, there remains in the conception of substance nothing but the logical notion of subject, a notion of which I endeavor to realize by representing to myself something that can exist only as a subject. But not only am I perfectly ignorant of any conditions under which this logical prerogative can belong to a thing, I can make nothing out of the notion and draw no inference from it because no object to which to apply the conception is determined, and we consequently do not know whether it has any meaning at all. In like manner, if I leave out the notion of time, in which something follows upon some other thing in conformity with a rule, I can find nothing in the pure category, except that there is a something of such a sort that from it a conclusion may be drawn as to the existence of some other thing. But in this case, it would not only be impossible to distinguish between a cause and an effect, but as this power to draw conclusions requires conditions of which I am quite ignorant, the conception is not determined as to the mode in which it ought to apply to an object. The so-called principle, everything that is contingent has a cause, comes with a gravity and self-assumed authority that seems to require no support from without. But, I ask, what is meant by contingent? The answer is that the non-existence of which is possible. But I should like very well to know by what means this possibility of non-existence is to be cognized if we do not represent to ourselves succession in the series of phenomena, and in this succession an existence which follows a non-existence, or conversely, consequently, change. For to say that the non-existence of a thing is not self-contradictory is a lame appeal to a logical condition, which is no doubt a necessary condition of the existence of the conception, but is far from being sufficient for the real objective possibility of non-existence. I can annihilate in thought every existing substance without self-contradiction, but I cannot infer from this their objective contingency in existence, that is to say, the possibility of their non-existence in itself. As regards the category of community, it may easily be inferred that, as the pure categories of substance and causality are incapable of a definition and explanation sufficient to determine their object without the aid of intuition, the category of reciprocal causality in the relation of substances to each other, commercium, is just as little susceptible thereof. Possibility existence and necessity nobody has ever yet been able to explain without being guilty of manifest tautology, when the definition has been drawn entirely from the pure understanding. For the substitution of the logical possibility of the conception, the condition of which is that it be not self-contradictory for the transcendental possibility of things, the condition of which is that there be an object corresponding to the conception, is a trick which can only deceive the inexperienced. Footnote 37. In one word, to none of these conceptions belongs a corresponding object, and consequently their real possibility cannot be demonstrated if we take away sensuous intuition, the only intuition which we possess, and there then remains nothing but the logical possibility that is, the fact that the conception or thought is possible, which, however, is not the question. What we want to know being whether it relates to an object and thus possesses any meaning. Back to text. 
It follows incontestably that the pure conceptions of the understanding are incapable of transcendental, and must always be of empirical use alone, and that the principles of the pure understanding relate only to the general conditions of a possible experience, to objects of the senses, and never to things in general, apart from the mode in which we intuit them. Transcendental analytic has accordingly this important result, to wit, that the understanding is competence of fact nothing a priori, except the anticipation of the form of a possible experience in general, and that, as that which is not phenomenon cannot be an object of experience, it can never overstep the limits of sensibility, within which alone objects are presented to us. Its principles are merely principles of the exposition of phenomena, and the proud name of an ontology, which professes to present synthetical cognitions a priori of things in general in a systematic doctrine, must give place to the modest title of analytic of the pure understanding. Thought is the act of referring a given intuition to an object. If the mode of this intuition is unknown to us, the object is merely transcendental, and the conception of the understanding is employed only transcendentally, that is, to produce unity in the thought of a manifold in general. Now a pure category, in which all conditions of sensuous intuition, as the only intuition we possess, are abstracted, does not determine an object, but merely expresses the thought of an object in general, according to different modes. Now, to employ a conception, the function of judgment is required, by which an object is subsumed under the conception, consequently the at least formal condition under which something can be given in intuition. Failing this condition of judgment, schema, subsumption is impossible, for there is in such a case nothing given which may be subsumed under the conception. The merely transcendental use of the categories is therefore, in fact, no use at all, and has no determined or even, as regards its form, determinable object. Hence it follows that the pure category is incompetent to establish a synthetical a priori principle, and that the principles of the pure understanding are only of empirical and never of transcendental use, and that beyond the sphere of possible experience, no synthetical a priori principles are possible. It may be advisable, therefore, to express ourselves thus. The pure categories, apart from the formal conditions of sensibility, have a merely transcendental meaning, but are nevertheless not of transcendental use, because this is in itself impossible, inasmuch as all the conditions of any employment or use of them, in judgments, are absent, to wit, the formal conditions of the subsumption of an object under these conceptions. As, therefore, in the character of pure categories, they must be employed empirically, and cannot be employed transcendentally, they are of no use at all, when separated from sensibility, that is, they cannot be applied to an object. They are merely the pure form of the employment of the understanding in respect of objects in general and of thought, without its being at the same time possible to think or to determine any object by their means. But there lurks at the foundation of this subject an illusion which it is very difficult to avoid. The categories are not based, as regards their origin, upon sensibility, like the forms of intuition, space, and time. They seem, therefore, to be capable of an application beyond the sphere of sensuous objects. But this is not the case. They are nothing but mere forms of thought, which contain only the logical faculty of uniting a priori in consciousness the manifold given in intuition. Apart, then, from the only intuition possible for us, they have still less meaning than the pure sensuous forms, space and time, for through them an object is at least given, while a mode of connection of the manifold, when the intuition which alone gives the manifold is wanting, has no meaning at all. At the same time, when we designate certain objects as phenomena or sensuous existences, thus distinguishing our mode of intuiting them from their own nature as things in themselves, 
it is evident that by this very distinction we as it were place the latter considered in this their own nature although we do not so intuit them in opposition to the former or on the other hand we do so place other possible things which are not objects of our senses but are cogitated by the understanding alone and call them intelligible existences noumena now the question arises whether the pure conceptions of our understanding do possess significance in respect of these latter, and may possibly be a mode of cognizing them. But we are met at the very commencement with an ambiguity, which may easily occasion great misapprehension. The understanding, when it terms an object in a certain relation phenomenon, at the same time forms out of this relation a representation or notion of an object in itself, and hence believes that it can form also conceptions of such objects. Now as the understanding possesses no other fundamental conceptions besides the categories, it takes for granted that an object considered as a thing in itself must be capable of being thought by means of these pure conceptions, and is thereby led to hold the perfectly undetermined conception of an intelligible existence, a something out of the sphere of our sensibility. For a determinate conception of an existence which we can cognize in some way or other by means of the understanding. If by the term noumenon we understand a thing so far as it is not an object of our sensuous intuition, thus making abstraction of our mode of intuiting it, this is a noumenon in the negative sense of the word. But if we understand by it an object of a non-sensuous intuition, we in this case assume a peculiar mode of intuition, an intellectual intuition, to wit, which does not, however, belong to us, of the very possibility of which we have no notion, and this is a noumenon in the positive sense. The doctrine of sensibility is also the doctrine of noumenon in the negative sense, that is, of things which the understanding is obliged to cogitate apart from any relation to our mode of intuition, consequently not as mere phenomena, but as things in themselves. But the understanding at the same time comprehends that it cannot employ its categories for the consideration of things in themselves, because these possess significance only in relation to the unity of intuitions in space and time, and that they are competent to determine this unity by means of general a priori connecting conceptions only on account of the pure ideality of space and time. Where this unity of time is not to be met with, as is the case with noumena, the whole use, indeed the whole meaning of the categories is entirely lost, for even the possibility of things to correspond to the categories is in this case incomprehensible. On this point I need only refer the reader to what I have said at the commencement of the general remark appended to the foregoing chapter. Now, the possibility of a thing can never be proved from the fact that the conception of it is not self-contradictory, but only by means of an intuition corresponding to the conception. If, therefore, we wish to apply the categories to objects which cannot be regarded as phenomena, we must have an intuition different from the sensuous, and in this case the objects would be a noumena in the positive sense of the word. Now, as such an intuition, that is, an intellectual intuition, is no part of our faculty of cognition, it is absolutely impossible for the categories to possess any application beyond the limits of experience. It may be true that there are intelligible existences to which our faculty of sensuous intuition has no relation and cannot be applied, but our conceptions of the understanding, as mere forms of thought for our sensuous intuition, do not extend to these. What, therefore, we call noumenon must be understood by us as such in a negative sense. If I take away from an empirical intuition all thought, by means of the categories, there remains no cognition of any object, 
for by means of mere intuition nothing is cogitated, and from the existence of such or such an affection of sensibility in me, it does not follow that this affection or representation has any relation to an object without me. But, if I take away all intuition, there still remains the form of thought, that is, the mode of determining an object for the manifold of a possible intuition. Thus, the categories do, in some measure, really extend further than sensuous intuition, inasmuch as they think objects in general, without regard to the mode, of sensibility, in which these objects are given. But they do not for this reason apply to and determine a wider sphere of objects, because we cannot assume that such can be given, without presupposing the possibility of another than the sensuous mode of intuition, a supposition we are not justified in making. I call a conception problematical, which contains in itself no contradiction, and which is connected with other cognitions as a limitation of given conceptions, but whose objective reality cannot be cognized in any manner. The conception of a noumenon, that is, of a thing which must be cogitated not as an object of sense, but as a thing in itself, solely through the pure understanding, is not self-contradictory, for we are not entitled to maintain that sensibility is the only possible mode of intuition. Nay, further, this conception is necessary to restrain sensuous intuition within the bounds of phenomena, and thus to limit the objective validity of sensuous cognition. For things in themselves, which lie beyond its province, are called noumena for the very purpose of indicating that this cognition does not extend its application to all that the understanding thinks. But, after all, the possibility of such noumena is quite incomprehensible, and beyond the sphere of phenomena, all is for us a mere void. That is to say, we possess an understanding whose province does problematically extend beyond the sphere, but we do not possess an intuition, indeed, not even the conception of a possible intuition, by means of which objects beyond the region of sensibility could be given us, and in reference to which the understanding might be employed assertorically. The conception of a noumenon is therefore merely a limitative conception, and therefore only of negative use. But it is not an arbitrary or fictitious notion, but is connected with the limitation of sensibility, without, however, being capable of presenting us with any positive datum beyond the sphere. The division of objects into phenomena and noumena, and of the world into a mundus sensibilis and intelligibilis, is therefore quite inadmissible in a positive sense, although conceptions do certainly admit of such a division. For the class of noumena have no determinate object corresponding to them, and cannot therefore possess objective validity. If we abandon the senses, how can it be made conceivable that the categories, which are the only conceptions that could serve as conceptions for noumena, have any sense or meaning at all, inasmuch as something more than the mere unity of thought, namely a possible intuition, is requisite for their application to an object? The conception of a noumenon, considered as merely problematical, is, however, not only admissible, but, as a limitative conception of sensibility, absolutely necessary. But in this case, a noumenon is not a particular intelligible object for our understanding. On the contrary, the kind of understanding to which it could belong is itself a problem, for we cannot form the most distant conception of the possibility of an understanding which should cognize an object, not discursively by means of categories, but intuitively in a non-sensuous intuition. Our understanding attains in this way a sort of negative extension. That is to say, it is not limited by, but rather limits, sensibility, by giving the name of noumena to things, not considered as phenomena, but as things in themselves. But it at the same time prescribes limits to itself, for it confesses itself unable to cognize these by means of the categories, and hence is compelled to cogitate them merely as an unknown something. 
I find, however, in the writings of modern authors, an entirely different use of the expressions, mundus sensibilis and intelligibilis, which quite departs from the meaning of the ancients, an acceptation in which, indeed, there is to be found no difficulty, but which at the same time depends on mere verbal quibbling. According to this meaning, some have chosen to call the complex of phenomena, in so far as it is intuited, mundus sensibilis, but in so far as the connection thereof is cogitated according to general laws of thought, mundus intelligibilis. Astronomy, in so far as we mean by the word the mere observation of the starry heaven, may represent the former, a system of astronomy such as the Copernican or Newtonian, the latter. But such twisting of words is a mere sophistical subterfuge to avoid a difficult question by modifying its meaning to suit our own convenience. To be sure, understanding and reason are employed in the cognition of phenomena, but the question is whether these can be applied when the object is not a phenomenon and in this sense we regard it if it is cogitated as given to the understanding alone and not to the senses. The question, therefore, is whether, over and above the empirical use of the understanding, a transcendental use is possible, which applies to the noumenon as an object. This question we have answered in the negative. When, therefore, we say the senses represent objects as they appear, the understanding as they are, the latter statement must not be understood in a transcendental, but only in an empirical signification that is, as they must be represented in the complete connection of phenomena, and not according to what they may be, apart from their relation to possible experience, consequently not as objects of the pure understanding. For this must ever remain unknown to us. Nay, it is also quite unknown to us whether any such transcendental or extraordinary cognition is possible under any circumstances, at least whether it is possible by means of our categories. Understanding and sensibility with us can determine objects only in conjunction. If we separate them, we have intuitions without conceptions or conceptions without intuitions. In both cases, representations, which we cannot apply to any determinate object. If, after all our inquiries and explanations, anyone still hesitates to abandon the mere transcendental use of the categories, let him attempt to construct with them a synthetical proposition. It would, of course, be unnecessary for this purpose to construct an analytical proposition, for that does not extend the sphere of the understanding, but being concerned only about what is cogitated in the conception itself, it leaves it quite undecided whether the conception has any relation to objects or merely indicates the unity of thought, complete abstraction being made of the modi in which an object may be given. In such a proposition, it is sufficient for the understanding to know what lies in the conception, to what it applies is to it indifferent. The attempt must therefore be made with a synthetical and so-called transcendental principle. For example, everything that exists, exists as substance, or everything that is contingent exists as an effect of some other thing, the delicate of its cause. Now I ask, whence can the understanding draw these synthetical propositions when the conceptions contained therein do not relate to possible experience, but to things in themselves, noumena? Where is it to be found the third term, which is always requisite pure sight in a synthetical proposition, which may connect in the same proposition conceptions which have no logical, analytical, connection with each other? The proposition never will be demonstrated, nay, more, the possibility of any such pure assertion never can be shown, without making reference to the empirical use of the understanding, and thus, ipso facto, completely renouncing pure and non-sensuous judgment. 
Thus, the conception of pure and merely intelligible objects is completely void of all principles of its application, because we cannot imagine any mode in which they might be given, and the problematical thought which leaves a place open for them serves only, like a void space, to limit the use of empirical principles, without containing at the same time any other object of cognition beyond their sphere. End of section 7「But we are met at the very commencement with an ambiguity, which may easily occasion great misapprehension. » Section 18 The Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant Transcendental Doctrine of Elements Part Second Transcendental Logic First Division Transcendental Analytic Book Two Transcendental Doctrine of the Faculty of Judgment, or Analytic of Principles. This reading by Carl Manchester, 2007. Of the equivocal nature or amphiboly of the conceptions of reflection from the confusion of the transcendental with the empirical use of the understanding. Reflection, reflexio, is not occupied about objects themselves for the purpose of directly obtaining conceptions of them but is that state of the mind in which we set ourselves to discover the subjective conditions under which we obtain conceptions. It is the consciousness of the relation of given representations to the different sources or faculties of cognition, by which alone their relation to each other can be rightly determined. The first question which occurs in considering our representations is to what faculty of cognition do they belong? To the understanding or to the senses? Many judgments are admitted to be true from mere habit or inclination, but, because reflection neither proceeds nor follows, it is held to be a judgment that has its origins in the understanding. All judgments do not require examination, that is, investigation into the grounds of their truth. For, when they are immediately certain, for example, between two points there can be only one straight line, no better or less immediate test of their truth can be found than that which they themselves contain and express. But all judgment, nay, all comparisons, require reflection, that is, a distinction of the faculty of cognition to which the given conceptions belong. The act whereby I compare my representations with the faculty of cognition which originates them, and whereby I distinguish whether they are compared with each other as belonging to the pure understanding, or to sensuous intuition, I term transcendental reflection. Now. The relations in which conceptions can stand to each other are those of identity and difference, agreement and opposition of the internal and external, finally of the determinable and the determining, matter and form. The proper determination of these relations rests on the question to what faculty of cognition they subjectively belong, whether to sensibility or understanding. For on the manner in which we solve this question depends the manner in which we must cogitate these relations. Before constructing any objective judgment, we compare the conceptions that are to be placed in the judgment, and observe whether there exists identity of many representations in one conception, if a general judgment is to be constructed, or difference if a particular. Whether there is agreement when affirmative and opposition when negative judgments are to be constructed, and so on. For this reason, we ought to call these conceptions conceptions of comparison, conceptus comparationis. But as when the question is not to the logical form, but as to the content of conceptions, that is to say whether the things themselves are identical or different, in agreement or opposition, and so on, the things can have a twofold relation to our faculty of cognition, to wit, a relation either to sensibility or to the understanding and as on this relation depends their relation to each other. Transcendental reflection, that is, the relation of given representations to one or the other faculty of cognition, can alone determine this latter relation. Thus we shall not be able to discover whether the things are identical or different, in agreement or opposition, etc., from the mere conception of things by means of comparison, comparatio, but only by distinguishing the mode of cognition to which they belong, in other words, by means of transcendental reflection. 
We may, therefore, with justice, say that logical reflection is mere comparison, for in it no account is taken of the faculty of cognition to which the given conceptions belong, and they are consequently, as far as regards their origin, to be treated as homogeneous, while transcendental reflection, which applies to the objects themselves, contains the ground of the possibility of objective comparison of representations with each other, and is therefore very different from the former, because the faculties of cognition to which they belong are not even the same. Transcendental reflection is a duty which no one can neglect who wishes to establish an a priori judgment upon things. We shall now proceed to fulfil this duty, and thereby throw not a little light on the question as to the determination of the proper business of the understanding. 1. Identity and Difference When an object is presented to us several times, but always with the same internal determinations, qualitas et quantitas, it, if an object of pure understanding, is always the same, not several things, but only one thing, numerica identitas. But if a phenomenon, we do not concern ourselves with comparing the conception of the thing with the conception of some other, but, although they may be in this respect perfectly the same, the difference of place at the same time is a sufficient grounds for asserting the numerical difference of these objects, of sense. Thus, in the case of two drops of water, we may make complete abstraction of all internal differences, quality and quantity, and the fact that they are intuited at the same time in different places is sufficient to justify us in holding them to be numerically different. Leibniz regarded phenomena as things in themselves, consequently as intelligibilia, that is, objects of pure understanding, although on account of the confused nature of their representations he gave them the name of phenomena, and in this case his principle of the indiscernible, principium identitas indiscernibilum, is not to be impugned. But, as phenomena are objects of sensibility, and as the understanding in respect of them must be employed empirically and not purely or transcendentally, plurality and numerical difference are given by space itself as the condition of external phenomena. For one part of space, although it may be perfectly similar and equal to another part, is still without it, and for this reason alone is different from the latter, which is added to it in order to make up a greater space. It follows that this must hold good for all things that are in the different parts of space at the same time, however similar and equal one may be to another. 2. Agreement and Opposition When reality is represented by the pure understanding, realitas naumanon, opposition between realities is incogitable such a relation, that is, that when the realities are connected in one subject, they annihilate the effects of each other and may be represented in the formula 3 minus 3 equals 0. On the other hand, the real inner phenomena, realitas phenomenon, may very well be in mutual opposition and, when united in the same subject, the one may completely or in part annihilate the effect or consequence of the other, as in the case of two moving forces in the same straight line, drawing or impelling a point in opposite directions, or in the case of a pleasure counterbalancing a certain amount of pain. 3. The internal and external. In an object of the pure understanding, only that is internal which has no relation, as regards its existence, to anything different from itself. On the other hand, the internal determination of a substantia phenomenon in space are nothing but relations, and it is itself nothing more than a complex of mere relations. Substance in space we are cognizant of only through forces operative in it, either drawing others towards itself, attraction, or preventing others from forcing into itself, repulsion and impenetrability. We know no other properties that make up the conception of substance phenomenal in space, and which we term matter. On the other hand, as an object of the pure understanding, every substance must have an internal determination and forces. But what other internal attributes of such an object can I think than those which my internal sense presents to me? That, to wit, which is either itself thought or something analogous to it. Hence Leibniz, who looked upon things as noumena, after denying them everything like external relation and therefore also composition and combination, declared that all substances, even the component parts of matter, were simple substances with powers of representation, in one word, monads.
4. Matter and form. These two conceptions lie at the foundation of all other reflection, so inseparably are they connected with every mode of exercising the understanding. The former denotes the determinable in general, the second its determination, both in a transcendental sense, abstraction being made of every difference in that which is given, and of the mode in which it is determined. Logicians formerly termed the universal matter, the specific difference of this or that part of the universal form. In a judgment, one may call the given conceptions logical matter for the judgment, the relation of those to each other by means of the copula, the form of the judgment. In an object, the composite parts thereof, essentialia, are the matter, the mode in which they are connected in the object, the form. In respect to things in general, unlimited reality was regarded as the matter of all possibility, the limitation thereof, negation, as the form, by which one thing is distinguished from another according to transcendental conceptions. The understanding demands that something be given, at least in the conception, in order to be able to determine it in a certain manner. Hence, in a conception of the pure understanding, the matter precedes the form, and for this reason Leibniz first assumed the existence of things, monads, and of an internal power of representation in them, in order to found upon this their external relation and the community of their state, that is, of their representations. Hence, with him, space and time were possible, the former through relation of substances, the latter through the connection of their determinations with each other as causes and effects. And so would it really be if the pure understanding were capable of an immediate application to objects, and if space and time were determinations of things in themselves. But being merely sensuous intuitions, in which we determine all objects solely as phenomena, the form of intuition, as a subjective property of sensibility, must antecede all matter, sensations. Consequently, space and time must antecede all phenomena and all data of experience, and rather make experience itself possible. But the intellectual philosopher could not endure that the form should proceed to things themselves and determine their possibility, an objection perfectly correct if we assume that we intuit things as they are, although with confused representation. But as sensuous intuition is a peculiar subjective condition, which is a priori at the foundation of all perception, and the form of which is primitive, the form must be given per se, and so far from matter, or the things themselves which appear, lying at the foundation of experience, as we conclude if we judge by mere conception, the very possibility of itself presupposes, on the contrary, a given formal intuition, space and time. End of Appendix Section 19 The Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant Transcendental Doctrine of Elements Part 2nd Transcendental Logic First Division Transcendental Analytic Book 2 Transcendental Doctrine of the Faculty of Judgment, or Analytic of Principles. Chapter 3. Of the Ground of the Division of All Objects into Phenomena and Noumena. Appendix. Remark on the Amphiboly of the Conceptions of Reflection. Let me be allowed to term the position which we assign to a conception either in the sensibility or in the pure understanding, the transcendental place. In this manner, the appointment of the position which must be taken by each conception according to the difference in its use and the directions for determining this place to all conceptions according to rules would be a transcendental topic a doctrine which would thoroughly shield us from the surreptitious devices of the pure understanding and the delusions which thence arise, as it would always distinguish to what faculty of cognition each conception properly belonged. Every conception, every title, 
under which many cognitions rank together, may be called a logical place. Upon this is based the logical topic of Aristotle, of which teachers and rhetoricians could avail themselves, in order, under certain titles of thought, to observe what would best suit the matter they had to treat and thus enable themselves to quibble and talk with fluency and an appearance of profundity. Transcendental topic, on the contrary, contains nothing more than the above-mentioned four titles, of all comparison and distinction, which differ from categories in this respect. They do not represent the object according to that which constitutes its conception, quantity, reality, but set forth merely the comparison of representations which precedes our conceptions of things. But this comparison requires a previous reflection, that is, a determination of the place to which the representations of the things which are compared belong, whether to wit they are cogitated by pure understanding or given by sensibility. Conceptions may be logically compared without the trouble of inquiring to what faculty their objects belong, whether as nomina to the understanding, or as phenomena to sensibility. If, however, we wish to employ these conceptions in respect of objects, previous transcendental reflection is necessary. Without this reflection, I should make a very unsafe use of these conceptions and construct pretended synthetical propositions which critical reason cannot acknowledge, and which are based solely upon a transcendental amphiboly, that is, upon a substitution of an object of pure understanding for a phenomenon. For want of this doctrine of transcendental topic, and consequently deceived by the amphiboly of the conceptions of reflection, the celebrated Leibniz constructed an intellectual system of the world, or rather believed himself competent to cognize the internal nature of things by comparing all objects merely with the understanding and the abstract formal conceptions of thought. Our table of the conceptions of reflection gives us the unexpected advantage of being able to exhibit the distinctive peculiarities of his system in all its parts, and at the same time of exposing the fundamental principle of this peculiar mode of thought, which rested upon naught but a misconception. He compared all things with each other merely by means of conceptions, and naturally found no other differences than those by which the understanding distinguishes its pure conceptions one from another. The conditions of sensuous intuition, which contain in themselves their own means of distinction, he did not look upon as primitive because sensibility was to him but a confused mode of representation and not any particular source of representations. A phenomenon was for him the representation of the thing in itself, although distinguished from cognition by the understanding only in respect of the logical form the former with its usual want of analysis containing, according to him, a certain mixture of collateral representations in its conception of a thing, which it is the duty of the understanding 
to separate and distinguish. In one word, Leibniz intellectualized phenomena, just as Locke, in his system of nogony, if I may be allowed to make use of such expression, sensualized the conceptions of the understanding, that is to say, declared them to be nothing more than empirical or abstract conceptions of reflection. Instead of seeking in the understanding and sensibility two different sources of representations, which, however, can present us with objective judgments of things only in conjunction. Each of these great men recognized but one of these faculties, which, in their opinion, applied immediately to the things in themselves, the other having no duty but that of confusing or arranging the representations of the former. Accordingly, the objects of sense were compared by Leibniz as things in general, merely in the understanding. First, he compares them in regard to their identity or difference as judged by the understanding. As, therefore, he considered merely the conceptions of objects and not their position in intuition in which alone objects can be given and left quite out of sight the transcendental locale of these conceptions. Whether, that is, their object ought to be classed among phenomena or among things in themselves, it was to be expected that he should extend the application of the principle of indiscernibles which is valid solely of conceptions of things in general to objects of sense, mundus phenomenon, and that he should believe that he had thereby contributed in no small degree to extend our knowledge of nature. In truth, if I cognize in all its inner determinations a drop of water as a thing in itself, I cannot look upon one drop as different from another. If the conception of the one is completely identical with that of the other, but if it is a phenomenon in space, it has a place not merely in the understanding among conceptions, but also in sensuous external intuition in space. And in this case, the physical locale is a matter of indifference in regard to the internal determinations of things, and one place, B, may contain a thing which is perfectly similar and equal to another in a place, A, just as well as if the two things were in every respect different from each other difference of place without any other conditions makes the plurality and distinction of objects as phenomena not only possible in itself, but even necessary. Consequently, the above so-called law is not a law of nature. It is merely an analytical rule for the comparison of things by means of mere conceptions. Second, the principle, quote, realities as simple affirmations never logically contradict each other, end quote, is a proposition perfectly true respecting the relation of conceptions, but whether as regards nature or things in themselves, of which we have not the slightest conception, is without any the least meaning. For real opposition in which A, B is equal zero exists everywhere, an opposition that is in which one reality united with another in the same subject annihilates the effects of the other, 
a fact which is constantly brought before our eyes by the different antagonistic actions and operations in nature, which nevertheless, as depending on real forces, must be called realitates phenomena. General mechanics can even present us with the empirical condition of this opposition in an a priori rule, as it directs its attention to the opposition in the direction of forces, a condition of which the transcendental conception of reality can tell us nothing. Although M. Leibniz did not announce this proposition with precisely the pomp of a new principle, he yet employed it for the establishment of new propositions, and his followers introduced it into their leibnizio wolfian system of philosophy. According to this principle, for example, all evils are but consequences of the limited nature of created beings, that is, negations, because these are the only opposite of reality. In the mere conception of a thing in general, this is really the case, but not in things as phenomena. In like manner, the upholders of this system deem it not only possible but natural also, to connect and unite all reality in one thing, because they acknowledge no other sort of opposition than that of contradiction, by which the conception itself of a thing is annihilated, and find themselves unable to conceive an opposition of reciprocal destruction so to speak, in which one real cause destroys the effect of another, and the conditions of whose representation we meet only in sensibility. Third, the Leibnizian monadology has really no better foundation than on this philosopher's mode of falsely representing the difference of the internal and external solely in relation to the understanding. Substances in general must have something inward, which is therefore free from external relations, consequently from that of composition also. The simple, that which can be represented by a unit, is therefore the foundation of that which is internal in things in themselves. The internal state of substances cannot therefore consist in place, shape, contact, or motion, determinations which are all external relations, and we can ascribe to them no other than that whereby we internally determine our faculty of sense itself, that is to say, the state of representation. Thus, then, were constructed the monads, which were to form the elements of the universe, the active force of which consists in representation, the effects of this force being thus entirely confined to themselves. For the same reason, his view of the possible community of substances could not represent it but as a predetermined harmony, and by no means as a physical influence. For inasmuch as everything is occupied only internally, that is, with its own representations, the state of the representations of one substance could not stand in active and living connection with that of another but some third cause operating on all without exception was necessary to make the different states correspond with one another. And this did not happen by means of assistance applied in each particular case. Sistema assistentia. 
but through the unity of the idea of a cause occupied and connected with all substances in which they necessarily receive, according to the Leibnizian school, their existence and permanence. Consequently also reciprocal correspondence according to universal laws. Fourth, this philosopher's celebrated doctrine of space and time, in which he intellectualized these forms of sensibility, originated in the same delusion of transcendental reflection. If I attempt to represent, by the mere understanding, the external relations of things, I can do so only by employing the conception of their reciprocal action, and if I wish to connect one state of the same thing with another state, I must avail myself of the notion of the order of cause and effect. And thus Leibniz regarded space as a certain order in the community of substances, and time as the dynamical sequence of their states. That which space and time possesses, proper to themselves and independent of things, he ascribed to a necessary confusion in our conceptions of them, whereby that which is a mere form of dynamical relations is held to be self-existent intuition, antecedent even to things themselves. Thus space and time were the intelligible form of the connection of things, substances and their states, in themselves. But things were intelligible substances, substantia noumena. At the same time he made these conceptions valid of phenomena, because he did not allow to sensibility a peculiar mode of intuition, but sought all, even the empirical representation of objects in the understanding, and left no sense naught but the despicable task of confusing and disarranging the representations of the former. But even if we could frame any synthetical proposition concerning things in themselves by means of the pure understanding, which is impossible, it could not apply to phenomena which do not represent things in themselves. In such a case I should be obliged in transcendental reflection to compare my conceptions only under the conditions of sensibility, and so space and time would not be determinations of things in themselves, but of phenomena. What things may be in themselves I know not and need not know, because a thing is never presented to me otherwise than as a phenomenon. I must adopt the same mode of procedure with the other conceptions of reflection. Matter is substantia phenomenon. That in it which is internal I seek to discover in all parts of space which it occupies, and in all functions and operations it performs, and which are indeed never anything but phenomena of the external sense. I cannot therefore find anything that is absolutely, but only what is comparatively internal, and which itself consists of external relations. The absolutely internal in matter, and as it should be according to the pure understanding, is a mere chimera. For matter is not an object for the pure understanding. But the transcendental object, which is the foundation of the phenomenon which we call matter, is a mere nesio quid, the nature of which we could not understand even though someone were found able to tell us. 
for we can understand nothing that does not bring with it something in intuition corresponding to the expression employed. If by the complement of being unable to perceive the internal nature of things, it is meant that we do not comprehend by the pure understanding what the things which appear to us may be in themselves. It is a silly and unreasonable complaint. For those who talk thus really desire that we should be able to cognize consequently to intuit things without senses, and therefore wish that we possessed a faculty of cognition perfectly different from the human faculty, not merely in degree, but even as regards intuition and the mode thereof, so that thus we should not be men, but belong to a class of beings, the possibility of whose existence, much less their nature and constitution, we have no means of cognizing. By observation and analysis of phenomena, we penetrate into the interior of nature, and no one can say what progress this knowledge may make in time. But those transcendental questions which pass beyond the limits of nature, we could never answer, even although all nature were laid open to us because we have not the power of observing our own mind with any other intuition than that of our internal sense. For herein lies the mystery of the origin and source of our faculty of sensibility, its application to an object and the transcendental ground of this unity of subjective and objective lie too deeply concealed for us who cognize ourselves only through the internal sense. Consequently, as phenomena, to be able to discover in our existence anything but phenomena, the non-sensuous cause of which we at the same time earnestly desire to penetrate to. The great utility of this critique of conclusions arrived at by the process of mere reflection consists in its clear demonstration of the nullity of all conclusions respecting objects which are compared with each other in the understanding alone, while it at the same time confirms what we particularly insisted on, namely, that although phenomena are not included as things in themselves among the objects of the pure understanding, they are nevertheless the only things by which our cognition can possess objective reality, that is to say, which give us intuitions to correspond with our conceptions. When we reflect in a purely logical manner, we do nothing more than compare conceptions in our understanding to discover whether both have the same content, whether they are self-contradictory or not, whether anything is contained in either conception, which of the two is given, and which is merely a mode of thinking that given. But if I apply these conceptions to an object in general, in the transcendental sense, without first determining whether it is an object of sensuous or intellectual intuition, certain limitations present themselves which forbid us to pass beyond the conceptions and render all empirical use of them impossible. And thus, these limitations prove that the representation of an object as a thing in general is not only insufficient, but without sensuous determination, and independently of empirical conditions, self-contradictory. That we must therefore make abstraction of all objects 
as in logic or admitting them, we must think them under conditions of sensuous intuition, that consequently the intelligible requires an altogether peculiar intuition which we do not possess and in the absence of which it is for us nothing while on the other hand phenomena cannot be objects in themselves for when i merely think things in general the difference in their external relations cannot constitute a difference in the things themselves on the contrary the former presupposes the latter and if the conception of one of two things is not internally different from that of the other, I am merely thinking the same thing in different relations. Further, by the addition of one affirmation, reality, to the other, the positive therein is really augmented and nothing is abstracted or withdrawn from it. Hence, the real in things cannot be in contradiction with or opposition to itself, and so on. The true use of the conceptions of reflection in the employment of the understanding has, as we have shown, been so misconceived by Leibniz, one of the most acute philosophers of either ancient or modern times, that he has been misled into the construction of a baseless system of intellectual cognition, which professes to determine its objects without the intervention of the senses. For this reason, the exposition of the cause of the amphiboly of these conceptions, as the origin of these false principles, is of great utility in determining with certainty the proper limits of the understanding. It is right to say whatever is affirmed or denied of the whole of a conception can be affirmed or denied of any part of it. Dictum de omni et nullo. But it would be absurd so to alter this logical proposition as to say whatever is not contained in a general conception is likewise not contained in the particular conceptions which rank under it. For the latter are particular conceptions for the very reason that their content is greater than that which is cogitated in the general conception. And yet the whole intellectual system of Leibniz is based upon this false principle, and with it must necessarily fall to the ground, together with all the ambiguous principles in reference to the employment of the understanding which have thence originated. Leibniz's principle of the identity of indiscernibles or indistinguishables is really based on the presupposition that if in the conception of a thing a certain distinction is not to be found, it is also not to be met with in things themselves, that consequently all things are completely identical, numero idem which are not distinguishable from each other as to quality or quantity in our conceptions of them. But as in the mere conception of anything, abstraction has been made of many necessary conditions of intuition, that of which abstraction has been made is rashly held to be non-existent and nothing is attributed to the thing but what is contained in its conception. The conception of a cubic foot of space, however I may think it, is in itself completely identical, but two cubic feet in space are nevertheless distinct from each other 
from the sole fact that their being in different places they are numero diversa, and these places are conditions of intuition, wherein the object of this conception is given, and which do not belong to the conception but to the faculty of sensibility. In like manner there is in the conception of a thing no contradiction when a negative is not connected with an affirmative, and merely affirmative conceptions cannot in conjunction produce any negation. But in sensuous intuition, wherein reality, take for example motion, is given, we find conditions, opposite directions, of which abstraction has been made in the conception of motion in general which render possible a contradiction or opposition, not indeed of a logical kind, and which from pure positives produce zero equal zero. We are therefore not justified in saying that all reality is in a perfect agreement and harmony because no contradiction is discoverable among its conceptions. Footnote 38. According to mere conceptions, that which is internal in the substratum of all relations or external determinations. When, therefore, I abstract all conditions of intuition and confine myself solely to the conception of a thing in general, I can make abstraction of all external relations and there must nevertheless remain a conception of that which indicates no relation, but merely internal determinations. Now it seems to follow that in everything, substance, there is something which is absolutely internal and which antecedes all external determinations inasmuch as it renders them possible and that therefore is substratum in something which does not contain any external relations and is consequently simple. For corporeal things are never anything but relations, at least of their parts external to each other and inasmuch as we know of no other absolutely internal determinations than those of the internal sense, this substratum is not only simple, but also analogously with our internal sense determined through representations, that is to say, all things are properly monads, or simple beings endowed with the power of representation. Now, all this would be perfectly correct if the conception of a thing were the only necessary condition of the presentation of objects of external intuition. It is, on the contrary, manifest that a permanent phenomenon in space, impenetrable extension, can contain mere relations and nothing that is absolutely internal and yet be the primary substratum of all external perception. By mere conceptions I cannot think anything external without at the same time thinking something internal, for the reason that conceptions of relations presuppose given things and without these are impossible. But as an in intuition there is something, that is, space, which, with all it contains, consists of purely formal or, indeed, real relations, which is not found in the mere conception of a thing in general, and this presents to us the substratum which could not be recognized through conceptions alone, I cannot say, because a thing cannot be represented by mere conceptions without something absolutely internal, 
there is also in the things themselves which are contained under these conceptions and in their intuition nothing external to which something absolutely internal does not survive as the foundation. For when we have made abstraction of all the conditions of intuition, there certainly remains in the mere conception nothing but the internal in general, through which alone the external is possible. But this necessity, which is grounded upon abstraction alone, does not obtain in the case of things themselves, in so far as they are given in intuition with such determinations as express mere relations, without having anything internal as their foundation. For they are not things of a thing which we can neither, for they are not things in themselves, but only phenomena. What we cognize in matter is nothing but relations. What we call its internal determinations are but comparatively internal. But there are some self-subsistent and permanent through which a determined object is given. That I, when abstraction is made of these relations, have nothing more to think does not destroy the conception of a thing as phenomenon, nor the conception of an object in abstracto, but it does away with the possibility of an object that is determinable according to mere conceptions, that is, of a nomenon. It is certainly startling to hear that a thing consists solely of relations, but this thing is simply a phenomenon and cannot be cogitated by means of the mere categories. It does itself consist in the mere relation of something in general to the senses. In the same way, we cannot cogitate relations of things in abstracto. If we commence with conceptions alone, in any other manner than that one is the cause of determinations in the other, for that is itself the conception of the understanding or category of relation. But as in this case we make abstraction of all intuition, we lose altogether the mode in which the manifold determines to each of its parts its place that is the form of sensibility, space, and yet this mode antecedes all empirical causality. Footnote 38. If anyone wishes here to have recourse to the usual subterfuge and to say that at least realities nomina cannot be in opposition to each other, it will be requisite for him to adduce an example of this pure and non-sensuous reality, that it may be understood whether the notion represents something or nothing. But an example cannot be found except in experience which never presents to us anything more than phenomena and thus the proposition means nothing more than that the conception which contains only affirmatives does not contain anything negative, a proposition nobody ever doubted. And footnote 38. If by intelligible objects we understand things which can be thought by means of pure categories, without the need of the schemata of sensibility, such objects are impossible. For the condition of the objective use of all our conceptions of understanding is the mode of our sensuous intuition, whereby objects are given, and if we make abstraction of the latter, the former can have no relation to an object 
and even if we should suppose a different kind of intuition from our own, still our functions of thought would have no use or significance in respect thereof. But if we understand by the term objects of a sensuous intuition in respect of which our categories are not valid and of which we can accordingly have no knowledge, neither intuition nor conception, in this merely negative sense, nomina must be admitted. For this is no more than saying that our mode of intuition is not applicable to all things, but only to objects of our senses that consequently its objective validity is limited, and that room is therefore left for another kind of intuition, and thus also for things that may be objects of it. But in this sense the conception of nominon is problematical. That is to say, it is the notion of that it that it is possible, nor that it is impossible. Inasmuch as we do not know of a mode of intuition and a kind of conception, neither of which is applicable to a non-sensuous object, we are on this account incompetent to extend the sphere of our objects of thought beyond the conditions of our sensibility, and to assume the existence of objects of pure thought, that is, of nomina, inasmuch as these have no true positive signification. For it must be confessed of the categories that they are not of themselves sufficient for the cognition of things in themselves, and without the data of sensibility, are mere subjective forms of the unity of the understanding. Thought is certainly not a product of the senses, and in so far is not limited by them. But it does not therefore follow that it may be employed purely and without the intervention of sensibility. For it would then be without reference to an object, and we cannot call a nominon an object of pure thought. For the representation thereof is but the problematical conception of an object for a perfectly different intuition and a perfectly different understanding from ours, both of which are consequently themselves problematical. The conception of a nominon is therefore not the conception of an object, but merely a problematical conception inseparably connected with the limitation of our sensibility. That is to say, the conception contains the answer to the question, quote, are there objects quite unconnected with and independent of our intuition, end quote. A question to which only an indeterminate answer can be given. That answer is, quote, inasmuch as sensuous intuition does not apply to all things without distinction, there remains room for other and different objects." End quote. The existence of these problematical objects is therefore not absolutely denied in the absence of the determinate conception of them, but as no category is valid in respect of them, neither must they be admitted as objects for our understanding. Understanding accordingly limits sensibility, without at the same time enlarging its own field, while moreover it forbids sensibility to apply its forms and modes to things in themselves and restricts it to the sphere of phenomena, it cogitates an object in itself, only, however, as a transcendental object which is the cause of a phenomenon, 
consequently not itself a phenomenon, and which cannot be thought either as a quantity or as reality, or as substance, because these conceptions always require sensuous forms in which to determine an object, an object, therefore, of which we are quite unable to say whether it can be met with in ourselves or out of us, whether it would be annihilated together with sensibility, or, if this were taken away, would continue to exist. If we wish to call this object a nomenon, because the representation of it is non-sensuous, we are at liberty to do so. But as we can apply it to none of the conceptions of our understanding, the representation is for us quite void, and is available only for indication of the limits of our sensuous intuition, thereby leaving at the same time an empty space which we are competent to fill by the aid neither of possible experience nor of the pure understanding. The critique of the pure understanding accordingly does not permit us to create for ourselves a new field of objects beyond those which are presented to us as phenomena, and to stray into intelligible worlds Nay, it does not even allow us to endeavor to form so much as a conception of them. The specious error which leads to this, and which is a perfectly excusable one, lies in the fact that the employment of the understanding, contrary to its proper purpose and destination, is made transcendental and objects, that is, possible intuitions, are made to regulate themselves according to conceptions, instead of the conceptions arranging themselves according to the intuitions on which alone their own objective validity rests. Now the reason of this again is that apperception and with it thought antecedes all possible determinate arrangement of representations. Accordingly, we think something in general and determinate on the one hand sensuously, but on the other distinguish the general and in abstracto represented object from this particular mode of intuiting it. In this case, there remains a mode of determining the object by mere thought, which is really but a logical form without content, which, however, seems to us to be a mode of the existence of the object in itself, nomenon, without regard to intuition which is limited to our senses. Before ending this transcendental analytic, we must make an addition, which although in itself of no particular importance, seems to be necessary to the completeness of the system. The highest conception, with which a transcendental philosophy commonly begins, is the division into possible and impossible. But as all division presupposes a divided conception, a still higher one must exist, and this is the conception of an object in general. Problematically understood and without its being decided whether it is something or not, as the categories are the only conceptions which apply to the objects in general, the distinguishing of an object, whether it is something or nothing, must proceed according to the order and direction of the categories. 1. To the categories of quantity, that is, the conceptions of all, many, and one, the conception which annihilates all, that is, the conception of none, is opposed. 
and thus the object of a conception to which no intuition can be found to correspond is equal nothing. That is, it is a conception without an object, ends rationis, like nomina which cannot be considered possible in the sphere of reality, though they must not therefore be held to be impossible, or like certain new fundamental forces in matter, the existence of which is cogitable without contradiction, though as examples from experience are not forthcoming, they must not be regarded as possible. 2. Reality is something, negation is nothing, that is, a conception of the absence of an object, as cold, a shadow, nihil privativum. 3. The mere form of intuition without substance is in itself no object, but the merely formal condition of an object as phenomenon, as pure space and pure time. These are certainly something as forms of intuition, but are not themselves objects which are intuited, ends imaginarium. 4. The object of a conception which is self-contradictory is nothing because the conception is nothing, is impossible as a figure composed of two straight lines, nihil negativum. The table of this division of the conception of nothing, the corresponding division of the conception of something, does not require special description must therefore be arranged as follows. Nothing as one, as empty conception without object, ends rationis. Two, three, empty object of empty intuition, a conception without object, nihil privativum ends imaginarium. Four, empty object, without conception, nihil negativum. We see that the ens rationis is distinguished from the nihil negativum, or pure nothing, by the consideration that the former must be reckoned among possibilities, because it is a mere fiction, though not self-contradictory while the latter is completely opposed to all possibility, inasmuch as the conception annihilates itself. Both, however, are empty conceptions. On the other hand, the nihil privativum and ens imaginarium are empty data for conceptions. If light be not given to the senses, we cannot represent to ourselves darkness, and if extended objects are not perceived, we cannot represent space. Neither the negation nor the mere form of intuition can, without something real, be an object. End of section 19 Recording by Robert Scott Mojo Move four one one dot com M O J O M O V E four one one dot com September the seventeenth, two thousand and seven. Section 20. The Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant. Transcendental Doctrine of Elements. Part 2nd. Transcendental Logic. 2nd Division. Transcendental 
Dialectic Introduction Recording by Dustin Clymer Of Transcendental Illusory Appearance We term dialectic in general a logic of appearance. This does not signify a doctrine of probability, for probability is truth, only cognized upon insufficient grounds, and though the information it gives us is imperfect, it is not therefore deceitful. Hence, it must not be separated from the analytical part of logic. Still less must phenomenon and appearance be held to be identical. For truth and illusory appearance does not reside in the object, in so far as it is intuited, but in the judgment upon the object, in so far as it is thought. It is, therefore, quite correct to say that the senses do not err, not because they always judge correctly, but because they do not judge at all. Hence, truth and error, consequently also, illusory appearance as the cause of error, are only to be found in a judgment, that is, in the relation of an object to our understanding. In a cognition which completely harmonizes with the law of the understanding, no error can exist. In a representation of the senses, as not containing any judgment, there is also no error, but no power of nature can itself deviate from its own laws. Hence neither the understanding, per se, without the influence of another cause, nor the senses, per se, would fall into error. The former could not, because if it acts not only accordingly to its own laws, the effect, the judgment, must necessarily accord with these laws. But in accordance with the laws of the understanding consist the formal element in all truth. In the senses there is no judgment, neither a true nor a false one. But as we have no source of cognition besides these two, it follows that error is caused solely by the unobserved influence of the sensibility upon the understanding. And thus it happens that the subjective grounds of a judgment and are confounded with the objective and cause them to deviate from their proper determination just as a body in motion would always of itself proceed in a straight line but if another impetus gives to it a different direction it will then start off into a curvilinear line of motion to distinguish the peculiar action of the understanding from the power which mingles with it it is necessary to consider an erroneous judgment as the diagonal between two forces that determine judgment in two different directions which, as it were, form an angle, and to resolve this composite operation into the simple ones of the understanding and the sensibility. In pure a priori judgments, this must be done by means of transcendental reflection whereby, as has been already shown, each representation has its place appointed in the corresponding faculty of cognition, and consequently the influence of the one faculty upon the other is made apparent. It is not at present our business to treat of empirical illusory appearance, for example, optical illusion, which occurs in the empirical application of otherwise correct rules of the understanding, and in which the judgment is misled by the influence of imagination. Our purpose is to speak of transcendental illusory appearance, which influences principles that are not even applied to experience. For in this case, we should possess a sure test of their correctness, but which leads us in disregard of all the warnings of criticism, completely beyond the empirical employment of the categories and deludes us with the chimera of an extension of the sphere of the pure understanding. We shall term those principles the application of which is confined entirely within the limits of possible experience, eminent. Those, on the other hand, which transgress these limits, we shall call transcendent principles. But by these latter I do not understand principles of the transcendental use or misuse of the categories, which is in reality a mere fault of the judgments when not under due restraint from criticism, and therefore not paying sufficient attention to the limits of the sphere in which the pure understanding is allowed to exercise its functions, but real principles which exhort us to break down all those barriers and to lay claim to a perfectly new field of cognition which recognizes no line of demarcation, 
Thus, transcendental and transcendent are not identical terms. The principles of pure understanding, which we have already propounded, ought to be of empirical and not of transcendental use. That is, they are not applicable to any object beyond the sphere of experience. A principle which removes those limits, nay, which authorizes us to overstep them, is called transcendent. If our criticism can succeed in exposing the illusion in these pretended principles, those which are limited in their employment to the sphere of experience may be called, in opposition to the others, eminent principles of the pure understanding. Logical illusion, which consists merely in the imitation of the form of reason, the illusion in sophistical syllogisms, arises entirely from a want of due attention to logical rules. So soon as the attention is awakened to the case before us, this illusion totally disappears. Transcendental illusion, on the contrary, does not cease to exist, even after it has been exposed, and its nothingness clearly perceived by means of transcendental criticism. For example, the illusion in the proposition, the world must have a beginning in time, the cause of this is as follows. In our reason, subjectively considered as a faculty of human cognition, there exist fundamental rules and maxims of its exercise, which have completely the appearance of objective principles. Now from this cause, it happens that the subjective necessity of a certain connection of our conceptions is regarded as an objective necessity of the determination of things in themselves. This illusion it is impossible to avoid, just as we cannot avoid perceiving that the sea appears to be higher at a distance than it is near the shore, because we see the former by means of higher rays than the latter, or, which is a still stronger case, as even the astronomer cannot prevent himself from seeing the moon larger at its rising than some time afterwards, although he is not deceived by this illusion. Transcendental dialectic will therefore content itself with exposing the illusory appearance in transcendental judgments and guarding us against it, but to make it, as in the case of logical illusion, entirely disappear and cease to be illusion is utterly beyond its power, for we have here to do with the natural and unavoidable illusion, which rests upon subjective principles and imposes these upon us as objective, while logical dialectic and the detection of sophisms has to do merely with the error in the logical consequence of the propositions, or with an artificially constructed illusion in imitation of the natural error. There is, therefore, a natural and unavoidable dialectic of pure reason, not that in which the bungler from what of the requisite knowledge involves himself, nor that which the sophist devises for the purpose of misleading, but that which is an inseparable adjunct of human reason, and which, even after its illusions have been exposed, does not cease to deceive and continually to lead reason into momentary errors, which it becomes necessary continually to remove. End of Transcendental Dialectic Introduction Section 21 The Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant Transcendental Doctrine of Elements Part 2nd Transcendental Logic 2nd Division Transcendental Dialectic Book 1 Of the Conceptions of Pure Reason Recording by Jim Tiley we do not speak here of the possibility of them, are not obtained by reflection, but by inference or conclusion. The conceptions of understanding are also cogitated a priori antecedently to experience and render it possible, but they contain nothing but the unity of reflections upon phenomena in so far as these must necessarily belong to a possible empirical consciousness. 
Through them alone, our cognition and the determination of an object possible. It is from them, accordingly, that we receive material for reasoning and antecedently to them we possess no a priori conceptions of objects from which they might be deduced. On the other hand, the sole basis of their objective reality consists in the, ne in the necessity opposed on them as containing the intellectual form of all experience of restricting their application and influence to the sphere of, exper of experience. But the term conception of reason or rational conception itself indicates that it does not confine itself within the limits of experience because its object matter is a cognition of which every empirical cognition is but a part. Nay, the whole of possible experience may be itself but a part of it. A cognition to which no actual experience ever fully attains, although it does always pertain to it. The aim of rational conceptions is the comprehension as as that of the conceptions of understanding is the understanding is the understanding of perceptions if they contain the unconditioned they relate to that which all experience is subordinate but which is never itself an object of experience that towards which reason tends in all its conclusions from experience and by the standard of which it estimates the degree of their empirical use but which is never itself an element in an empirical synthesis if notwithstanding such conceptions possess ob objective validity they may be called Conceptus Rado Chinati begin parentheses conceptions legitimately concluded end parentheses in cases where they do not they have been admitted on account of having the appearance of being correctly concluded and may be called Conceptus ratio cannotis begin parentheses sophistical conceptions and parentheses but as this only be sufficient sufficiently demonstrated in that part of our treatise which relates to the dialectical conclusions of reason we shall omit any consideration of it in this place as we called the pure conceptions of the understanding categories, we shall also distinguish those of pure reason by a new name and call them transcendental ideas. These terms, however, we must in the first place explain and justify. Section 1 of Ideas in General Despite the great wealth of words which European languages possess, the thinker finds himself often at a loss for an expression exactly suited to his conception, for want of which he is unable to make himself intelligible either to others or to himself. To coin new words is a pretension to legislation and language which is seldom successful. And before recourse is taken to do so desperate 
an expedient. It is advisable to examine the dead and learned languages with the hope and the probability that we may there meet with some adequate expression of the notion we have in our minds. In this case, even if the original meaning of the word has become somewhat uncertain from carelessness or want of caution on the part of the authors of it, it is always better to adhere to and con confirm its proper meaning even although it may be doubtful whether it was formed whether it was formerly used in exactly this sense than to make our labor vain by want of sufficient care to render ourselves intelligible for this reason when it happens that there exists only a single word to express a certain conception and this word in its usual acceptation is thoroughly adequate to the conception the accurate distinction of which from related conceptions is of great importance we ought not to employ the expression improvidently or for the sake of variety and elegance of style use it as a synonym for other cognate words. It is our duty, on the contrary, carefully to preserve its peculiar, peculiar sig signification, as otherwise it easily happens that when the attention of the reader is no longer particularly attracted to the expression and it is lost amid the multitude of other words of very different import, the thought which it, which it conveyed, and which it alone conveyed, is lost with it. Plato employed the expression idea in a way that plainly showed he meant by it something which is never derived from the senses but which far transcends even the conceptions of the understanding begin parentheses with which Aristotle occupied himself end parentheses in as much as in experience nothing perfectly corresponding to them could be found ideas are according to him archetypes of things themselves and not merely keys to possible experiences like the categories in his view they flow from the highest re reason by which they have been imparted to human reason which however exists no longer in its original state but is obliged with great labor to recall by reminiscence which is called philosophy the old but now sadly obscured ideas I will not here enter upon any literary investigation of the sense which this sublime philosopher attached to this expression I shall content myself with remarking that it is nothing unusual in common conversation as well as in written works by comparing the thoughts which an author has delivered upon a subject to understand him better than he understood himself inasmuch as he may not have sufficiently determined his, his conception and thus have sometimes spoken nay even thought in opposition to his own opinions Plato perceived very clearly that our faculty of cognition has the feeling of a much higher vocation than, than that 
than that of merely spelling out phenomena according to synthetical unity for the purpose of being able to read them as experience and that our reason naturally raises, raises itself to cognitions far too elevated to admit of the possibility of an object given by experience corresponding to them cognitions which are nevertheless real and are not mere phantoms of the brain this philosopher found his ideas especially in all that is practical footnote 40 begin footnote 40 he certainly extended the application of his conception to speculative cognitions also provided they were given pure and completely a priori nay even to mathematics allowed this science cannot 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 possess an object otherwhere than in possible experience I cannot allow him in this and as little can I follow him in his mystical deduction of these ideas or in his hypostatization of them although in truth the elevated and exaggerated language which he employed in describing them is quite capable of an interpretation more subdued and in more accordance with the fact and the nature of things and footnote 40 that is which rests upon freedom which in turn ranks under cognitions that are the peculiar the peculiar product of reason he who would derive from experience the conceptions of virtue who would make as many have really done that which at best can but serve as an imperfectly illustrative example a model for the formation of a perfectly adequate idea on the subject would in fact transform virtue into a non-entity changeable according to time and circumstances and utterly incapable of being employed as a rule on the contrary everyone is conscious that when anyone is held up to him as a model of virtue he compares this so-called model with the true original which he possesses in his own mind and values him according to this standard but this standard is the idea of virtue in relation to which all possible objects of experience are indeed serviceable as examples proofs of the practicality practicability in a certain degree of that which the conception of virtue demands but certainly not as archetypes that the actions of man will never be in perfect accordance with all the requirements of the pure ideas of reason does not does not prove the thought to be chimerical for only through this idea are all judgments as to moral merit or to demerit possible it consequently lies at the foundation of every approach to moral perfection however far removed from it the obstacle the obstacles in human nature indeterminable as to degree may keep us the platonic republic has become proverbial proverbial as an example and a striking one of imaginary perfection such as can exist only in the brain of the idle thinker and brucker 
ridicules the philosopher for maintaining that a prince can never govern well unless he is part participant in the ideas but we should do better to follow up this thought and where this admirable thinker leaves us without assistance employ new efforts to place it clearer light rather than carelessly fling it aside as useless under the very miserable and pernicious pretext of impracticability a constitution of the greatest possible human freedom according to laws by which the liberty of every individual can consist with the liberty of every other begin parentheses not of the greatest possible happiness for this follows necessarily from the former and parentheses is to say the least a necessary idea which must be placed at the foundation not only of the first plan of the constitution of a state but all of its laws and in this it is not necessary at the outset to take account of the obstacles which lie in our way Ob obstacles which perhaps do not necessarily arise from the character of human nature but rather from the previous neglect of true ideas in legislation for there is nothing more pernicious and more unworthy of a philosopher than the vulgar appeal to a so-called adverse exper experience which indeed would not have existed if those institutions had been established at the proper time and in accordance with ideas while instead of this conceptions crude for the very reason that they have been drawn from experience have marred and frustrated all our better views and intentions the more legislation and government are in harmony with this idea the more rare do punishments become and thus it is quite reasonable to maintain as Plato did that in a perfect state no punishments at all would be necessary now although a perfect state may never exist the idea is not on that account the less just which holds up this maximum as the archetype or standard of a constitution in order to bring legislative government always nearer and nearer to the greatest possible perfection for at what precise degree human nature must stop in its progress and how wide must be the chasm which must necessarily exist between the idea and its realization are problems which no one can or ought to determine and for this reason that it is the destination of freedom to overstep all assigned limits between itself and the idea but not only in that wherein human reason is a real causal agent and where ideas are operative causes begin parentheses of actions and their objects end parentheses that is to say in the region of ethics but also in regard to nature herself Plato saw clear proofs of an origin from ideas a plant and animal the regular order of nature probably also the disposition 
of the whole universe give manifest evidence that they are possible only by means of and according to ideas that indeed no one creature under the individual conditions of its existence perfectly harmonizes with the idea of the most perfect of its kind just as little as man with the idea of humanity which nevertheless he bears in his soul as the archetypical standard of his actions that notwithstanding these ideas are in the highest sense individually unchangeably and completely determined and are the original causes of things and that the totality of connected objects in the universe is alone fully adequate to that idea setting aside the exaggerations of expression in the writings of this philosopher the mental power exhibited in this ascent from the ectypal mode of regarding the physical world to the architectonic connection thereof according to ends that is ideas is an effort which deserves imitation and claims respect but as regards the principles of ethics of legislation and of religion sp spheres in which ideas alone render experience possible although they never attain to full expression therein he has vindicated for himself a position of peculiar merit which is not appreciated only because it is judged by the very empirical rules the validity of which as principles is destroyed by ideas for as regards nature experience presents us with rules and is the source of truth but in relation to ethical laws experience is the parent of illusion and it, and it is in the highest degree reprehensible to limit or to deduce the laws which dictate what I ought to do from what is done we must however omit the consideration of these important subjects the development of which is in reality the peculiar duty and dignity of philosophy and confine ourselves for the present to the more humble but not less useful task of preparing a firm foundation for those majestic edifices of moral science for this foundation has been hitherto insecure from the many subterranean passages which reason in its confident but vain search for treasures has made in all directions our present duty is to make ourselves perfectly acquainted with the transcendental use made of pure reason its principles and ideas that we may be able to properly to, to determine and value its influence and real worth but before bringing these introductory remarks to a close I beg those who really have philosophy at heart and their number is but small if they shall find themselves convinced by the considerations following as well as by those above to exert themselves to preserve to the expression idea its original signification and to take care that it be not lost among those other expressions by which all sorts of representations are loosely designated that the interests of science may not thereby suffer we are in no want of words to denominate adequately every mode of representation 
without the necessity of encroaching upon terms which are proper to others. The following is a graduated list of them. The genus is representation in general, begin parentheses, representation. Under it stands representation with consciousness, perceptio, and parentheses. A perception which relates solely to the subject as a modification of its state is a sensation, begin parentheses, sensatio, and parentheses. An object perception is a cognition, begin parentheses, cognitio, and parentheses. A cognition is either an intuition or a conception, begin parentheses, intuitus vel conceptus, and parentheses. The former has an immediate relation to the object and is singular and individual. The latter has but a immediate relation by means of a characteristic mark which may be common to several things. A conception is either empirical or pure. A pure conception, insofar as it, insofar as it has its origin, is the, is the understanding alone, and it is not the conception of a pure sensuous image, is called notio. A conception formed from notions which, which transcends the possibility of experience is an idea or a conception of reason. To one who has accustomed himself to these distinctions, it must be quite intolerable to hear the representation of the color red called an idea. It ought not even to be called a notion or conception of understanding. Section 2 of Transcendental Ideas Transcendental Analytic showed us how the mere logical form of our cognition can contain the origin of pure conceptions a priori, conceptions which represent objects antecedently to all experience, or rather indicate the synthetical unity which alone renders possible an empirical cognition of objects. The form of judgments converted into a conception of the, synthes the synthesis of intuitions produced the, the categories which direct the employment of the understanding in experience. This condition warrants us to expect that the form of syllogisms, when applied to synthetical unity of intuitions, following the rule of categories, will contain the origin of a particular a priori conceptions, which we may call pure conceptions of reason or transcendental ideas and which will determine the use of the understanding in the totality of experience according to principles. The function of reason in arguments consists in the universality of a cognition according to conceptions and the syllogism itself is a judgment which is determined a priori in the whole extent of its conditions. The proposition, quote, Caius is mortal, end quote, is one 
which may be obtained from experience by the aid of the understanding alone but my wish is to find a conception which contains the conditions under which the predicate of this judgment is given in this case the conception of man and after subsuming under this condition taken in its whole extent begin parentheses all men are mortal and parentheses I determine according to it the cognition of the object thought and say quote, Caius is mortal end quote hence in the conclusion of a syllogism we restrict a predicate to a certain object after having thought it in the major in its whole in its whole extent under a certain condition this complete quantity of the extent in relation to such a condition is called universality begin parentheses universalitas and parentheses to this corresponds totality in parentheses universitas and parentheses of conditions in the synthesis of intuitions the transcendental conception of reason is therefore nothing else than the conception of the totality of the of the conditions of a given condition now as the unconditioned alone renders possible totality of conditions and conversely the totality of conditions is itself always unconditioned a pure rational conception in general can be defined and explained by means of the conception of the unconditioned in so far as it contains a basis for the synthesis of the conditioned to the number of modes of relation which the understanding cogitates by means of the categories the number of pure rational conceptions will correspond we must therefore seek for first an unconditioned of the categorical synthesis in a subject secondly of the hypothetical synthesis of the members of a series thirdly as of the disjunctive synthesis of parts in a system there are exactly the same number of modes of syllogisms each of which proceeds through prosyllogisms to the unconditioned one to the subject which cannot be employed as predicate another to the presupposition which supposes nothing higher than itself and third to an aggregate of the members of the complete division of a conception hence the pure rational conceptions of totality in the synthesis in the synthesis of conditions have a necessary foundation in the nature of human reason at least as modes of elevating the unit the unity of the understanding to the unconditioned they have they they may have no valid application corresponding to their transcendental employment in concreto and be thus of no greater utility than to direct the understanding how while extending them as widely as possible to maintain its exercise and application in perfect consistence and harmony but 
while speaking here of the totality of conditions and of the unconditioned as the common title of all conceptions of reason, we again light upon an expression which we find it impossible to dispense with, and which nevertheless, owing to the ambiguity attaching to it from long abuse, we cannot employ with safety. The word absolute is one of the few words which, in its original signification, was perfectly adequate to the conception it was intended to convey. A conception which no other word in the same language exactly suits, and the loss, or which is the same thing, the incautious and loose employment, of which must be followed by the loss of the conception itself. And as it is a conception which occupies much of the attention of reason, its loss would be greatly to the detriment of all transcendental philosophy. The word absolute is at presently frequently used to denote that something can be predicated of a thing considered in itself and intrinsically. In this sense, absolutely possible would signify that which is possible in itself in parentheses in turn a in parentheses which is in fact the least that one can predicate of an object on the other hand it is sometimes employed to indicate that a thing is valid in all respects for example absolute sovereignty absolutely possible would in this sense signify that which is possible and all re in all relations and in every respect and this is the most that can be predicated of the possibility of a thing now these significations do in truth frequently coincide thus for example that which is intrinsically impossible is also impossible in all relations that is absolutely impossible but in most cases they differ from each other toto kylo and i can by no means conclude that because a thing is in itself possible it is also possible in all relations and therefore absolutely nay more i shall in the sequel show that absolute necessity does not by any means depend on internal necessity and that therefore it must not be considered as synonymous with it of an opposite which is intrinsically impossible we may affirm that it, it is in all respects impossible and that consequently the thing itself of which this is the opposite is absolutely necessary but I cannot reason conversely and say the opposite of that which is absolutely necessary is intrinsically impossible that is that the absolute necessity of things is an internal necessity for this internal necessity is in certain cases a mere empty word with which the least conception cannot be connected while the conception of the necessity of a thing in all relations possess, possesses very peculiar determinations. Now as the loss of a conception of great utility in speculative science cannot be a matter of indifference 
to the philosopher, I trust that the proper de determination and careful preservation of the expression on which the conception depends will likewise be not indifferent to him. In this un enlarged signification then, shall I employ the word absolute in opposition to that which is valid only in some particular respect for the latter is restricted by conditions the former is valid without any restriction whatever now the transcendental conception of reason has for its object nothing else than absolute totality in the synthesis of conditions and does not rest satisfied till it has attained to the absolutely that is, in all respects and relations, unconditioned. For pure reason leaves to the understanding everything that immediately relates to the object of intuition, or rather to their synthesis in, imagina in imagination. The former restricts itself to the absolute totality in the employment of the conceptions of the understanding and aims at carrying out the synthetical unity which is cogitated in the category even to the unconditioned. This unity may hence be called the rational unity of phenomena as the other which the category expresses may be termed the unity of the understanding. Reason, therefore, has an immediate relation to the use of the understanding, not indeed in so far as the latter contains the ground of possible experience, begin parentheses, for the conception of the absolute totality of conditions is not a conception that can be employed in experience because no experience is unconditioned end parentheses, but solely for the purpose of directing it to a certain unity of which the understanding has no conception and the aim of which is to, is to collect into an absolute whole all acts of the understanding. Hence the objective employment of the pure conceptions of reason is always transcendent while that of the pure conceptions of the understanding must according to their nature be always imminent inasmuch as they are limited to possible experience. I understand by idea a necessary conception of reason to which no corresponding object can be discovered in the world of sense. Accordingly, the pure conceptions of reason at present under consideration are transcendental ideas. They are conceptions of pure reason, for they regard they regard all empirical cognition as determined by means of an absolute totality of conditions. They are not mere fictions but natural and necessary products of reason and have hence a necessary relation to the whole sphere of the exercise of the understanding. And finally they are transcendent they are transcendent and overstep the limits of all experiences in which consequently no object can ever be presented that would be perfectly adequate to a transcendental idea. When we use the word idea we say as regards its object begin parentheses an object of the pure understanding, end parentheses, a great deal, 
but as regards its subject begin parentheses that is in respect of its reality under conditions of experience end parentheses exceedingly little because the idea as the conception of a maximum can never be completely and adequately presented in concreto. Now as in the merely speculative employment of reason the latter is properly the sole aim and as in this case the approximation to a conception which is never attained in practice is the same thing as if the conception were non-existent. It is commonly said of the, con of the conception of this kind, quote, it is only an idea, end quote. So we might very well say, quote, the absolute totality of all phenomena is only an idea, end quote. For, as we never can present an adequate representation of it, it remains for us a problem incapable of solution. On the other hand, as in the practical use of the understanding we have only to do with action and practice according to rules, an idea of pure reason can always be given really in concreto, although only partially. Nay, it is the indispensable condition of all, practical, of all practical employment of reason. The practice or execution of the idea is always limited and defective, but nevertheless when indeterminable boundaries, consequently always under the influence of the conception of an absolute perfection. And thus the practical idea is always in the highest degree fruitful and in relation to real actions indispensably necessary. In the idea pure reason possesses even causality and the power of producing that which its conceptions which its conception contains. Hence we cannot say of wisdom in a disparaging way quote, it is only an idea End quote. For, for the very reason that it is the idea of the necessary unity of all possible aims, it must be for all pract pr practical exertions and endeavors the primitive condition and rule, a rule which if not constitutive is at least limitive. Now, although we must say of the transcendental conceptions of reason they are only quote they are only ideas end quote we must not on this account look upon them as sur su superfluous and nugatory for although no object can be determined by them they can be of great utility unobserved and at the basis of the edifice of the understanding as the canon for its extended and self-consistent exercise. A canon which indeed does not enable it <coughs> to cognize more in an object than it would cognize by the help of its own conceptions but which guides it more securely in its cognition. Not to mention that they perhaps render possible a transition from our conception from our conceptions of nature and the non-ego to the practical conceptions and thus produce for even ethical ideas keeping so to speak and connections with the speculative cognitions of reason the explica the explication of all this must be looked for in the sequel. But setting aside, in conformity with our original purpose, the consideration of the practical ideas, we proceed to contemplate reason in its speculative use alone, nay, 
in a still more restricted sphere to wit in the transcendental use and here we must strike into the same path which we followed in our deduction of the categories that is to say we shall consider the logical form of the cognition of reason by a source of conceptions which enables us to regard objects in themselves as determined synthetically a priori in relation to one or other of the functions of reason. Reason considered as the faculty of a certain logical form of, of cognition is the faculty of conclusion that is of immediate judgment by means of the subsumption of the condition of a possible judgment under the condition of a given judgment. The given judgment is the general rule begin parentheses major and parentheses the subsumption of the condition of another possible judgment under the condition of the rule is the minor. The actual judgment which announces the assertion of the rule in the subsumed case is the conclusion begin parentheses conclusio and parentheses. The rule predicates something generally under a certain condition. The condition of the rule is satisfied in some particular case. It follows that what was valid in, in general under that condition must also be considered as valid in the particular case which satisfies this condition. It is very plain that reason attains to a cognition by which of acts of the understanding which constitute a series of conditions. When I arrive at the proposition, quote, all bodies are changeable, end quote, by beginning with the more remote cognition, begin parentheses, in which the conception of body does not appear, but which nevertheless contains the condition of that conception, end parentheses, begin quote, all compound is changeable, end quote. By proceeding from this to a less remote cognition, which stands under the condition of the former, quote, bodies are compound, end quote, and hence to a third, which at length connects for me the remote cognition, begin parentheses, changeable, end parentheses, with the one before me. Quote, consequently, bodies are changeable, end quote. I have arrived at a cognition, begin parentheses, conclusion, end parentheses, through a series of conditions, begin parentheses, premises, and parentheses. Now every series whose exponent, begin parentheses, of the categorical or hypothetical judgment, end parentheses, is given, can be continued. Consequently, the same procedure of reason conducts to be the ratiocinatio polysogistica, which is a series of syllogisms that can be continued either on the side of the conditions, begin parentheses, pro syllogisms, or of the conditioned, begin parentheses, per epistologisimos, and parentheses. To an, to an indefinite extent. But we very soon perceive that the chain or series of prosyllogisms, that is, of deducted cognitions on the, on the side of the grounds or conditions of a given con cognition, in other words, the ascending series of syllogisms, must have a very different relation to the faculty of reason from that of the descending series. 
that is, the progressive procedure of reason on the side of the conditioned by means of episyllogisms. For, as in the former case, the cognition, in parentheses, conclusio, in parentheses, is given only as conditioned. Reason can attain to this cognition only under the presupposition that all the members of the series on the side of the conditions are given, begin parentheses, totality in the series of premises, and parentheses, because only under this supposition is the judgment we may be considering possible a priori, while on the other side of the conditioned or the inferences, only an incomplete and becoming and not a presupported or given series, consequently only a potential progression is cogitated. Hence, when cognition is contemplated as conditioned, reason is compelled to, to consider the series of conditions in an ascending line as completed and given in their totality. But if the very same condition is considered at the same time as the same condition of other cognitions, which together con constitute a series of inferences or consequences in a descending line, reason may preserve a perfect indifference as how too far this progression may extend a parte posteriori and whether the totality of this series is possible because it stands in no need of such a series for the purpose of arriving at the conclusion before it inasmuch as the conclusion is sufficiently guaranteed and determined on grounds a parte priori. It may be the case that upon the side of the conditions the series of premises has first or highest condition or it may not possess this and so be a parte priori unlimited but it must nevertheless contain totality of conditions even admitting that we never could succeed in completely apprehending it and the whole series must be unconditionally true if the conditioned which is considered as an inference resulting from it is to be held as true this is a requirement of reason which announces its cognition as determined a priori and as necessary either in itself and in this case it needs no grounds to rest upon or if it is deduced as a member of a series of grounds which is itself unconditionally true. Section 3 System of Transcendental Ideas We are not at present engaged with a logical dialectic which makes complete abstraction of the content of cognition and aims only at unveiling the illusory appearance in the form of syllogisms. Our subject is transcendental dialectic, which must contain completely a priori the origin of certain cognitions drawn from pure reason, and the origin of certain deduced conceptions, the object of which cannot be given empirically and which therefore lie beyond the sphere of the faculty of understanding. We have observed from the natural relations which the transcendental use of our cognition in syllogisms as well as in judgments must have to the logical that there are three kinds of dialect dialectical arguments corresponding to the three modes of conclusion by which reason attains to cognitions on principles and that in all it is the business of reason 
to ascend from the conditioned synthesis beyond which the understanding never proceeds to the unconditioned which the understanding never can reach. Now the most general relations which can exist in our representations are first the relation to the subject, second the relation to objects either as phenomena or as objects of thought in general. If we connect this subdivision with the main division, all the relations of our representations of which we can form either a conception or an idea are threefold. Number, number one, the relation to the subject. Number two, the relation to the manifold of the object as a phenomenon. Number three, the relation to all things in general. Now all pure con conceptions have to do in general with the synthetical unity of representations. Conceptions of pure reason in parentheses transcendental ideas and parentheses on the other hand with the unconditional synthetical unity of all conditions. It follows that all transcendental ideas arrange them, the, themselves in three classes, the, the first of which contains the absolute, begin parentheses, unconditioned, end parentheses, uni, unity of the thinking subject, the second, the absolute unity of the series of the conditions of a phenomenon. The third, the absolute unity of the condition of all objects of thought in general. The thinking, subs the thinking subject is the object matter of psychology. The sum total of all phenomena, in parentheses, the world, in parentheses, is the object matter of cosmology and the thing which contains the highest condition of the possibility of all that is cogitable in parentheses the being of all beings in parentheses is the object matter of all theology thus pure reason presents us with the idea of a transcendental doctrine of the soul, in parentheses, psychologia rationalis, in parentheses, of a transcendental science of the world, begin parentheses, cosmologia rationalis, in parentheses, and finally, of a transcendent, transcendental doctrine of God, in parentheses, Theologia Transcendentalis and parentheses. Un understanding cannot originate even the outlines of any of these sciences, even when connected with the highest logical use of reason, that is, all cogitable syllogisms, for the purpose of proceeding from one object, in parentheses, phenomenon, in parentheses, to all others, even to the utmost limits of the empirical synthesis. They are, on the contrary, pure and genuine products or problems of pure reason. What modi of the pure conceptions of reason these transcendental ideas are will be fully exposed in the following chapter. They follow the guiding thread of the categories. For pure reason never relates immediately to objects, but to the conceptions of these contained in the understanding. In like manner, it will be made manifest in the detailed explanation of these ideas how reason, merely through the synthetical use 
of the same function which it employs in a categorical syllogism necessarily attains to the conception of the absolute unity of the thinking subject. How the logical procedure in hypothetical ideas necessarily produces the idea of the absolutely unconditioned in a series of given conditions and finally how the, how the mere form of the disjunctive syllogism involves the highest conception of a being of all beings. A thought which at first sight seems in the highest degree paradoxical. An objective deduction such as we were able to present in the case of the categories is impossible as regards these transcendent, transcendental ideas for they have in truth no relation to any object in experience for the very reason that they are only ideas but a subjective de deduction of them from the nature of our reason is possible and has been given in the present chapter it is easy to perceive that the sole aim of pure reason is the absolute totality of the synthesis on the side of the conditions and that that it does not concern itself with the absolute completeness on the part of the conditioned for of the former alone does she stand in need in order to preposit the whole series of conditions and thus present them to the understanding a priori but if we once have a completely begin parentheses and unconditionally end parentheses given condition there is no further necessity in proceeding with the series for a conception of reason for the understanding takes of itself every step downward from the from the condition to the conditioned thus the transcendental ideas are available only for ascending in the series of conditions till we reach the unconditioned that is principles as regards descending to the conditioned on the other hand we find that there is a widely extensive logical use which reason makes of the of the laws of the understanding but that a transcendental use thereof is impossible and that when we form an idea of the absolute totality of such a sy synthesis for example of the whole series of all future changes in the world this idea is mere ens rationis, an arbitrary fiction of thought, and not a necessary presupposition of reason. For the possibility of the condition presupposes the totality of its conditions, but not of its consequences. Consequently, this conception is not a transcendental idea and it is with these alone that we are at present occupied finally it is obvious that there exists among the transcendental ideas a certain connection and unity and that pure reason by means of them collects all its cognitions into one system from the cognition of self to the cognition of the world and through these to the supreme being the progression is so natural that it seems to resemble the logical mark of reason from the premises to the conclusion begin footnote 41 footnote 41 the science of metaphysics has for the proper object of its inquiries only three grand ideas God freedom and immortality 
and it aims at showing that the second conception conjoined with the first must lead to the, to the third as a necessary conclusion. All the other subjects which with it occupies itself are merely means for the attainment and realization of these ideas. It does not require these ideas for the construction of a science of nature, but, on the contrary, for the purposes of passing beyond the sphere of nature. A complete insight into and comprehension of them would render theology, ethics, and through the conjunction of both religion, solely dependent on the speculative faculty of reason. In a systematic representation of these ideas, the above-mentioned arrangement, the synthetical one, would be the most suitable, but in the investigation which must necessarily precede it, the analytical, which reverses this arrangement, would be better adapted to our purpose, as in it we should proceed from that which experience immediately presents to us, psychology, to cosmology, and thence to theology. End of footnote 41. Now, whether there lies unobserved at the foundation of these ideas an analogy of the same kind as exists between the logical and transcendental procedure of reason is another of those questions, the answer to which we must not expect till we arrive at a more advanced stage in our inquiries. In this cursory and preliminary view, we have, meanwhile, reached our aim. We have dispelled the ambiguity which attached to the transcendental conceptions of reason, from their being commonly mixed up with other conceptions in the systems of philosophers and not properly distinguished from the conceptions of the understanding. We have exposed their origin and thereby at the same time their determinate number and presented them in a systematic connection and have thus marked out and enclosed a definite sphere for pure reason. End of Book One and 22 the Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant Transcendental Doctrine of Elements Part Second Transcendental Logic Second Division Transcendental Dialectic Book Two of the Dialectical Procedure of Pure Reason Introduction Recording by Jeff Dugweiler It may be said that the object of a merely transcendental idea is something of which we have no conception, although the idea may be a necessary product of reason according to its original laws. For, in fact, a conception of an object that is adequate to the idea given by reason is impossible. For such an object must be capable of being presented and intuited in a possible experience but we should express our meaning better and with less risk of being misunderstood if we said that we can have no knowledge of an object which perfectly corresponds to an idea, although we may possess a problematical conception thereof. Now, the transcendental subjective reality, at least of the pure conceptions of reason, rests upon the fact that we are led to such ideas by a necessary procedure of reason. There must therefore be syllogisms which contain no empirical premises, and by means of which we conclude from something that we do know, to something of which we do not even possess a conception, to which we nevertheless 
by an unavoidable illusion, ascribe objective reality. Such arguments are, as regards their result, rather to be termed sophisms than syllogisms, although indeed as regards their origin, they are very well entitled to the latter name, inasmuch as they are not fictions or accidental products of reason, but are necessitated by its very nature. They are sophisms not of men, but of pure reason herself, from which the wisest cannot free himself. After long labor, he may be able to guard against the error, but he can never be thoroughly rid of the illusion which continually mocks and misleads him. Of these dialectical arguments, there are three kinds, corresponding to the number of the ideas which their conclusions present. In the argument or syllogism of the first class, I conclude from the transcendental conception of the subject contains no manifold, the absolute unity of the subject itself, of which I cannot in this matter attain to a conception. This dialectical argument I shall call the transcendental paralogism. The second class of sophistical arguments is occupied with the transcendental conception of the absolute totality of the series of conditions for which a given phenomenon, and I conclude from the fact that I have always a self-contradictory conception of the unconditioned synthetical unity of the series upon one side, the truth of the opposite unity, of which I have nevertheless no conception. The condition of reason in these dialectical arguments I shall term the antinomy of pure reason. Finally, according to the third kind of sophistical argument, I conclude from the totality of the conditions of thinking objects in general, insofar as they can be given, the absolute synthetical unity of all conditions of the possibility of things in general that is, from things which I do not know in their mere transcendental conception, I conclude a being of all things, which I know still less by means of a transcendental conception, and of whose unconditioned necessity I can form no conception whatever. This dialectical argument I shall call the ideal of pure reason. End of section 22, Introduction to Of the Dialectical Procedure of Pure Reason. Section 23, The Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant, Transcendental Doctrine of Elements, Part 2nd, Transcendental Logic. Second Division Transcendental Dialectic Book Two of the Dialectical Procedure of Pure Reason Chapter One of the Paralogisms of Pure Reason Recording by Jeff Dugweiler Of the Paralogisms of Pure Reason The logical paralogism consists in the falsity of an argument in respect of its form, be the content what it may. But a transcendental paralogism has a transcendental foundation, and concludes falsely while the form is correct and unexceptionable. In this manner, the paralogism has its foundation in the nature of human reason, and is the parent of an unavoidable, though not insoluble, mental illusion. We now come to a conception which was not inserted into the general list of transcendental conceptions, and yet must be reckoned with them, but at the same time without in the least altering or indicating a deficiency in that table. This is the conception, or, if the term is preferred, the judgment, I think. But it is rapidly perceived that this thought is, as it were, the vehicle of all conceptions in general, and consequently of transcendental conceptions also, and that it is therefore regarded as a transcendental conception, although it can have no peculiar claim to be so ranked inasmuch it is only used to indicate that all thought is accompanied by consciousness. 
at the same time, pure as this conception is from empirical content, impressions of the senses, it enables us to distinguish between two different kinds of objects. I, as thinking, am an object of the internal sense, and am called soul. That which is an object of the external sense is called body. Thus the expression I, as a thinking being, designates the object matter of psychology, which may be called the rational doctrine of the soul, inasmuch as in this science I desire to know nothing of the soul but what, independently of all experience, which determines me in concreto, may be concluded from this conception I, in so far as it appears in all thought. Now, the rational doctrine of the soul is really an undertaking of this kind. For if the smallest empirical element of thought, if any particular perception of my internal state, were to be introduced among the grounds of cognition of this science, it would not be a rational but an empirical doctrine of the soul. We have thus before us a pretended science raised upon the single proposition, I think, whose foundation or want of foundation we may very properly and agreeably with the nature of a transcendental philosophy here examine. It ought not to be objected that in this proposition which expresses the perception of oneself, an internal experience is asserted, and that consequently the rational doctrine of the soul which is founded upon it is not pure, but partly founded upon an empirical principle. For this internal perception is nothing more than the mere apperception, I think, which in fact renders all transcendental conceptions possible, in which we say, I think, substance, cause, etc. For internal experience in general, and its possibility, or perception in general, and its relation to other perceptions, unless some particular distinction or determination thereof is empirically given, cannot be regarded as empirical cognition, but as cognition of the empirical, and belongs to the investigation of the possibility of every experience, which is certainly transcendental. The smallest object of experience, for example, only pleasure or pain, that should be included in the general representation of self-consciousness, would immediately change the rational into an empirical psychology. I think is therefore the only text of rational psychology from which it must develop its whole system. It is manifest that this thought, when applied to an object, myself, can contain nothing but transcendental predicates thereof, because the least empirical predicate would destroy the purity of the science and its independence of all experience. But we shall have to follow here the guidance of the categories only, as in the present case a thing, I, as thinking being, is at first given. We shall not indeed change the order of the categories as it stands in the table, but begin at the category of substance by which a thing in itself is represented and proceed backwards through the series. The topic of the rational doctrine of the soul, from which everything else it may contain must be deduced, is accordingly as follows. 1. The soul is substance. 2. As regards its quality, it is simple. 3. As regards the different times in which it exists, it is numerically identical, that is unity, not plurality. 4. It is in relation to possible objects in space. Begin footnote. The reader, who may not so easily perceive the psychological sense of these expressions, taken here in their transcendental abstraction, and cannot guess why the latter attribute of the soul belongs to the category of existence, will find the expression sufficiently explained and justified in the sequel. I have, moreover, to apologize for the Latin terms which have been employed instead of their German synonyms, contrary to the rules of correct writing. But I judged it better to sacrifice elegance to perspicuity. 
End of footnote. From these elements originate all the conceptions of pure psychology, by combination alone, without the aid of any other principle. This substance merely, as an object of the internal sense, gives the conception of immateriality, as simple substance, that of incorruptibility. Its identity, as intellectual substance, gives the conception of personality. All these three together, spirituality. Its relation to objects in space gives us the conception of connection, commercium, with bodies. Thus it represents thinking substance as the principle of life in matter, that is, as a soul, anima, and as the ground of animality. And this, limited and determined by the conception of spirituality, gives us that of immortality. Now to these conceptions relate for paralogisms of a transcendental psychology, which is falsely held to be a science of pure reason. Touching the nature of our thinking being, we can, however, lay at the foundation of this science nothing but the simple and in itself perfectly contentless representation I, which cannot even be called a conception, but merely a consciousness which accompanies all conceptions. By this I, or he, or it, who or which thinks, nothing more is represented than a transcendental subject of thought equals X, which is cognized only by means of the thoughts that are as its predicates, and of which, apart from these, we cannot form the least conception. Hence, in a perpetual circle, inasmuch as we must always employ it, in order to frame any judgment respecting it. And this inconvenience we find it impossible to rid ourselves of, because consciousness in itself is not so much a representation distinguishing a particular object as a form of representation in general, insofar as it may be termed cognition. For in and by cognition alone do I think anything. It must, however, appear extraordinary at first sight that the condition under which I think, and which is consequently a property of my subject, should be held to be likewise valid for every existence which thinks, and that we can presume to base upon a seemingly empirical proposition, a judgment which is apodictic and universal, to wit that everything which thinks is constituted as the voice of my consciousness declares it to be, that is, as a self-conscious being. The cause of this belief is to be found in the fact that we necessarily attribute to things, a priori, all the properties which constitute conditions under which alone we can cogitate them. Now I cannot obtain the least representation of a thinking being by means of external experience, but solely through self-consciousness. Such objects are consequently nothing more than the transference of this consciousness of mine to other things, which can only thus be represented as thinking beings. The proposition, I think, is, in the present case, understood in a problematical sense, not in so far as it contains a perception of an existence, like the Cartesian cogito ergo sum, begin footnote, I think, therefore I am, end footnote but in regard to its mere possibility, for the purpose of discovering what properties may be inferred from so simple a proposition, and predicated of the subject of it. If at the foundation of our pure rational cognition of thinking beings there lay more than the mere cogito, if we could likewise call in aid observations on the play of our thoughts, and the thence-derived natural laws of the thinking self, there would arise an empirical psychology, which would be a kind of physiology of the internal sense, and might possibly be capable of explaining the phenomena of that sense. But it could never be available for discovering those properties which do not belong to possible experience, such as the quality of simplicity, nor could it make any apodictic enunciation of the nature of thinking beings, it would therefore not be a rational psychology. 
Now, as the proposition, I think, in the problematical sense, contains the form of every judgment in general, and is the constant accompaniment of all the categories, it is manifest that conclusions are drawn from it only by a transcendental employment of the understanding. This use of the understanding excludes all empirical elements, and we cannot, as has been shown above, have any favorable conception beforehand of his procedure. We shall therefore follow with a critical eye this proposition through all the predicaments of pure psychology, but we shall, for brevity's sake, allow this examination to proceed in an uninterrupted connection. Before entering on this task, however, the following general remark may help to quicken our attention to this mode of argument. It is not merely through my thinking that I cognize an object, but only through my determining a given intuition in relation to the unity of consciousness in which all thinking consists. It follows that I cognize myself, not through my being conscious of myself as thinking, but only when I am conscious of the intuition of myself as determined in relation to the function of thought. All the modi of self-consciousness in thought are hence not conceptions of objects, conceptions of the understanding, categories. They are mere logical functions which do not present to thought an object to be cognized and cannot therefore present myself as an object not the consciousness of the determining, but only that of the determinable self, that is, of my internal intuition, in so far as the manifold contained in it, can be connected conformably with the general condition of the unity of apperception and thought, is the object. 1. In all judgments, I am the determining subject of that relation which constitutes a judgment. But that the I, which thinks, must be considered as in thought always a subject, and as a thing which cannot be a predicate to thought, is an apodictic and identical proposition. But this proposition does not signify that I, as an object, am for myself a self-subsistent being or substance. This latter statement, an ambitious one, requires to be supported by data, which are not to be discovered in thought, and are perhaps, in so far as I consider the thinking self merely as such, not to be discovered in the thinking self at all. 2. That the I or ego of apperception, and consequently in all thought, is singular or simple, and cannot be resolved into a plurality of subjects, and therefore indicates a logically simple subject. This is self-evident from the very conception of an ego, and is consequently an analytical proposition. But this is not tantamount to declaring that the thinking ego is a simple substance, for this would be a synthetical proposition. The conception of substance always relates to intuitions, which with me cannot be other than sensuous, and which consequently lie completely out of the sphere of the understanding and its thought. But to this fear belongs the affirmation that the ego is simple in thought. It would indeed be surprising if the conception of substance, which in other cases requires so much labor to distinguish from the other elements presented by intuition, so much trouble, too, to discover whether it can be simple, as in the case of the parts of matter, should be presented immediately to me, as if by revelation in the poorest mental representation of all. 3. The proposition of the identity of myself amidst all the manifold representations of which I am conscious is likewise a proposition laying in the conceptions themselves and is consequently analytical. But this identity of the subject of which I am conscious in all its representations does not relate to or concern the intuition of the subject by which it is given as an object. This proposition cannot therefore announce the identity of the person by which is understood the consciousness of the identity of its own substance as a thinking being in all change and variation of circumstances. To prove this, we shall require not 
a mere analysis of the proposition, but synthetical judgments based upon a given intuition. 4. I distinguish my own existence as that of a thinking being from that of other things external to me, among which my body is also reckoned. This is also an analytical proposition, for other things are exactly those which I think as different or distinguished from myself. But whether this consciousness of myself is possible without things external to me, and whether, therefore, I can exist merely as a thinking being, without being man, cannot be known or inferred from this proposition. Thus we have gained nothing as regards the cognition of myself as object, by the analysis of the consciousness of myself in thought. The logical exposition of thought in general is mistaken for a metaphysical determination of the object. Our critique would be an investigation utterly superfluous if there existed a possibility of proving a priori that all thinking beings are in themselves simple substances as such, therefore possess the inseparable attribute of personality and are conscious of their existence apart from and unconnected with matter. For we should thus have taken a step beyond the world of sense, and have penetrated into the sphere of noumena, and in this case the right could not be denied us of extending our knowledge in this sphere, of establishing ourselves and, under a favoring star, appropriating to ourselves possessions in it. For the proposition, every thinking being, as such, is simple substance, is an a priori synthetical proposition, because in the first place it goes beyond the conception, which is the subject of it, and adds to the mere notion of a thinking being the mode of its existence, and in the second place annexes a predicate, that of simplicity, to the latter conception, a predicate which it could not have discovered in the sphere of experience. It would follow that a priori synthetical propositions are possible and legitimate not only as we have maintained in relation to objects of possible experience and as principles of the possibility of this experience itself, but are applicable to things in themselves, an inference which makes an end of the whole of this critique and obliges us to fall back on the old mode of metaphysical procedure. But indeed the danger is not so great if we look a little closer into the question. There lurks in the procedure of rational psychology a paralogism, which is represented in the following syllogism. That which cannot be cogitated otherwise than as subject does not exist otherwise than as subject, and is therefore substance. A thinking being, considered merely as such, cannot be cogitated otherwise than as subject. Therefore, it exists also as such, that is, as substance. In the major, we speak of a being that cannot be cogitated generally, and in every relation, consequently as it may be given in intuition. But in the minor, we speak of the same being only in so far as it regards itself as subject, relatively to thought and the unity of consciousness, but not in relation to intuition, by which it is presented as an object to thought. Thus, the conclusion is here arrived at by a sophisma figure dictionis. Begin footnote. Thought is taken in the two premises in two totally different senses. In the major, it is considered as relating and applying to objects in general, consequently to objects of intuition also. In the minor, we understand it as relating merely to self-consciousness. In this sense, we do not cogitate an object, but merely the relation to the self-consciousness of the subject as the form of thought. In the former premise, we speak of things which cannot be cogitated otherwise than as subjects. In the second, we do not speak of things, but of thought, all objects being abstracted, in which the ego is always the subject of consciousness. Hence, the conclusion cannot be 
I cannot exist otherwise than as subject, but only I can, in cogitating my existence, employ my ego only as the subject of the judgment. But this is an identical proposition, and throws no light on the mode of my existence. End footnote. That this famous argument is a mere paralogism will be plain to anyone who will consider the general remark which precedes our exposition of the principles of the pure understanding and the section on noumena. For it was there proved that the conception of a thing which cannot exist per se, only as a subject and never as a predicate, possesses no objective reality. That is to say, we can never know whether there exists any object to correspond to the conception. Consequently, the conception is nothing more than a conception, and from it we derive no proper knowledge. If this conception is to indicate by the term substance an object that can be given, if it is to become a cognition, we must have at the foundation of the cognition a permanent intuition as the indispensable condition of its objective reality. For through intuition alone can an object be given. But in internal intuition, there is nothing permanent, for the ego is but the consciousness of my thought. If then we appeal merely to thought, we cannot discover the necessary condition of the application of the conception of substance that is, of a subject existing per se, to the subject as a thinking being. And thus the conception of the simple nature of substance, which is connected with the objective reality of this conception, is shown to be also invalid, and to be, in fact, nothing more than the logical qualitative unity of self-consciousness in thought, whilst we remain perfectly ignorant whether the subject is composite or not. Refutation of the argument of Mendelssohn for the substantiality or permanence of the soul. This acute philosopher easily perceived the insufficiency of the common argument, which attempts to prove that the soul, it being granted that it is a simple being, cannot perish by dissolution or decomposition. He saw it is not impossible for it to cease to be by extinction or disappearance. He endeavored to prove in his Phaedo that the soul cannot be annihilated by showing that a simple being cannot cease to exist. Inasmuch as be said a simple existence cannot diminish, nor gradually lose portions of its being, and thus be by degrees reduced to nothing, for it possesses no parts and therefore no multiplicity, between the moment in which it is and the moment in which it is not, no time can be discovered, which is impossible. But this philosopher did not consider that granting the soul to possess this simple nature, which contains no parts external to each other and consequently no extensive quantity, we cannot refuse to it any less than to any other being intensive quantity, that is, a degree of reality in regard to all its faculties, nay, to all that constitutes its existence. But this degree of reality can become less and less through an infinite series of smaller degrees. It follows, therefore, that this supposed substance, this thing, the permanence of which is not assured in any other way, may, if not by decomposition, by gradual loss, remissio, of its powers, consequently by languescence, if I may employ this expression, be changed into nothing. For consciousness itself has always a degree which may be lessened. Begin footnote. Clearness is not, as logicians maintain, the consciousness of a representation. For a certain degree of consciousness, which may not, however, be sufficient for recollection, is to be met with in many dim representations. For without any consciousness at all, we should not be able to recognize any difference in the obscure representations we connect, as we really can do with many conceptions, such as those of right and justice, and those of the musician who strikes at once several notes in improvising a piece of music. 
but a representation is clear in which our consciousness is sufficient for the consciousness of the difference of this representation from others. If we are only conscious that there is a difference, but are not conscious of the difference, that is, what the difference is, the representation must be termed obscure. There is, consequently, an infinite series of degrees of consciousness, down to its entire disappearance. End of footnote. Consequently, the faculty of being conscious may be diminished, and so with all other faculties. The permanence of the soul, therefore, as an object of the internal sense, remains undemonstrated, nay, even indemonstrable. Its permanence in life is evident, per se, inasmuch as the thinking being, as man, is to itself at the same time an object of the external senses. But this does not authorize the rational psychologist to affirm from mere conceptions its permanence beyond life. Begin footnote. There are some who think they have done enough to establish a new possibility in the mode of existence of souls, when they have shown that there is no contradiction in their hypotheses on this subject. Such are those who affirm the possibility of thought, of which they have no other knowledge than what they derive from its use in connecting empirical intuitions presented in this our human life, after this life has ceased. But it is very easy to embarrass them by the introduction of counter-possibilities, which rest upon quite as good a foundation. Such, for example, is the possibility of the division of a simple substance into several substances, and conversely, of the coalition of several into one simple substance. For, although divisibility presupposes composition, it does not necessarily require a composition of substances, but only of the degrees of the several faculties of one and the same substance. Now we can cogitate all the powers and faculties of the soul, even that of consciousness, as diminished by one half, the substance still remaining. In the same way, we can represent to ourselves without contradiction this obliterated half as preserved, not in the soul, but without it, and we can believe that, as in this case, everything that is real in the soul and has a degree, consequently its entire existence, has been halved, a particular substance would arise out of the soul. For the multiplicity which has been divided formerly existed, but not as a multiplicity of substances, but of every reality, as the quantum of existence in it. And the unity of substance was merely a mode of existence, which, by this division alone, has been transformed into a plurality of subsistence. In the same manner, several simple substances might coalesce into one, without anything being lost, except the plurality of subsistence, inasmuch as the one substance would contain the degree of reality of all the former substances. Perhaps, indeed, the simple substances, which appear under the form of matter, might, not indeed by a mechanical or chemical influence upon each other, but by an unknown influence of which the former would be but the phenomenal appearance, by means of such a dynamical division of the parent souls as intensive quantities produce other souls, while the former repaired the loss thus sustained with the new matter of the same sort. I am far from allowing any value to such chimeras, and the principles of our analytic have clearly proved that no other than an empirical use of the categories, that of substance, for example, is possible. But if the rationalist is bold enough to construct on the mere authority of the faculty of thought, without any intuition whereby an object is given, a self-subsistent being, merely because the unity of apperception in thought cannot allow him to believe it a composite being, instead of declaring, as he ought to do, that he is unable to explain the possibility of a thinking nature, what ought to hinder the materialist, with as complete an independence of experience, to employ the principle of the rationalist in a directly opposite manner, still preserving the formal unity required by his opponent. End of footnote. If now we take the above propositions 
as they must be accepted as valid for all thinking beings in the system of rational psychology, in synthetical connection, and proceed from the category of relation with the proposition, all thinking beings are, as such, substances, backwards through the series, till the circle is completed, we come at last to their existence, of which, in this system of rational psychology, substances are held to be conscious independently of external things. Nay, it is asserted that, in relation to the permanence which is a necessary characteristic of substance, they can of themselves determine external things. It follows that idealism, at least problematical idealism, is perfectly unavoidable in this rationalistic system. And if the existence of outward things is not held to be requisite to the determination of the existence of a substance in time, the existence of these outward things at all is a gratuitous assumption which remains without the possibility of a proof. But if we proceed analytically, the I think as a proposition containing in itself an existence as given, consequently modality being the principle, and dissect this proposition in order to ascertain its content and discover whether and how this ego determines its existence in time and space without the aid of anything external. The propositions of rationalistic psychology would not begin with the conception of a thinking being, but with a reality and the properties of a thinking being in general would be deduced from the mode in which this reality is cogitated after everything empirical had been abstracted, as is shown in the following table. 1. I think. 2. As subject. 3. As simple subject. 4. As identical subject in every state of my thought. Now, inasmuch as it is not determined in this second proposition, whether I can exist and be cogitated only as subject, and not also as a predicate of another being, the conception of a subject is here taken in a merely logical sense, and it remains undetermined whether substance is to be cogitated under the conception or not. But in the third proposition, the absolute unity of apperception, the simple ego, in the representation to which all connection and separation, which constitute thought, relate, is of itself important, even although it presents us with no information about the constitution or subsistence of the subject. Apperception is something real, and the simplicity of its nature is given in the very fact of its possibility. Now in space, there is nothing real that is at the same time simple, for points which are the only simple things in space are merely limits but not constituent parts of space from this follows the impossibility of a definition of the basis of materialism of the constitution of my ego as a merely thinking subject but because my existence is considered in the first proposition as given for it does not mean every thinking being exists for this would be predicating of them absolute necessity. But only, I exist thinking. The proposition is quite empirical, and contains the determinability of my existence merely in relation to my representations in time. But as I require for this purpose something that is permanent, such as is not given in internal intuition, the mode of my existence, whether as substance or as accident, cannot be determined by means of this simple self-consciousness. Thus, if materialism is inadequate to explain the mode in which I exist, spiritualism is likewise as insufficient, and the conclusion is that we are utterly unable to attain to any knowledge of the constitution of the soul, insofar as it relates to the possibility of its existence apart from external objects. And indeed, how should it be possible, merely by the aid of the unity of consciousness, which we cognize only for the reason that it is indispensable to the possibility of experience, to pass the bounds of experience, 
our existence in this life, and to extend our cognition to the nature of all thinking beings by means of the empirical, but in relation to every sort of intuition, perfectly undetermined proposition, I think. There does not then exist any rational psychology as a doctrine furnishing any addition to our knowledge of ourselves. It is nothing more than a discipline which sets impassable limits to speculative reason in this region of thought, to prevent it, on the one hand, from throwing itself into the arms of a soulless materialism, and, on the other, from losing itself in the mazes of a baseless spiritualism. It teaches us to consider this refusal of our reason to give any satisfactory answer to questions which reach beyond the limits of this, our human life, as a hint to abandon fruitless speculation, and to direct to a practical use our knowledge of ourselves, which, although applicable only to objects of experience, receives its principles from a higher source, and regulates its procedure as if our destiny reached far beyond the boundaries of experience and life. From all this it is evident that rational psychology has its origin in a mere understanding. The unity of consciousness, which lies at the basis of the categories, is considered to be an intuition of the subject as an object, and the category of substance is applied to the intuition. But this unity is nothing more than the unity of thought, by which no object is given, to which therefore the category of substance, which always presupposes a given intuition, cannot be applied. Consequently, the subject cannot be cognized. The subject of the categories cannot, therefore, for the very reason that it cogitates these, frame any conception of itself as an object of the categories. For to cogitate these, it must lay at the foundation its own pure self-consciousness, the very thing that it wishes to explain and describe. In like matter, the subject in which the representation of time has its basis, cannot determine, for this very reason, its own existence in time. Now, if the latter is impossible, the former, as an attempt to determine itself by means of the categories, as a thinking being in general, is no less so. Begin footnote. The I think is, as has been already stated, an empirical proposition, and contains the proposition I exist, but I cannot say everything which thinks exists, for in this case the property of thought would constitute all beings possessing it, necessary beings. Hence my existence cannot be considered as an inference from the proposition, I think, as Descartes maintained, because in this case the major premise, everything which thinks exists, must proceed, but the two propositions are identical. The proposition, I think, expresses an undetermined empirical intuition, that perception, proving consequently that sensation, which must belong to sensibility, lies at the foundation of this proposition. But it precedes experience, whose province it is to determine an object of perception by means of the categories in relation to time, and existence in this proposition is not a category, as it does not apply to an undetermined given object, but only to one of which we have a conception, and about which we wish to know whether it does or does not exist, out of and apart from this conception. An undetermined perception signifies here merely something real that has been given only, however, to thought in general, but not as a phenomenon, nor as a thing in itself, noumenon but only as something that really exists and is designated as such in the proposition I think. For it must be remarked that when I call the proposition I think an empirical proposition, I do not thereby mean that the ego in the proposition is an empirical representation. On the contrary, it is purely intellectual because it belongs to thought in general. But without some empirical representation which presents to the mind material for thought, the mental act, I think, would not take place, and the empirical is only the condition of the application or employment of the pure intellectual faculty. 
End of footnote. Thus, then, appears the vanity of the hope of establishing a cognition, which is to extend its rule beyond the limits of experience, a cognition which is one of the highest interests of humanity, and thus is proved the futility of the attempt of speculative philosophy in this region of thought. But in this interest of thought, the severity of criticism is rendered to reason a not unimportant service by the demonstration of the impossibility of making any dogmatical affirmation concerning an object of experience beyond the boundaries of experience. She has thus fortified reason against all affirmations of the contrary. Now, this can be accomplished in only two ways. Either our proposition must be proved apodictically, or, if this is unsuccessful, the sources of this inability must be sought for, and, if these are discovered to exist in the natural and necessary limitation of our reason, our opponents must submit to the same law of renunciation and refrain from advancing claims to dogmatic assertion. But the right, say rather the necessity, to admit a future life, upon principles of the practical conjoined with the speculative use of reason, has lost nothing by this renunciation, for the merely speculative proof has never had any influence upon the common reason of men. It stands upon the point of a hair, so that even the schools have been able to preserve it from falling only by incessantly discussing it and spinning it like a top, and even in their eyes it has never been able to present any safe foundation for the erection of a theory. The proofs which have been current among men preserve their value undiminished, nay, rather, give in clearness and unsophisticated power by the rejection of the dogmatical assumptions of speculative reason. For reason is thus confined within her own peculiar province, the arrange of ends or aims, which is at the same time the arrangement of nature, and as a practical faculty, without limiting itself to the latter, it is justified in extending the former, and with it our own existence beyond the boundaries of experience and life. If we turn our attention to the analogy of the nature of living beings in this world, in the consideration of which reason is obliged to accept as a principle that no organ, no faculty, no appetite is useless, and that nothing is superfluous, nothing disproportionate to its use, nothing unsuited to its end, but that, on the contrary, everything is perfectly conformed to its destination in life, we shall find that man, who alone is the final end and aim of this order, is still the only animal that seems to be accepted from it. For his natural gifts, not merely as regards the talents and motives that may incite him to employ them, but especially the moral law in him, stretch so far beyond all mere earthly utility and advantage that he feels himself bound to prize the mere consciousness of probity apart from all advantageous consequences, even the shadowy gift of posthumous fame, above everything, and he is conscious of an inward call to constitute himself by his conduct in this world without regard to mere sublunary interests, the citizen of a better. This mighty, irresistible proof, accompanied by an ever-increasing knowledge of the conformability to a purpose in everything we see around us, by the conviction of the boundless immensity of creation, by the consciousness of a certain illimitableness in the possible extension of our knowledge, and by a desire commensurate therewith, remains to humanity, even after the theoretical cognition of ourselves has failed to establish the necessity of an existence after death. Conclusion of the Solution of the Psychological Paralogism The dialectical illusion in rational psychology arises from our confounding idea of reason, of a pure intelligence, with the conception, in every respect undetermined, of a thinking being in general. I cogitate myself in behalf of a possible experience, at the same time making abstraction of all actual experience, and infer therefrom that I can be conscious of myself apart from my experience and its empirical conditions. I consequently confound the possible abstraction of my empirically determined existence 
with the supposed consciousness of a possible separate existence of my thinking self, and I believe that I cognize what is substantial in myself as a transcendental subject, when I have nothing more in thought than the unity of consciousness which lies at the basis of all determination of cognition. The task of explaining the community of the soul with the body does not properly belong to the psychology of which we are here speaking, because it proposes to prove the personality of the soul apart from this communion after death, and is therefore transcendent in the proper sense of the word, although occupying itself with an object of experience, only in so far, however, as it ceases to be an object of experience. But a sufficient answer may be found to the question in our system. The difficulty which lies in the execution of this task consists, as is well known, in the presupposed heterogeneity of the object of the internal sense, the soul, and the objects of the external senses, inasmuch as the formal condition of the intuition of the one is time, and of that of the other space also. But if we consider that both kinds of objects do not differ internally, but only in so far as the one appears externally to the other, consequently, that what lies at the basis of phenomena as a thing in itself may not be heterogeneous, this difficulty disappears. There then remains no other difficulty than is to be found in the question how a community of substances is possible, a question which lies out of the region of psychology, and which the reader, after what in our analytic has been said of primitive forces and faculties, will easily judge to be also beyond the region of human cognition. End of section 23, chapter 1 of the Paralogisms of Pure Reason. Section 24 The Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant Transcendental Doctrine of Elements Part 2nd Transcendental Logic Second Division Transcendental Dialectic Book 2 Of the Dialectical Procedure of Pure Reason Chapter 2 The Antinomy of Pure Reason Introduction and Section 1 System of Cosmological Ideas We showed in the introduction to this part of our work that all transcendental illusion of pure reason arose from dialectical arguments, the schema of which logic gives us in its three formal species of syllogisms, just as the categories find their logical schema in the four functions of all judgments. The first kind of these sophistical arguments related to the unconditioned unity of the subjective conditions of all representations in general, of the subject or soul, in correspondence with the categorical syllogisms, the major of which, as the principle, enounces the relation of a predicate to a subject. The second kind of dialectical argument will therefore be concerned, following the analogy with hypothetical syllogisms, with the unconditioned unity of the objective conditions in the phenomenon, and, in this way, the theme of the third kind to be treated of in the following chapter will be the unconditioned unity of the objective conditions of the possibility of objects in general. But it is worthy of remark that the transcendental paralogism produced in the mind only a one-third illusion in regard to the idea of the subject of our thought and the conceptions of reason gave no ground to maintain the contrary proposition. The advantage is completely on the side of pneumatism, although this theory itself passes into naught in the crucible of pure reason. Very different is the case when we apply reason to the objective synthesis of phenomena. Here, certainly, reason establishes, with much plausibility, its principle of unconditioned unity, but it very soon falls into such contradictions that it is compelled, in relation to cosmology, to renounce its pretensions. For here, a new phenomenon of human reason meets us, 
a perfectly natural antithetic, which does not require to be sought for by subtle sophistry, but into which reason of itself unavoidably falls. It is thereby preserved, to be sure, from the slumber of a fancied conviction, which a merely one-sided illusion produces, but it is at the same time compelled either, on the one hand, to abandon itself to a despairing skepticism, or, on the other, to assume a dogmatical confidence and obstinate persistence in certain assertions, without granting a fair hearing to the other side of the question. Either is the death of a sound philosophy, although the former might perhaps deserve the title of the euthanasia of pure reason. Before entering this region of discord and confusion, which the conflict of the laws of pure reason, antinomy, produces, we shall present the reader with some considerations in explanation and justification of the method we intend to follow in our treatment of this subject. I term all transcendental ideas, in so far as they relate to the absolute totality in the synthesis of phenomena, cosmical perceptions, partly on account of this unconditioned totality on which the conception of the world whole is based, a conception which is itself an idea, partly because they relate solely to the synthesis of phenomena, the empirical synthesis, while, on the other hand, the absolute totality in the synthesis of the conditions of all possible things gives rise to an ideal of pure reason, which is quite distinct from the cosmical conception, although it stands in relation with it. Hence, as the paralogisms of pure reason laid the foundation for a dialectical psychology, the antinomy of pure reason will present us with the transcendental principles of a pretended pure, rational cosmology, not, however, to declare it valid and to appropriate it, but, as the very term of a conflict of reason sufficiently indicates, to present it as an idea which cannot be reconciled with phenomena and experience. Section 1. System of Cosmological Ideas that we may be able to enumerate with systematic precision these ideas according to a principle, we must remark, in the first place, that it is from the understanding alone that pure and transcendental conceptions take their origin, that the reason does not properly give birth to any conception, but only frees the conception of the understanding from the unavoidable limitation of a possible experience, and thus endeavors to raise it above the empirical, though it must still be in connection with it. This happens from the fact that, for a given conditioned, reason demands absolute totality on the side of the conditions, to which the understanding submits all phenomena, and thus makes of the category a transcendental idea. This it does, that it may be able to give absolute completeness to the empirical synthesis, by continuing it to the unconditioned, which is not to be found in experience, but only in the idea. Reason requires this according to the principle, if the conditioned is given, the whole of conditions, and consequently the absolutely unconditioned, is also given, whereby alone the former was possible. First, then, the transcendental ideas are properly nothing but categories elevated to the unconditioned and they may be arranged in a table according to the titles of the latter. But secondly, all the categories are not available for this purpose, but only those in which the synthesis constitutes a series of conditions subordinated to, not coordinated with, each other. Absolute totality is required of reason only in so far as concerns the ascending series of the conditions of a conditioned, not, consequently, when the question relates to the descending series of consequences, or to the aggregate of the coordinated conditions of these consequences. For, in relation to a given conditioned, conditions are presupposed and considered to be given along with it. On the other hand, as the consequences do not render possible their conditions, but rather presuppose them, in the consideration of the procession of consequences, or in the descent from the given condition to the conditioned, we may be quite unconcerned whether the series ceases or not, and their totality is not a necessary demand of reason. 
Thus we cogitate, and necessarily, a given time completely elapsed up to a given moment, although that time is not determinable by us. But as regards time future, which is not the condition of arriving at the present, in order to conceive it, it is quite indifferent whether we consider future time as ceasing at some point, or as prolonging itself to infinity. Take, for example, the series M, N, O, in which N is given as conditioned in relation to M, but at the same time as the condition of O, and let the series proceed upwards from the conditioned N to M, L, K, I, etc., and also downwards from the condition N to the conditioned O, P, Q, R, etc. I must presuppose the former series to be able to consider N as given, and N is according to reason, the totality of conditions, possible only by means of that series. But its possibility does not rest on the following series, O, P, Q, R, which for this reason cannot be regarded as given, but only is capable of being given. Dabilis. I shall term the synthesis of the series on the side of the conditions, from that nearest to the given phenomenon, up to the more remote, regressive. That which proceeds on the side of the conditioned, from the immediate consequence to the more remote, I shall call the progressive synthesis. The former proceeds in antecedentia, the latter in consequentia. The cosmological ideas are therefore occupied with the totality of the regressive synthesis, and proceed in antecedentia, not in consequentia. When the latter takes place, it is an arbitrary and not a necessary problem of pure reason. For we require, for the complete understanding of what is given in a phenomenon, not the consequences which succeed, but the grounds or principles which precede. In order to construct the table of ideas in correspondence with the table of categories, we take first the two primitive quanta of all our intuitions, time and space. Time is in itself a series, and the formal condition of all series, and hence, in relation to a given present, we must distinguish a priori in it the antecedentia as conditions, time past, from the consequentia, time future. Consequently, the transcendental idea of the absolute totality of the series of conditions of a given conditioned relates merely to all past time. According to the idea of reason, the whole past time, as the condition of the given moment, is necessarily cogitated as given. But as regards space, there exists in it no distinction between progressus and regressus, for it is an aggregate and not a series, its parts existing together at the same time. I can consider a given point of time in relation to past time only as conditioned, because this given moment comes into existence only through the past time, rather through the passing of the preceding time. But as the parts of space are not subordinated, but coordinated to each other, one part cannot be the condition of the possibility of the other, and space is not in itself, like time, a series. But the synthesis of the manifold parts of space, the syntheses whereby we apprehend space, is nevertheless successive. It takes place, therefore, in time, and contains a series. And as in this series of aggregated spaces, for example, the feet in a rod, beginning with a given portion of space, those which continue to be annexed form the condition of the limits of the former. The measurement of a space must also be regarded as a synthesis of the series of the conditions of a given conditioned. It differs, however, in this respect from that of time that the side of the conditioned is not in itself distinguishable from the side of the condition, and consequently regressus and progressus in space seem to be identical. 
But inasmuch as one part of space is not given, but only limited by and through another, we must also consider every limited space as conditioned, in so far as it presupposes some other space as the condition of its limitation, and so on. As regards limitation, therefore, our procedure in space is also a regressus, and the transcendental idea of the absolute totality of the synthesis in a series of conditions applies to space also. And I am entitled to demand the absolute totality of the phenomenal synthesis in space as well as time. Whether my demand can be satisfied is a question to be answered in the sequel. Secondly, the real in space, that is, matter, is conditioned. Its internal conditions are its parts, and the parts of parts its remote conditions. So that, in this case, we find a regressive synthesis, the absolute totality of which is a demand of reason. But this cannot be obtained otherwise than by a complete division of parts, whereby the real in matter becomes either nothing or that which is not matter, that is to say, the simple. Consequently, we find here also a series of conditions and a progress to the unconditioned. Thirdly, as regards the categories of a real relation between phenomena, the category of substance and its accidents is not suitable for the formation of a transcendental idea, that is to say, reason has no ground in regard to it to proceed regressively with conditions, for accidents, in so far as they inhere in a substance, are coordinated with each other and do not constitute a series, and, in relation to substance, they are not properly subordinated to it, but are the mode of existence of the substance itself. The conception of the substantial might nevertheless seem to be an idea of the transcendental reason, but, as this signifies nothing more than the conception of an object in general, which subsists in so far as we cogitate in it merely a transcendental subject without any predicates, and, as the question here is of an unconditioned in the series of phenomena, it is clear that the substantial can form no member thereof. The same holds good of substances in community, which are mere aggregates and do not form a series for they are not subordinated to each other as conditions of the possibility of each other, which, however, may be affirmed of spaces, the limits of which are never determined in themselves, but always by some other space. It is therefore only in the category of causality that we can find a series of causes to a given effect, and in which we ascend from the latter as the conditioned to the former as the conditions, and thus answer the question of reason. Fourthly, the conceptions of the possible, the actual, and the necessary do not conduct us to any series, excepting only in so far as the contingent in existence must always be regarded as conditioned, and as indicating, according to a law of the understanding, a condition under which it is necessary to rise to a higher till in the totality of the series, reason arrives at unconditioned necessity. There are, accordingly, only four cosmological ideas, corresponding with the four titles of the categories, for we can select only such as necessarily furnish us with a series in the synthesis of the manifold. First, the absolute completeness of the composition of the given totality of all phenomena. Second, the absolute completeness of the division of given totality in a phenomenon. Third, the absolute completeness of the origination of a phenomenon. And fourth, the absolute completeness of the dependence of the existence of what is changeable in a phenomenon. We must here remark, in the first place, 
that the idea of absolute totality relates to nothing but the exposition of phenomena, and therefore not to the pure conception of a totality of things. Phenomena are here, therefore, regarded as given, and reason requires the absolute completeness of the conditions of their possibility, in so far as these conditions constitute a series. Consequently, an absolutely, that is, in every respect, complete synthesis, whereby a phenomenon can be explained according to the laws of the understanding. Secondly, it is properly the unconditioned alone that reason seeks in this serially and regressively conducted synthesis of conditions. It wishes, to speak in another way, to attain to completeness in the series of premises, so as to render it unnecessary to presuppose others. This unconditioned is always contained in the absolute totality of the series, when we endeavor to form a representation of it in thought. But this absolutely complete synthesis is itself but an idea, for it is impossible, at least beforehand, to know whether any such synthesis is possible in the case of phenomena. When we represent all existence in thought by means of pure conceptions of the understanding, without any conditions of sensuous intuition, we may say with justice that for a given conditioned, the whole series of conditions subordinated to each other is also given, for the former is only given through the latter. But we find in the case of phenomena a particular limitation of the mode in which conditions are given, that is, through the successive synthesis of the manifold of intuition, which must be complete in the regress. Now, whether this completeness is sensuously possible is a problem, but the idea of it lies in the reason, be it possible or impossible to connect with the idea adequate empirical conceptions. Therefore, as in the absolute totality of the regressive synthesis of the manifold in a phenomenon, following the guidance of the categories which represent it as a series of conditions to a given conditioned, the unconditioned is necessarily contained, it being still left unascertained whether and how this totality exists. Reason sets out from the idea of totality, although its proper and final aim is the unconditioned, of the whole series, or of a part thereof. This unconditioned may be cogitated, either as existing only in the entire series, all the members of which therefore would be without exception conditioned, and only the totality absolutely unconditioned. And in this case, the regressus is called infinite. Or the absolutely unconditioned is only a part of the series, to which the other members are subordinated, but which is not itself submitted to any other condition. Footnote 48. The absolute totality of the series of conditions to a given conditioned is always unconditioned, because beyond it there exist no other conditions on which it might depend. But the absolute totality of such a series is only an idea, or rather a problematical conception, the possibility of which must be investigated, particularly in relation to the mode in which the unconditioned, as the transcendental idea which is the real subject of inquiry, may be contained therein. Back to text. In the former case, the series is a parti priori unlimited, without beginning, that is, infinite, and nevertheless completely given. But the regress in it is never completed, and can only be called potentially infinite. In the second case, there exists a first in the series. This first is called, in relation to past time, the beginning of the world. In relation to space, the limit of the world. In relation to the parts of a given limited whole, the simple. In relation to causes, absolute spontaneity, liberty. 
and, in relation to the existence of changeable things, absolute physical necessity. We possess two expressions, world and nature, which are generally interchanged. The first denotes the mathematical total of all phenomena and the totality of their synthesis in its progress by means of composition as well as by division. And the world is termed nature when it is regarded as a dynamical whole, when our attention is not directed to the aggregation in space and time for the purpose of cogitating it as a quantity, but to the unity in the existence of phenomena. Footnote 49. Nature, understood adjective, formaliter, signifies the complex of the determinations of a thing, connected according to an internal principle of causality. On the other hand, we understand by nature, substantive, materialiter, the sum total of phenomena, in so far as they, by virtue of an internal principle of causality, are connected with each other throughout. In the former sense, we speak of the nature of liquid matter, of fire, etc., and employ the word only adjective, while, if speaking of the objects of nature, we have in our minds the idea of a subsisting whole. Back to text. In this case, the condition of that which happens is called a cause. The unconditioned causality of the cause in a phenomenon is termed liberty. The conditioned cause is called, in a more limited sense, a natural cause. The conditioned in existence is termed contingent, and the unconditioned necessary. The unconditioned necessity of phenomena may be called natural necessity. The ideas which we are at present engaged in discussing I have called cosmological ideas, partly because by the term world is understood the entire content of all phenomena, and our ideas are directed solely to the unconditioned among phenomena, partly also because world, in the transcendental sense, signifies the absolute totality of the content of existing things, and we are directing our attention only to the completeness of the synthesis, although properly only in regression. In regard to the fact that these ideas are all transcendent, and although they do not transcend phenomena as regards their mode, but are concerned solely with the world of sense, and not with noumena, nevertheless carry their synthesis to a degree far above all possible experience. It still seems to me that we can, with perfect propriety, designate them cosmical conceptions. As regards the distinction between the mathematically and the dynamically unconditioned, which is the aim of the regression of the synthesis, I should call the two former, in a more limited signification, cosmical conceptions, the remaining two transcendent physical conceptions. This distinction does not at present seem to be of particular importance, but we shall afterwards find it to be of some value. End chapter 2 The Antinomy of Pure Reason This recording is in the public domain. Chapter 2, Section 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant Chapter 2, The Antinomy of Pure Reason Section 2, Antithetic of Pure Reason Conflicts 1 and 2 
Thetic is the term applied to every collection of dogmatical propositions. By antithetic, I do not understand dogmatical assertions of the opposite, but the self-contradiction of seemingly dogmatical cognitions, thesis cum antithesi, in none of which we can discover any decided superiority. Antithetic is not, therefore, occupied with one-sided statements, but is engaged in considering the contradictory nature of the general cognitions of reason and its causes. Transcendental antithetic is an investigation into the antinomy of pure reason, its causes and results. If we employ our reason not merely in the application of the principles of the understanding to objects of experience, but venture with it beyond these boundaries, there arise certain sophistical propositions or theorems. These assertions have the following peculiarities. They can find neither confirmation nor confutation in experience, and each is in itself not only self-consistent, but possesses conditions of its necessity in the very nature of reason, only that, unluckily, there exist just as valid and necessary grounds for maintaining the contrary proposition. The questions which naturally arise in the consideration of this dialectic of pure reason are therefore, first, in what propositions is pure reason unavoidably subject to an antinomy? Second, what are the causes of this antinomy? Third, whether and in what way can reason free itself from this self-contradiction? A dialectical proposition or theorem of pure reason must, according to what has been said, be distinguishable from all sophistical propositions by the fact that it is not an answer to an arbitrary question which may be raised at the mere pleasure of any person, but to one which human reason must necessarily encounter in its progress. In the second place, a dialectical proposition, with its opposite, does not carry the appearance of a merely artificial illusion, which disappears as soon as it is investigated, but a natural and unavoidable illusion, which, even when we are no longer deceived by it, continues to mock us, and, although rendered harmless, can never be completely removed. This dialectical doctrine will not relate to the unity of understanding in empirical conceptions, but to the unity of reason in pure ideas. The conditions of this doctrine are, inasmuch as it must, as a synthesis according to rules, be conformable to the understanding, and at the same time, as the absolute unity of the synthesis to the reason, that, if it is adequate to the unity of reason, it is too great for the understanding, if according with the understanding, it is too small for the reason. Hence arises a mutual opposition, which cannot be avoided, do what we will. These sophistical assertions of dialectic open, as it were, a battlefield where that side obtains the victory which has been permitted to make the attack, and he is compelled to yield, who has been, unfortunately, obliged to stand on the defensive. And hence, champions of ability, whether on the right or on the wrong side, are certain to carry away the crown of victory, if they only take care to have the right to make the last attack, and are not obliged to sustain another onset from their opponent. We can easily believe that this arena has been often trampled by the feet of combatants, that many victories have been obtained on both sides, but that the last victory, decisive of the affair between the contending parties, was won by him who fought for the right, only if his adversary was forbidden to continue the tourney. As impartial umpires, we must lay aside entirely the consideration whether the combatants are fighting for the right or for the wrong side, for the true or for the false, and allow the combat to be first decided. Perhaps, after they have wearied more than injured each other, they will discover the nothingness of their cause of quarrel, 
and part good friends. This method of watching, or rather, of originating, a conflict of assertions, not for the purpose of finally deciding in favor of either side, but to discover whether the object of the struggle is not a mere illusion, which each strives in vain to reach, but which would be no gain even when reached, this procedure, I say, may be termed the skeptical method. It is thoroughly distinct from skepticism, the principle of a technical and scientific ignorance, which undermines the foundations of all knowledge in order, if possible, to destroy our belief and confidence therein. For the skeptical method aims at certainty, by endeavoring to discover in a conflict of this kind, conducted honestly and intelligently on both sides, the point of misunderstanding, just as wise legislators derive from the embarrassment of judges in lawsuits, information in regard to the defective and ill-defined parts of their statutes. The antinomy which reveals itself in the application of laws is for our limited wisdom the best criterion of legislation. For the attention of reason, which in abstract speculation does not easily become conscious of its errors, is thus roused to the momenta in the determination of its principles. But the skeptical method is essentially peculiar to transcendental philosophy, and can perhaps be dispensed with in every other field of investigation. In mathematics, its use would be absurd, because in it no false assertions can long remain hidden, inasmuch as its demonstrations must always proceed under the guidance of pure intuition, and by means of an always evident synthesis. In experimental philosophy, doubt and delay may be very useful, but no misunderstanding is possible, which cannot be easily removed. And, in experience, means of solving the difficulty and putting an end to the dissension must at last be found, whether sooner or later. Moral philosophy can always exhibit its principles, with their practical consequences, in concreto, at least in possible experiences, and thus escape the mistakes and ambiguities of abstraction. But transcendental propositions, which lay claim to insight beyond the region of possible experience, cannot, on the one hand, exhibit their abstract synthesis in any a priori intuition nor, on the other, expose a lurking error by the help of experience. Transcendental reason, therefore, presents us with no other criterion than that of an attempt to reconcile such assertions, and for this purpose to permit a free and unrestrained conflict between them. And this we now proceed to arrange. Footnote 50. The antinomies stand in the order of the four transcendental ideas above detailed. Back to text. First Conflict of the Transcendental Ideas Thesis The world has a beginning in time and is also limited in regard to space. Proof Granted that the world has no beginning in time, up to every moment of time, an eternity must have elapsed, and therewith passed away an infinite series of successive conditions or states of things in the world. Now, the infinity of a series consists in the fact that it can never be completed by means of a successive synthesis. It follows that an infinite series already elapsed is impossible, and that, consequently, a beginning of the world is a necessary condition of its existence, and this was the first thing to be proved. As regards the second, let us take the opposite for granted. In this case, the world must be an infinite given total of coexistent things. Now we cannot cogitate the dimensions of a quantity which is not given within certain limits of an intuition in any other way than by means of the synthesis of its parts, and the total of such a quantity only by means of a completed synthesis, or the repeated addition of unity to itself. 
Footnote 51 We may consider an undetermined quantity as a whole, when it is enclosed within limits, although we cannot construct or ascertain its totality by measurement, that is, by the successive synthesis of its parts, for its limits of themselves determine its completeness as a whole. Back to text. Accordingly, to cogitate the world, which fills all spaces as a whole, the successive synthesis of the parts of an infinite world must be looked upon as completed, that is to say, an infinite time must be regarded as having elapsed in the enumeration of all coexisting things, which is impossible. For this reason, an infinite aggregate of actual things cannot be considered as a given whole, consequently, not as a contemporaneously given whole. The world is consequently, as regards extension in space, not infinite, but enclosed in limits, and this was the second thing to be proved. Antithesis The world has no beginning and no limits in space, but is, in relation both to time and space, infinite. Proof For let it be granted that it has a beginning. A beginning is an existence which is preceded by a time in which the thing does not exist. On the above supposition, it follows that there must have been a time in which the world did not exist, that is, a void time. But, in a void time, the origination of a thing is impossible, because no part of any such time contains a distinctive condition of being, in preference to that of non-being, whether the supposed thing originate of itself or by means of some other cause. Consequently, many series of things may have a beginning in the world, but the world itself cannot have a beginning, and is therefore, in relation to past time, infinite. As regards the second statement, let us first take the opposite for granted, that the world is finite and limited in space. It follows that it must exist in a void space, which is not limited. We should therefore meet not only with a relation of things in space, but also a relation of things to space. Now, as the world is an absolute whole, out of and beyond which no object of intuition, and consequently no correlate to which, can be discovered, this relation of the world to avoid space is merely a relation to no object, but such a relation and consequently the limitation of the world by void space, is nothing. Consequently, the world, as regards space, is not limited, that is, it is infinite in regard to extension. Footnote 52 Space is merely the form of external intuition, formal intuition, and not a real object which can be externally perceived. Space, prior to all things which determine it, fill or limit it, or rather, which present an empirical intuition conformable to it, is, under the title of absolute space, nothing but the mere possibility of external phenomena, in so far as they either exist in themselves, or can annex themselves to given intuitions. Empirical intuition is therefore not a composition of phenomena and space, of perception and empty intuition. The one is not the correlate of the other in a synthesis, but they are vitally connected in the same empirical intuition, as matter and form. If we wish to set one of these two apart from the other, space from phenomena, there arise all sorts of empty determinations of external intuition, which are very far from being possible perceptions. For example, motion or rest of the world in an infinite empty space or a determination of the mutual relation of both, cannot possibly be perceived, and is therefore merely the predicate of a notional entity. Back to text. Observations on the first antinomy. On the thesis. In bringing forward these conflicting arguments, 
I have not been on the search for sophisms, for the purpose of availing myself of special pleading, which takes advantage of the carelessness of the opposite party, appeals to a misunderstood statute, and erects its unrighteous claims upon an unfair interpretation. Both proofs originate fairly from the nature of the case, and the advantage presented by the mistakes of the dogmatists of both parties has been completely set aside. The thesis might also have been unfairly demonstrated by the introduction of an erroneous conception of the infinity of a given quantity. A quantity is infinite if a greater than itself cannot possibly exist. The quantity is measured by the number of given units, which are taken as a standard, contained in it. Now no number can be the greatest, because one or more units can always be added. It follows that an infinite given quantity, consequently an infinite world, both as regards time and extension, is impossible. It is, therefore, limited in both respects. In this manner I might have conducted my proof, but the conception given in it does not agree with the true conception of an infinite whole. In this there is no representation of its quantity. It is not said how large it is. Consequently, its conception is not the conception of a maximum. We cogitate in it merely its relation to an arbitrarily assumed unit, in relation to which it is greater than any number. Now, just as the unit which is taken is greater or smaller, the infinite will be greater or smaller. But the infinity, which consists merely in the relation to this given unit, must always remain the same although the absolute quantity of the whole is not thereby cognized. The true transcendental conception of infinity is that the successive synthesis of unity in the measurement of a given quantum can never be completed. Footnote 53. The quantum in this sense contains a congeries of given units, which is greater than any number and this is the mathematical conception of the infinite. Back to text. Hence it follows, without possibility of mistake, that an eternity of actual successive states up to a given, the present, moment, cannot have elapsed, and that the world must therefore have a beginning. In regard to the second part of the thesis, the difficulty as to an infinite and yet elapsed series disappears, for the manifold of a world infinite in extension is contemporaneously given. But, in order to cogitate the whole of this manifold, as we cannot have the aid of limits constituting by themselves this total in intuition, we are obliged to give some account of our conception, which in this case cannot proceed from the whole to the determined quantity of the parts but must demonstrate the possibility of a whole by means of a successive synthesis of the parts. But, as this synthesis must constitute a series that cannot be completed, it is impossible for us to cogitate prior to it, and consequently not by means of it, a totality. For the conception of totality itself is in the present case the representation of a completed synthesis of the parts, and this completion and consequently, its conception, is impossible. On the Antithesis The proof in favor of the infinity of the cosmical succession and the cosmical content is based upon the consideration that, in the opposite case, a void time and a void space must constitute the limits of the world. Now, I am not unaware that there are some ways of escaping this conclusion. It may, for example, be alleged that a limit to the world as regards both space and time is quite possible without at the same time holding the existence of an absolute time before the beginning of the world, or an absolute space extending beyond the actual world, which is impossible. I am quite well satisfied with the latter part of this opinion of the philosophers of the Leibnizian school. Space is merely the form of external intuition, but not a real object which can 
itself be externally intuited. It is not a correlative phenomena. It is the form of phenomena itself. Space, therefore, cannot be regarded as absolutely and in itself something determinative of the existence of things, because it is not itself an object, but only the form of possible objects. Consequently, things as phenomena determine space. That is to say, they render it possible that, of all the possible predicates of space, size and relation, certain may belong to reality. But we cannot affirm the converse, that space, as something self-subsistent, can determine real things in regard to size or shape. For it is in itself not a real thing. Space, filled or void, may therefore be limited by phenomena, but phenomena cannot be limited by an empty space without them. Footnote 54. It is evident that what is meant here, that empty space, in so far as it is limited by phenomena, space that is within the world, does not, at least, contradict transcendental principles, and may therefore, as regards them, be admitted, although its possibility cannot, on that account, be affirmed. Back to text. This is true of time also. All this being granted, it is nevertheless indisputable that we must assume these two non-entities, void space without, and void time before the world. If we assume the existence of cosmical limits, relatively to space or time. For, as regards the subterfuge adopted by those who endeavor to evade the consequence, that, if the world is limited as to space and time, the infinite void must determine the existence of actual things in regard to their dimensions, it arises solely from the fact that instead of a sensuous world, an intelligible world, of which nothing is known, is cogitated. Instead of a real beginning, an existence which is preceded by a period in which nothing exists, an existence which presupposes no other condition than that of time, and, instead of limits of extension, boundaries of the universe. But the question relates to the mundus phenomenon and its quantity, and in this case we cannot make abstraction of the conditions of sensibility without doing away with the essential reality of this world itself. The world of sense, if it is limited, must necessarily lie in the infinite void. If this, and with it space as the a priori condition of the possibility of phenomena, is left out of view, the whole world of sense disappears. In our problem is this alone considered as given. The mundus intelligibilis is nothing but the general conception of a world in which abstraction has been made of all conditions of intuition, and in relation to which no synthetical proposition, either affirmative or negative, is possible. Second Conflict of Transcendental Ideas Thesis Every composite substance in the world consists of simple parts, and there exists nothing that is not either itself simple, or composed of simple parts. Proof For grant that composite substances do not consist of simple parts, in this case, if all combination or composition were annihilated in that thought, no composite part, and, as by the supposition, there do not exist simple parts, no simple part would exist. Consequently, no substance. Consequently, nothing would exist. Either, then, it is impossible to annihilate composition in thought, or, after such annihilation, there must remain something that subsists without composition, that is, something that is simple. But in the former case, the composite could not itself consist of substances because with substances composition is merely a contingent relation, apart from which they must still exist as self-subsistent beings, 
Now, as this case contradicts the supposition, the second must contain the truth that the substantial composite in the world consists of simple parts. It follows, as an immediate inference, that the things in the world are all, without exception, simple beings, that composition is merely an external condition pertaining to them, and that, although we never can separate and isolate the elementary substances from the state of composition, reason must cogitate these as the primary subjects of all composition, and consequently as prior thereto, and as simple substances. Antithesis. No composite thing in the world consists of simple parts, and there does not exist in the world any simple substance. Proof. Let it be supposed that a composite thing, as substance, consists of simple parts, inasmuch as all external relation, consequently all composition of substances, is possible only in space, the space occupied by that which is composite must consist of the same number of parts as is contained in the composite. But space does not consist of simple parts, but of spaces. Therefore every part of the composite must occupy a space. But the absolutely primary parts of what is composite are simple. It follows that what is simple occupies a space. Now, as everything real that occupies a space contains a manifold, the parts of which are external to each other, and is consequently composite, and a real composite, not of accidents, for these cannot exist external to each other apart from substance, but of substances, it follows that the simple must be a substantial composite, which is self-contradictory. The second proposition of the antithesis that there exists in the world nothing that is simple, is here equivalent to the following. The existence of the absolutely simple cannot be demonstrated from any experience or perception either external or internal. And the absolutely simple is a mere idea, the objective reality of which cannot be demonstrated in any possible experience. It is consequently, in the exposition of phenomena, without application an object. for. Let us take for granted that an object may be found in experience for this transcendental idea. The empirical intuition of such an object must then be recognized to contain absolutely no manifold with its parts external to each other, and connected into unity. Now, as we cannot reason from the non-consciousness of such a manifold to the impossibility of its existence in the intuition of an object, and as the proof of this impossibility is necessary for the establishment and proof of absolute simplicity, it follows that this simplicity cannot be inferred from any perception whatever. As, therefore, an absolutely simple object cannot be given in any experience, and the world of sense must be considered as the sum total of all possible experiences, nothing simple exists in the world. This second proposition in the antithesis has a more extended aim than the first. The first merely banishes the simple from the intuition of the composite, while the second drives it entirely out of nature. Hence we were unable to demonstrate it from the conception of a given object of external intuition of the composite, but we were obliged to prove it from the relation of a given object to a possible experience in general. Observations on the Second Antinomy Thesis When I speak of a whole, which necessarily consists of simple parts, I understand thereby only a substantial whole, as the true composite, that is to say, I understand that contingent unity of the manifold which is given as perfectly isolated, at least in thought, placed in reciprocal connection, and thus constituted a unity. Space ought not to be called a compositum, but a totum, for its parts are possible in the whole, and not the whole by means of the parts. It might perhaps be called a compositum ideale, but not a compositum reale. But this is of no importance. 
as space is not a composite of substances, and not even of real accidents, if I abstract all composition therein, nothing, not even a point, remains. For a point is possible only as the limit of space, consequently of a composite. Space and time, therefore, do not consist of simple parts. That which belongs only to the condition or state of a substance, even although it possesses a quantity, motion or change, for example, likewise does not consist of simple parts. That is to say, a certain degree of change does not originate from the addition of many simple changes. Our inference of the simple from the composite is valid only of self-subsisting things, but the accidents of a state are not self-subsistent. The proof, then, for the necessity of the simple, as the component part of all that is substantial and composite, may prove a failure, and the whole case of this thesis be lost, if we carry the proposition too far, and wish to make it valid of everything that is composite without distinction, as indeed has really now and then happened. Besides, I am here speaking only of the simple in so far as it is necessarily given in the composite the latter being capable of solution into the former as its component parts. The proper signification of the word monas, as employed by Leibniz, ought to relate to the simple, given immediately as simple substance, for example, in consciousness, and not as an element of the composite. As a claimant, the term atomus would be more appropriate and as I wish to prove the existence of simple substances only in relation to, and as the elements of, the composite, I might term the antithesis of the second antinomy transcendental atomistic. But as this word has long been employed to designate a particular theory of corporeal phenomena, moleculae, and thus presupposes a basis of empirical conceptions, I prefer calling it the dialectical principle of monadology. Antithesis. Against the assertion of the infinite subdivisibility of matter, whose ground of proof is purely mathematical, objections have been alleged by the monadists. These objections lay themselves open at first sight to suspicion, from the fact that they do not recognize the clearest mathematical proofs as propositions relating to the constitution of space, in so far as it is really the formal condition of the possibility of all matter, but regard them merely as inferences from abstract but arbitrary conceptions, which cannot have any application to real things, just as if it were possible to imagine another mode of intuition than that given in the primitive intuition of space, and just as if its a priori determinations did not apply to everything, the existence of which is possible, from the fact alone of its filling space. If we listen to them, we shall find ourselves required to cogitate, in addition to the mathematical point, which is simple, not, however, a part, but a mere limit of space, physical points, which are indeed likewise simple, but possess the peculiar property, as parts of space, of filling it merely by their aggregation. I shall not repeat here the common and clear refutations of this absurdity, which are to be found everywhere in numbers. Everyone knows that it is impossible to undermine the evidence of mathematics by mere discursive conceptions. I shall only remark that, if in this case philosophy endeavors to gain an advantage over mathematics by sophistical artifices, it is because it forgets that the discussion relates solely to phenomena and their conditions. It is not sufficient to find the conception of the simple for the pure conception of the composite but we must discover for the intuition of the composite, matter, the intuition of the simple. Now this, according to the laws of sensibility, and consequently in the case of objects of sense, is utterly impossible. In the case of a whole composed of substances, which is cogitated solely by the pure understanding, it may be necessary to be in possession of the simple before composition is possible. But this does not hold good of the totum substantiale phenomenon, which, as an empirical intuition in space, possesses the necessary property of containing 
no simple part for the very reason that no part of space is simple. Meanwhile, the monadists have been subtle enough to escape from this difficulty by presupposing intuition and the dynamical relation of substances as the condition of the possibility of space, instead of regarding space as the condition of the possibility of the objects of external intuition, that is, of bodies. Now we have a conception of bodies only as phenomena, and as such they necessarily presuppose space as the condition of all external phenomena. The evasion is therefore in vain, as indeed we have sufficiently shown in our aesthetic. If bodies were things in themselves, the proof of the monadists would be unexceptionable. The second dialectical assertion possesses the peculiarity of having opposed to it a dogmatical proposition which, among all such sophistical statements, is the only one that undertakes to prove in the case of an object of experience that which is properly a transcendental idea, the absolute simplicity of substance. The proposition is that the object of the internal sense, the thinking ego, is an absolute simple substance, without at present entering upon the subject, as it has been considered at length in a former chapter, I shall merely remark that, if something is cogitated merely as an object, without the addition of any synthetical determination of its intuition, as happens in the case of the bare representation, I, it is certain that no manifold and no composition can be perceived in such a representation as, moreover, the predicates whereby I cogitate this object are merely intuitions of the internal sense, there cannot be discovered in them anything to prove the existence of a manifold whose parts are external to each other, and, consequently, nothing to prove the existence of real composition. Consciousness, therefore, is so constituted that, inasmuch as the thinking subject is, at the same time, its own object, it cannot divide itself although it can divide its inhering determinations. For every object in relation to itself is an absolute unity. Nevertheless, if the subject is regarded externally as an object of intuition, it must, in its character of phenomenon, possess the property of composition. And it must always be regarded in this manner if we wish to know whether there is or is not contained in it a manifold whose parts are external to each other. End chapter 2, The Antinomy of Pure Reason, section 2, Antithetic of Pure Reason, Conflicts 1 and 2. This recording is in the public domain. Section 26. The Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant. Transcendental Doctrine of Elements. Part Second. Transcendental Logic. Second Division. Transcendental Dialectic. Book Two. Of the Dialectical Procedure of Pure Reason. Chapter Two. The Antinomy of Pure Reason. Section Two. Antithetic of Pure Reason, Third and Fourth Antinomies. Third Conflict of the Transcendental Ideas Thesis Causality, according to the laws of nature, is not the only causality operating to originate the phenomena of the world. A causality of freedom is also necessary to account fully for these phenomena proof. Let it be supposed that there is no other kind of causality than that according to the laws of nature. Consequently, everything that happens presupposes a previous condition which it follows with absolute certainty and conformity with a rule. But this previous condition must itself be something that has happened, that has arisen in time, as it did not exist before, for, if it has always been in existence, its consequence or effect would not thus originate for the first time, but would likewise have always existed. 
the causality, therefore, of a cause, whereby something happens, is itself a thing that has happened. Now, this again presupposes, in conformity with the law of nature, a previous condition, and its causality, and this another anterior to the former, and so on. If, then, everything happens solely in accordance with the laws of nature, there cannot be any real first beginning of things, but only a subaltern or comparative beginning. There cannot, therefore, be a completeness of series on the side of the causes which originate the one from the other, but the law of nature is that nothing can happen without a sufficient a priori determined cause. The proposition, therefore, if all causality is possible only in accordance with the laws of nature, is, when stated in this unlimited and general manner, self-contradictory. It follows that this cannot be the only kind of causality. From what has been said, it follows that a causality must be admitted by means of which something happens without its cause being determined according to necessary laws by some other preceding. That is to say, there must exist an absolute spontaneity of cause, which of itself originates a series of phenomena which proceeds according to natural laws. Consequently, transcendental freedom, without which even in the course of nature the succession of phenomena on the side of causes, is never complete. Antithesis There is no such thing as freedom but everything in the world happens solely according to the laws of nature. Proof Granted that there does exist freedom in the transcendental sense as a peculiar kind of causality operating to produce events in the world, a faculty, that is to say, of originating a state and consequently a series of consequences from that state. In this case, not only the series originated by this spontaneity, but the determination of this spontaneity itself to the production of the series, that is to say, the causality itself, must have an absolute commencement, such that nothing can proceed to determine this action according to unvarying laws. But every beginning of action presupposes in the acting cause a state of inaction, and a dynamically primal beginning of action presupposes a state which has no connection, as regards causality, with the preceding state of the cause, which does not, that is, in any wise result from it. Transcendental freedom is therefore opposed to the natural law of cause and effect, and such a conjunction of successive states and effective causes is destructive of the possibility of unity in experience, and for that reason not to be found in experience is consequently a mere fiction of thought. We have, therefore, nothing but nature to which we must look for connection and order in cosmical events. Freedom, independence of the laws of nature, is certainly a deliverance from restraint, but it is also a relinquishing of the guidance of law and rule. For it cannot be alleged that, instead of the laws of nature, laws of freedom may be introduced into the causality of the course of nature, for, if freedom were determined according to laws, it would be no longer freedom, but merely nature. Nature, therefore, and transcendental freedom are distinguishable as conformity to law and lawlessness. The former imposes upon understanding the difficulty of seeking the origin of events ever higher and higher in the series of causes, inasmuch as causality is always conditioned thereby, while it compensates this labor by the guarantee of a unity complete and in conformity with the law. The latter, on the contrary, holds out to the understanding the promise of a point of rest in the chain of causes by conducting to it an unconditioned causality, which professes to have the power of spontaneous origination, but which, in its own utter blindness, deprives it of the guidance of rules by which alone a completely connected experience is possible. Observations on the Third Antinomy 
on the thesis. The transcendental idea of freedom is far from constituting the entire content of the psychological conception so termed, which is for the most part empirical. It merely presents us with the conception of spontaneity of action as the proper ground for imputing freedom to the cause of a certain class of objects. It is, however, the true stumbling-stone to philosophy, which meets with unconquerable difficulties in the way of its admitting this kind of unconditioned causality. That element in the question of the freedom of the will which has for so long a time placed speculative reason in such perplexity, is properly only transcendental, and concerns the question whether there must be held to exist a faculty of spontaneous origination of a series of successive things or states. How such a faculty is possible is not a necessary inquiry, for in the case of natural causality itself, we are obliged to content ourselves with the a priori knowledge that such a causality must be presupposed, although we are quite incapable of comprehending how the being of one thing is possible through the being of another, but must for this information look entirely to experience. Now we have demonstrated this necessity of a free first beginning of a series of phenomena only in so far as it is required for the comprehension of an origin of the world all following states being regarded as a succession according to laws of nature alone. But, as there has thus been proved the existence of a faculty which can of itself originate a series in time, although we are unable to explain how it can exist, we feel ourselves authorized to admit, even in the midst of the natural course of events, a beginning, as regards causality, of different successions of phenomena, and at the same time, to attribute to all substances a faculty of free action. But we ought, in this case, not to allow ourselves to fall into a common misunderstanding and to suppose that, because a successive series in the world can only have a comparatively first beginning, another state or condition of things always preceding, an absolutely first beginning of a series in the course of nature is impossible. For we are not speaking here of an absolutely first beginning in relation to time, but as regards causality alone. When, for example, I, completely of my own free will and independently of the necessarily determinative influence of natural causes, rise from my chair, there commences with this event, including its material consequences in infinitum, an absolutely new series although in relation to time, this event is merely the continuation of a preceding series. For this resolution and act of mind do not form part of the succession of effects in nature and are not mere continuations of it. On the contrary, the determining causes of nature cease to operate in reference to this event, which certainly succeeds the acts of nature, but does not proceed from them. For these reasons, the action of a free agent must be termed, in regard to causality, if not in relation to time, an absolutely primal beginning of a series of phenomena. The justification of this need of reason to rest upon a free act as the first beginning of the series of natural causes is evident from the fact that all philosophers of antiquity, with the exception of the Epicurean school, felt themselves obliged, when constructing a theory of the motions of the universe, to accept a prime mover, that is, a freely acting cause, which spontaneously and prior to all other causes evolved this series of states. They always felt the need of going beyond mere nature, for the purpose of making a first beginning comprehensible. on the antithesis. The asserter of the all-sufficiency of nature in regard to causality, transcendental physiocracy, in opposition to the doctrine of freedom, would defend his view of the question somewhat in the following manner. He would say, in answer to the sophistical arguments of the opposite party, if you do not accept a mathematical first in relation to time, you have no need to seek a dynamical first in relation to causality. 
who compelled you to imagine an absolutely primal condition of the world, and therewith an absolute beginning of the gradually progressing successions of phenomena, and, as some foundation for this fancy of yours, to set bounds to unlimited nature? Inasmuch as the substances in the world have always existed, at least the unity of experience renders such a supposition quite necessary, there is no difficulty in believing also that the changes in the conditions of these substances have always existed, and, consequently, that a first beginning, mathematical or dynamical, is by no means required. The possibility of such an infinite derivation, without any initial member from which all the others result, is certainly quite incomprehensible. But, if you are rash enough to deny the enigmatical secrets of nature for this reason, you will find yourself obliged to deny also the existence of many fundamental properties of natural objects, such as fundamental forces, which you can just as little comprehend, and even the possibility of so simple a conception as that of change, must present to you insuperable difficulties, for if experience did not teach you that it was real, you never could conceive a priori the possibility of this ceaseless sequence of being and non-being. But if the existence of a transcendental faculty of freedom is granted, a faculty of originating changes in the world, this faculty must at least exist out of and apart from the world, although it is certainly a bold assumption that, over and above the complete content of all possible intuitions, there still exists an object which cannot be presented in any possible perception. But to attribute to substances in the world itself such a faculty is quite inadmissible, for, in this case, the connection of phenomena reciprocally determining and determined according to general laws, which is termed nature, and along with it the criteria of empirical truth, which enable us to distinguish experience from mere visionary dreaming, would almost entirely disappear. In proximity with such a lawless faculty of freedom, a system of nature is hardly cogitable, for the laws of the latter would be continually subject to the intrusive influences of the former, and the course of phenomena, which would otherwise proceed regularly and uniformly, would become thereby confused and disconnected. Fourth Conflict of the Transcendental Ideas Thesis There exists, either in or in connection with the world, either as a part of it or as the cause of it, an absolutely necessary being. Proof The world of sense, as the sum total of all phenomena, contains a series of changes. For, without such a series, the mental representation of the series of time itself, as the condition of the possibility of the sensuous world, could not be presented to us. Footnote 55. Objectively, time, as the formal condition of the possibility of change, precedes all changes. But subjectively, and in consciousness, the representation of time, like every other, is given solely by occasion of perception back to text. But every change stands under its condition, which precedes it in time, and renders it necessary. Now the existence of a given condition presupposes a complete series of conditions up to the absolutely unconditioned, which alone is absolutely necessary. It follows that something that is absolutely necessary must exist. If change exists as its consequence. But this necessary thing itself belongs to the sensuous world, for suppose it to exist out of and apart from it. The series of cosmical changes would receive from it a beginning, and yet this necessary cause would not itself belong to the world of sense. But this is impossible. For, as the beginning of a series in time is determined only by that which precedes it in time, the supreme condition of the beginning of a series of changes must exist in the time in which this series itself did not exist. For a beginning presupposes a time preceding, in which the thing that begins to be 
was not in existence. The causality of the necessary cause of changes, and consequently the cause itself, must for these reasons belong to time, and to phenomena, time being possible only as the form of phenomena. Consequently, it cannot be cogitated as separated from the world of sense, the sum total of all phenomena. There is, therefore, contained in the world something that is absolutely necessary, whether it be the whole cosmical series itself, or only a part of it. Antithesis An absolutely necessary being does not exist either in the world or out of it, as its cause. Proof Grant that either the world itself is necessary, or that there is contained in it a necessary existence. Two cases are possible. First, there must either be in the series of cosmical changes a beginning, which is unconditionally necessary and therefore uncaused, which is at variance with the dynamical law of the determination of all phenomena in time, or, secondly, the series itself is without beginning, and, although contingent and conditioned in all its parts, is nevertheless absolutely necessary and unconditioned as a whole, which is self-contradictory. For the existence of an aggregate cannot be necessary if no single part of it possesses necessary existence. Grant, on the other hand, that an absolutely necessary cause exists out of and apart from the world. This cause, as the highest member in the series of the causes of cosmical changes, must originate or begin the existence of the latter and their series. Footnote 56. The word begin is taken in two senses. The first is active the cause being regarded as the beginning of a series of conditions, as its effect, infit. The second is passive, the causality, and the cause itself beginning to operate, fit. I reason here from the first to the second. Back to text. In this case, it must also begin to act, and its causality would therefore belong to time, and consequently, to the sum total of phenomena, that is, to the world. It follows that the cause cannot be out of the world, which is contradictory to the hypothesis. Therefore, neither in the world nor out of it, but in causal connection with it, does there exist any absolutely necessary being. Observations on the Fourth Antinomy on the thesis. To demonstrate the existence of a necessary being, I cannot be permitted in this place to employ any other than the cosmological argument, which ascends from the conditioned in phenomena to the unconditioned in conception, the unconditioned being considered the necessary condition of the absolute totality of the series, the proof from the mere idea of a supreme being belongs to another principle of reason and requires separate discussion. The pure cosmological proof demonstrates the existence of a necessary being, but at the same time leaves it quite unsettled whether this being is the world itself, or quite distinct from it. To establish the truth of the latter view, principles are requisite which are not cosmological and do not proceed in the series of phenomena. We should require to introduce into our proof conceptions of contingent beings, regarded merely as objects of the understanding, and also a principle which enables us to connect these, by means of mere conceptions, with a necessary being. But the proper place for all such arguments is a transcendent philosophy, which has unhappily not yet been established. But if we begin our proof cosmologically by laying at the foundation of it the series of phenomena, and the regress in it according to empirical laws of causality, we are not at liberty to break off from this mode of demonstration and to pass over to something which is not itself a member of the series. 
the condition must be taken in exactly the same signification as the relation of the conditioned to its condition in the series has been taken. For the series must conduct us in an unbroken regress to this supreme condition. But if this relation is sensuous and belongs to the possible empirical employment of understanding, the supreme condition or cause must close the regressive series according to the laws of sensibility, and consequently must belong to the series of time. It follows that this necessary existence must be regarded as the highest member of the cosmological series. Certain philosophers have, nevertheless, allowed themselves the liberty of making such a saltus, metabasis eis alogonos. From the changes in the world they have concluded their empirical contingency, that is, their dependence on empirically determined causes, and they thus admitted an ascending series of empirical conditions, and in this they are quite right. But, as they could not find in this series any primal beginning or highest member, they passed suddenly from the empirical conception of contingency to the pure category, which presents us with a series, not sensuous but intellectual, whose completeness does certainly rest upon the existence of an absolutely necessary cause. Nay, more, this intellectual series is not tied to any sensuous conditions, and is therefore free from the condition of time, which requires it spontaneously to begin its causality in time. But such a procedure is perfectly inadmissible, as will be made plain from what follows. In the pure sense of the categories, that is contingent, the contradictory opposite of which is possible. Now, we cannot reason from empirical contingency to intellectual, the opposite of that which is changed, the opposite of its state, is actual at another time, and is therefore possible. Consequently, it is not the contradictory opposite of the former state. To be that, it is necessary that, in the same time in which the preceding state existed, its opposite could have existed in its place, but such a cognition is not given us in the mere phenomenon of change. A body that was in motion equals A comes to a state of rest equals non-A. Now, it cannot be concluded from the fact that a state opposite to the state A follows it, that the contradictory opposite of A is possible, and that A is therefore contingent. To prove this, we should require to know that the state of rest could have existed in the very same time in which the motion took place. Now we know nothing more than that the state of rest was actual in the time that followed the state of motion, consequently that it was also possible. But motion at one time and rest at another time are not contradictorily opposed to each other. It follows from what has been said that the succession of opposite determinations, that is, change, does not demonstrate the fact of contingency as represented in the conceptions of the pure understanding, and that it cannot, therefore, conduct us to the fact of the existence of a necessary being. Change proves merely empirical contingency, that is to say, that the new state could not have existed without a cause which belongs to the preceding time. This cause even although it is regarded as absolutely necessary, must be presented to us in time, and must belong to the series of phenomena. On the Antithesis The difficulties which meet us in our attempt to rise through the series of phenomena to the existence of an absolutely necessary supreme cause must not originate from our inability to establish the truth of our mere conceptions of the necessary existence of a thing. That is to say, our objections not be ontological, but must be directed against the causal connection with a series of phenomena of a condition which is itself unconditioned. In one word, they must be cosmological, and relate to empirical laws. We must show that the regress in the series of causes, in the world of sense, 
cannot conclude with an empirically unconditioned condition, and that the cosmological argument from the contingency of the cosmical state, a contingency alleged to arise from change, does not justify us in accepting a first cause, that is, a prime originator of the cosmical series. The reader will observe in this antinomy a very remarkable contrast. The very same grounds of proof which established in the thesis the existence of a supreme being, demonstrated in the antithesis, and with equal strictness, the non-existence of such a being. We found first that a necessary being exists, because the whole time past contains the series of all conditions, and with it, therefore, the unconditioned, the necessary. Secondly, that there does not exist any necessary being, for the same reason, that the whole time past contains the series of all conditions, which are themselves, therefore, in the aggregate, conditioned. The cause of this seeming incongruity is as follows. We attend, in the first argument, solely to the absolute totality of the series of conditions, the one of which determines the other in time, and thus arrive at a necessary unconditioned. In the second, we consider, on the contrary, the contingency of everything that is determined in the series of time, for every event is preceded by a time in which the condition itself must be determined as conditioned, and thus everything that is unconditioned or absolutely necessary disappears. In both, the mode of proof is quite in accordance with the common procedure of human reason, which often falls into discord with itself from considering an object from two different points of view. Herr von Meyren regarded the controversy between two celebrated astronomers, which arose from a similar difficulty as to the choice of a proper standpoint, as a phenomenon of sufficient importance to warrant a separate treatise on the subject. The one concluded, The moon revolves on its own axis, because it constantly presents the same side to the earth. The other declared that the moon does not revolve on its own axis for the same reason. Both conclusions were perfectly correct, according to the point of view from which the motions of the moon were considered. End Chapter 2 The Antinomy of Pure Reason Section 2 Antithetic of Pure Reason This recording is in the public domain. Section 27 The Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant Transcendental Doctrine of Elements Part 2nd Transcendental Logic 2nd Division Transcendental Dialectic Book 2 Of the Dialectical Procedure of Pure Reason Chapter 2 The Antinomy of Pure Reason Section 3 of the interest of reason in these self-contradictions. We have thus completely before us the dialectical procedure of the cosmological ideas. No possible experience can present us with an object adequate to them in extent. Nay, more, reason itself cannot cogitate them as according with the general laws of experience. And yet, they are not arbitrary fictions of thought. On the contrary, Reason, in its uninterrupted progress in the empirical synthesis, is necessarily conducted to them when it endeavors to free from all conditions and to comprehend in its unconditioned totality that which can only be determined conditionally in accordance with the laws of experience. These dialectical propositions are so many attempts to solve four natural and unavoidable problems of reason. There are neither more nor can there be less than this number, because there are no other series of synthetical hypotheses 
limiting a priori the empirical synthesis. The brilliant claims of reason striving to extend its dominion beyond the limits of experience have been represented above only in dry formulae, which contain merely the grounds of its pretensions. They have, besides, in conformity with the character of a transcendental philosophy, been freed from every empirical element, although the full splendor of the promises they hold out, and the anticipations they excite, manifests itself only when in connection with empirical cognitions. In the application of them, however, and in the advancing enlargement of the employment of reason, while struggling to rise from the region of experience and to soar to those sublime ideas, philosophy discovers a value and a dignity which, if it could but make good its assertions, would raise it far above all other departments of human knowledge, professing, as it does, to present a sure foundation for our highest hopes and the ultimate aims of all the exertions of reason. The Questions whether the world has a beginning and a limit to its extension in space, whether there exists anywhere, or perhaps in my own thinking self, an indivisible and indestructible unity, or whether nothing but what is divisible and transitory exists, whether I am a free agent, or, like other beings, am bound in the chains of nature and fate, whether, finally, there is a supreme cause of the world, or all our thought and speculation must end with nature and the order of external things, are questions, for the solution of which the mathematician would willingly exchange his whole science, for in it there is no satisfaction for the highest aspirations and most ardent desires of humanity. Nay, it may even be said that the true value of mathematics, that pride of human reason, consists in this, that she guides reason to the knowledge of nature, in her greater as well as in her less manifestations, in her beautiful order and regularity, guides her, moreover, to an insight into the wonderful unity of the moving forces in the operations of nature far beyond the expectations of a philosophy building only on experience, and that she thus encourages philosophy to extend the province of reason beyond all experience, and at the same time provides it with the most excellent materials for supporting its investigations, in so far as their nature admits, by adequate and accordant intuitions. Unfortunately for speculation, but perhaps fortunately for the practical interests of humanity. Reason, in the midst of her highest anticipations, finds herself hemmed in by a press of opposite and contradictory conclusions, from which neither her honor nor her safety will permit her to draw back. Nor can she regard these conflicting trains of reasoning with indifference as mere passages at arms, still less can she command peace, for in the subject of the conflict she has a deep interest. There is no other course left open to her than to reflect with herself upon the origin of this disunion in reason, whether it may not arise from a mere misunderstanding. After such an inquiry, arrogant claims would have to be given up on both sides, but the sovereignty of reason over understanding and sense would be based upon a sure foundation. We shall, at present, defer this radical inquiry, and, in the meantime, consider for a little what side in the controversy we should most willingly take if we were obliged to become partisans at all. As, in this case, we leave out of sight altogether the logical criterion of truth, and merely consult our own interest in reference to the question, these considerations, although inadequate to settle the question of right in either party, will enable us to comprehend how those who have taken part in the struggle adopt the one view rather than the other.
no special insight into the subject, however, having influenced their choice. They will, at the same time, explain to us many other things by the way. For example, the fiery zeal on the one side, and the cold maintenance of their cause on the other. Why the one party has met with the warmest approbations, and the other has always been repulsed by irreconcilable prejudices. There is one thing, however, that determines the proper point of view, from which alone this preliminary inquiry can be instituted and carried on with the proper completeness, and that is, the comparison of the principles from which both sides, thesis and antithesis, proceed. My readers would remark in the propositions of the antithesis a complete uniformity in the mode of thought and a perfect unity of principle. Its principle was that of pure empiricism, not only in the explication of the phenomena in the world, but also in the solution of the transcendental ideas, even of that of the universe itself. The affirmations of the thesis, on the contrary, were based in addition to the empirical mode of explanation employed in the series of phenomena, on intellectual propositions, and its principles were in so far not simple. I shall term the thesis, in view of its essential characteristic, the dogmatism of pure reason. On the side of dogmatism, or of the thesis, therefore, in the determination of the cosmological ideas, we find, first, a practical interest, which must be very dear to every right-thinking man. That the world has a beginning, that the nature of my thinking self is simple and therefore indestructible, that I am a free agent and raised above the compulsion of nature and her laws, and finally, that the entire order of things which form the world is dependent upon a supreme being, from whom the whole receives unity and connection. These are so many foundation stones of morality and religion. The antithesis deprives us of all these supports, or at least seems so to deprive us. Second, a speculative interest of reason manifests itself on this side. For, if we take the transcendental ideas and employ them in the manner which the thesis directs, we can exhibit completely a priori the entire chain of conditions, and understand the derivation of the conditioned, beginning from the unconditioned. This the antithesis does not do, and for this reason, does not meet with so welcome a reception. For it can give no answer to our question respecting the conditions of its synthesis, except such as must be supplemented by another question, and so on, to infinity. According to it, we must rise from a given beginning to one still higher. Every part conducts us to a still smaller one. Every event is preceded by another event which is its cause and the conditions of existence rest always upon other and still higher conditions, and find neither end nor basis in some self-subsistent thing as the primary being. Third, this side has also the advantage of popularity, and this constitutes no small part of its claim to favor. The common understanding does not find the least difficulty in the idea of the unconditioned beginning of all synthesis, accustomed, as it is, rather to allow our consequences than to seek for a proper basis for cognition. In the conception of an absolute first, moreover, the possibility of which it does not inquire into, it is highly gratified to find a firmly established point of departure for its attempts at theory while, in the restless and continuous ascent from the conditioned to the condition, always with one foot in the air, it can find no satisfaction. On the side of the antithesis, or empiricism, 
in the determination of the cosmological ideas. First, we cannot discover any such practical interest arising from pure principles of reason as morality and religion present. On the contrary, pure empiricism seems to empty them of all their power and influence. If there does not exist a supreme being distinct from the world, if the world is without beginning, consequently without a creator, if our wills are not free, and the soul is divisible, and subject to corruption, just like matter, the ideas and principles of morality lose all validity and fall with the transcendental ideas which constituted their theoretical support. Second, but empiricism in compensation holds out to reason, in its speculative interests, certain important advantages, far exceeding any that the dogmatist can promise us. For, when employed by the empiricist, understanding is always upon its proper ground of investigation, the field of possible experience, the laws of which it can explore, and thus extend its cognition securely and with clear intelligence, without being stopped by limits in any direction. Here can it, and ought it, to find and present to intuition its proper object, not only in itself, but in all its relations. Or, if it employ conceptions, upon this ground it can always present the corresponding images in clear and unmistakable intuitions. It is quite unnecessary for it to renounce the guidance of nature, to attach itself to ideas, the objects of which it cannot know, because, as mere intellectual entities, they cannot be presented in any intuition. On the contrary, it is not even permitted to abandon its proper occupation, under the pretense that it has been brought to a conclusion, for it never can be and to pass into the region of idealizing reason and transcendent conceptions, which it is not required to observe and explore the laws of nature, but merely to think and to examine, secure from being contradicted by facts, because they have not been called as witnesses, but passed by, or perhaps subordinated to the so-called higher interests and considerations of pure reason. Hence, the empiricist will never allow himself to accept any epoch of nature for the first, the absolutely primal state. He will not believe that there can be limits to his outlook into her wide domains, nor pass from the objects of nature, which he can satisfactorily explain by means of observation and mathematical thought, which he can determine synthetically in intuition, to those which neither sense nor imagination, can ever present in concreto. He will not concede the existence of a faculty in nature, operating independently of the laws of nature, a concession which would introduce uncertainty into the procedure of the understanding, which is guided by necessary laws to the observation of phenomena. Nor, finally, will he permit himself to seek a cause beyond nature, inasmuch as we know nothing but it and from it alone receive an objective basis for all our conceptions and instruction in the unvarying laws of things. In truth, if the empirical philosopher had no other purpose in the establishment of his antithesis than to check the presumption of a reason which mistakes its true destination, which boasts of its insight and its knowledge, just where all insight and knowledge cease to exist, and regards that which is valid only in relation to a practical interest as an advancement of the speculative interests of the mind, in order, when it is convenient for itself, to break the thread of our physical investigations, and, under pretense of extending our cognition, connect them with transcendental ideas, by means of which we really know only that we know nothing, if, I say, the empiricist rested satisfied with this benefit. The principle advanced by him 
would be a maxim recommending moderation in the pretensions of reason, and modesty in its affirmations, and at the same time would direct us to the right mode of extending the province of the understanding, by the help of the only true teacher, experience. In obedience to this advice, intellectual hypotheses and faith would not be called in aid of our practical interests, nor should we introduce them under the pompous titles of science and insight. For speculative cognition cannot help find an objective basis any otherwhere than in experience, and, when we overstep its limits, our synthesis, which requires ever new cognitions independent of experience, has no substratum of intuition upon which to build. But if, as often happens, empiricism, in relation to ideas, becomes itself dogmatic, and boldly denies that which is above the sphere of its phenomenal cognition, it falls itself into the error of intemperance, an error which is here all the more reprehensible, as thereby the practical interest of reason receives an irreparable injury. And this constitutes the opposition between Epicureanism and Platonism. Footnote. It is, however, still a matter of doubt whether Epicurus ever propounded these principles as directions for the objective employment of the understanding. If, indeed, they were nothing more than maxims for the speculative exercise of reason, he gives evidence therein of a more genuine philosophic spirit than any of the philosophers of antiquity. That, in the explanation of phenomena, we must proceed as if the field of inquiry had neither limits in space nor commencement in time, that we must be satisfied with the teaching of experience in reference to the material of which the world is posed, that we must not look for any other mode of the origination of events than that which is determined by the unalterable laws of nature, and finally, that we not employ the hypothesis of a cause distinct from the world to account for a phenomenon, or for the world itself, are principles for the extension of speculative philosophy, and the discovery of the true sources of the principles of morals, which, however little conformed to in the present day, are undoubtedly correct. At the same time, anyone desirous of ignoring, in mere speculation, these dogmatical propositions, need not, for that reason, be accused of denying them. Return to Text Both Epicurus and Plato assert more in their systems than they know. The former encourages and advances science, although to the prejudice of the practical. The latter presents us with excellent principles for the investigation of the practical, but in relation to everything regarding which we can attain to speculative cognition, permits reason to append idealistic explanations of natural phenomena to the great injury of physical investigation. Third, in regard to the third motive for the preliminary choice of a party in this war of assertions, it seems very extraordinary that empiricism should be utterly unpopular we should be inclined to believe that the common understanding would receive it with pleasure, promising as it does to satisfy it without passing the bounds of experience and its connected order, while transcendental dogmatism obliges it to rise to conceptions which far surpass the intelligence and ability of the most practiced thinkers. But in this, in truth, is to be found its real motive. For the common understanding thus finds itself in a situation where not even the most learned can have the advantage of it. If it understands little or nothing about these transcendental conceptions, no one can boast of understanding any more, and although it may not express itself in so scholastically correct a manner as others, 
it can busy itself with reasoning and arguments without end, wandering among mere ideas, about which one can always be very eloquent, because we know nothing about them, while, in the observation and investigation of nature, it would be forced to remain dumb and to confess its utter ignorance. Thus, indolence and vanity form of themselves strong recommendations of these principles. Besides, although it is a hard thing for a philosopher to assume a principle of which he can give to himself no reasonable account, and still more to employ conceptions, the objective reality of which cannot be established, nothing is more usual with the common understanding. It wants something which will allow it to go to work with confidence. The difficulty of even comprehending a supposition does not disquiet it, because, not knowing what comprehending means, it never even thinks of the supposition it may be adopting as a principle, and regards as known that with which it has become familiar from constant use. And, at last, all speculative interests disappear before the practical interests which it holds dear, and it fancies that it understands and knows what its necessities and hopes incite it to assume or to believe. Thus, the empiricism of transcendentally idealizing reason is robbed of all popularity, and however prejudicial it may be to the highest practical principles, there is no fear that it will ever pass the limits of the schools, or acquire any favor or influence in society, or with the multitude. Human reason is by nature architectonic, that is to say, it regards all cognitions as parts of a possible system, and hence accepts only such principles as at least do not incapacitate a cognition to which we may have attained from being placed, along with others, in a general system. But the propositions of the antithesis are of a character which renders the completion of an edifice of cognitions impossible. According to these, beyond one state or epoch of the world, there is always to be found one more ancient, and in every part always other parts themselves divisible, preceding every event another, the origin of which must itself be sought still higher, and everything in existence is conditioned, and still not dependent on an unconditioned and primal existence. As, therefore, the antithesis will not concede the existence of a first beginning which might be available as a foundation, a complete edifice of cognition, in the presence of such hypothesis, is utterly impossible. Thus, the architectonic interest of reason, which requires a unity, not empirical, but a priori and rational, forms a natural recommendation for the assertions of the thesis in our antinomy. But, if any one could free himself entirely from all considerations of interest, and weigh, without partiality, the assertions of reason, attending only to their content, irrespective of the consequences which follow from them, such a person on the supposition that he knew no other way out of the confusion than to settle the truth of one or other of the conflicting doctrines, would live in a state of continual hesitation. Today he would feel convinced that the human will is free. Tomorrow, considering the indissoluble chain of nature, he would look on freedom as a mere illusion and declare nature to be all in all. But, if he were called to action, the play of the merely speculative reason would disappear like the shapes of a dream, and practical interest would dictate his choice of principles. 
but, as it well befits a reflective and inquiring being to devote certain periods of time to the examination of its own reason, to divest itself of all partiality, and frankly to communicate its observations for the judgment and opinion of others, so no one can be blamed for, much less prevented from, placing both parties on their trial. With permission to end themselves, free from intimidation, before intimidation, before a sworn jury of equal condition with themselves, the condition of weak and fallible men. End section 3 This recording is in the public domain. Section 28 The Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant Transcendental Doctrine of Elements Part 2nd Transcendental Logic Second Division, Transcendental Dialectic Book Two of the Dialectical Procedure of Pure Reason Chapter Two, The Antinomy of Pure Reason Sections Four through Six Section Four of the Necessity Imposed Upon Pure Reason of Presenting a Solution of Its Transcendental Problems to avow an ability to solve all problems and to answer all questions would be a profession certain to convict any philosopher of extravagant boasting and self-conceit, and at once to destroy the confidence that might otherwise have been reposed in him. There are, however, sciences so constituted that every question arising within their sphere must necessarily be capable of receiving an answer from the knowledge already possessed, for the answer must be received from the same sources whence the question arose. In such sciences it is not allowable to excuse ourselves on the plea of necessary and unavoidable ignorance. A solution is absolutely requisite. The rule of right and wrong must help us to the knowledge of what is right and wrong in all possible cases. Otherwise, the idea of obligation or duty would be utterly null, for we cannot have any obligation to that which we cannot know. On the other hand, in our investigations of the phenomena of nature, much must remain uncertain, and many questions continue insoluble. Because what we know of nature is far from being sufficient to explain all the phenomena that are presented to our observation. Now, the question is, whether there is in transcendental philosophy any question relating to an object presented to pure reason, which is unanswerable by this reason, and whether we must regard the subject of the question as quite uncertain so far as our knowledge extends, and must give it a place among those subjects of which we have just so much conception as is sufficient to enable us to raise a question. Faculty or materials failing us, however, when we attempt an answer. Now, I maintain that, among all speculative cognition, the peculiarity of transcendental philosophy is that there is no question relating to an object presented to pure reason, which is insoluble by this reason, and that the profession of unavoidable ignorance, the problem being alleged to be beyond the reach of our faculties, cannot free us from the obligation to present a complete and satisfactory answer. For the very conception which enables us to raise the question must give us the power of answering it, inasmuch as the object, as in the case of right and wrong, is not to be discovered out of the conception. But, in transcendental philosophy, 
it is only the cosmological questions to which we can demand a satisfactory answer in relation to the constitution of their object, and the philosopher is not permitted to avail himself of the pretext of necessary ignorance and impenetrable obscurity. These questions relate solely to the cosmological ideas, for the object must be given in experience, and the question relates to the adequateness of the object to an idea. If the object is transcendental, and therefore itself unknown, if the question, for example, is whether the object, the something, the phenomenon of which, internal, in ourselves, is thought, that is to say, the soul, is in itself a simple being, or whether there is a cause of all things which is absolutely necessary, in such cases we are seeking for our idea an object of which we may confess that it is unknown to us, though we must not on that account assert that it is impossible. Footnote. The question, what is the constitution of a transcendental object, is unanswerable. We are unable to say what it is. But we can perceive that the question itself is nothing, because it does not relate to any object that can be presented to us. For this reason, we must consider all the questions raised in transcendental psychology as answerable and as really answered, for they relate to the transcendental subject of all internal phenomena, which is not itself phenomenon, and consequently not given as an object, in which, moreover, none of the categories, and it is to them that the question is properly directed, find any conditions of its application. Here, therefore, is a case where no answer is the only proper answer. For a question regarding the constitution of a something which cannot be cogitated by any determined predicate, being completely beyond the sphere of objects and experience, is perfectly null and void. Back to text. The cosmological ideas alone possess the peculiarity that we can presuppose the object of them and the empirical synthesis requisite for the conception of that object to be given. And the question which arises from these ideas relates merely to the progress of this synthesis, in so far as it must contain absolute totality, which, however, is not empirical, as it cannot be given in any experience. Now, as the question here is solely in regard to a thing as the object of a possible experience, and not as a thing in itself, the answer to the transcendental cosmological question need not be sought out of the idea. For the question does not regard an object in itself. The question in relation to a possible experience is not what can be given in an experience in concreto, but what is contained in the idea to which the empirical synthesis must approximate. The question must therefore be capable of solution from the idea alone, for the idea is a creation of reason itself, which therefore cannot disclaim the obligation to answer or refer us to the unknown object. It is not so extraordinary, as at first sight appears, that a science should demand and expect satisfactory answers to all the questions which may arise within its own sphere. Questiones domestique. Although, up to a certain time, these answers may not have been discovered. There are, in addition to transcendental philosophy, only two pure sciences of reason, the one with a speculative, the other with a practical content pure mathematics, and pure ethics. Has anyone ever heard it alleged that, from our complete and necessary ignorance of the conditions, it is uncertain 
what exact relation the diameter of a circle bears to the circle in rational or irrational numbers. By the former, the sum cannot be given exactly, by the latter, only approximately, and therefore we decide that the impossibility of a solution of the question is evident. Lambert presented us with a demonstration of this. In the general principles of morals, there can be nothing uncertain, for the propositions are either utterly without meaning, or must originate solely in our rational conceptions. On the other hand, there must be in physical science an infinite number of conjectures, which can never become certainties, because the phenomena of nature are not given as objects dependent on our conceptions. The key to the solution of such questions cannot, therefore, be found in our conceptions, or in pure thought, but must lie without us, and for that reason is in many cases not to be discovered, and consequently a satisfactory explanation cannot be expected. The questions of transcendental analytic, which relate to the deduction of our pure cognition, are not to be regarded as of the same kind as those mentioned above, for we are not at present treating of the certainty of judgments in relation to the origin of our conceptions, but only of that certainty in relation to objects. We cannot, therefore, escape the responsibility of at least a critical solution of the questions of reason by complaints of the limited nature of our faculties, and the seemingly humble confession that it is beyond the power of our reason to decide whether the world has existed from all eternity or had a beginning, whether it is infinitely extended or enclosed within certain limits, whether anything in the world is simple or whether everything must be capable of infinite divisibility, whether freedom can originate phenomena, or whether everything is absolutely dependent on the laws and order of nature, and finally, whether there exists a being that is completely unconditioned and necessary, or whether the existence of everything is conditioned, and consequently dependent on something external to itself, and therefore in its own nature contingent. For all these questions relate to an object which can be given nowhere else than in thought. This object is the absolutely unconditioned totality of the synthesis of phenomena. If the conceptions in our minds do not assist us to some certain result in regard to these problems, we must not defend ourselves on the plea that the object itself remains hidden from and unknown to us. For no such thing, or object, can be given. It is not to be found out of the idea in our minds. We must seek the cause of our failure in our idea itself, which is an insoluble problem, and in regard to which we obstinately assume that there exists a real object corresponding and adequate to it. A clear explanation of the dialectic which lies in our conception will very soon enable us to come to a satisfactory decision in regard to such a question. The pretext that we are unable to arrive at certainty in regard to these problems may be met with this question, which requires at least a plain answer. From what source do the ideas originate, the solution of which involves you in such difficulties? Are you seeking for an explanation of certain phenomena, and do you expect these ideas to give you the principles or the rules of this explanation? Let it be granted that all nature was laid open before you, that nothing was hid from your senses and your consciousness. Still, you could not cognize in concreto the object of your ideas in any experience, for what is demanded is not only this full and complete intuition, but also a complete synthesis, and the consciousness of its absolute totality, and this is not possible by means of any empirical cognition. It follows 
that your question, your idea, is by no means necessary for the explanation of any phenomenon, and the idea cannot have been in any sense given by the object itself. For such an object can never be presented to us, because it cannot be given by any possible experience. Whatever perceptions you may attain to, you are still surrounded by conditions, in space or in time, and you cannot discover anything unconditioned, nor can you decide whether this unconditioned is to be placed in an absolute beginning of the synthesis, or in an absolute totality of the series without beginning. A whole, in the empirical signification of the term, is always merely comparative. The absolute whole of quantity, the universe, of division, of derivation, of the condition of existence, with the question whether it is to be produced by finite or infinite synthesis, no possible experience can instruct us concerning. You will not, for example, be able to explain the phenomena of a body in the least degree better, whether you believe it to consist of simple or of composite parts. For a simple phenomenon, and just as little an infinite series of composition, can never be presented to your perception. Phenomena require and admit of explanation only in so far as the conditions of that explanation are given in perception, but the sum total of that which is given in phenomena, considered as an absolute whole, is itself a perception, and we cannot therefore seek for explanations of this whole beyond itself in other perceptions. The explanation of this whole is the proper object of the transcendental problems of pure reason. Although, therefore, the solution of these problems is unattainable through experience, we must not permit ourselves to say that it is uncertain how the object of our inquiries is constituted. For the object is in our own mind, and cannot be discovered in experience and we have only to take care that our thoughts are consistent with each other, and to avoid falling into the amphiboly of regarding our ideas as a representation of an object empirically given, and therefore to be cognized according to the laws of experience. A dogmatical solution is therefore not only unsatisfactory, but impossible. The critical solution which may be a perfectly certain one, does not consider the question objectively, but proceeds by inquiring into the basis of the cognition upon which the question rests. End section 4 Section 5. Skeptical Exposition of the Cosmological Problems Presented in the Four Transcendental Ideas We should be quite willing to desist from the demand of a dogmatical answer to our questions, if we understood beforehand that, be the answer what it may, it would only serve to increase our ignorance, to throw us from one incomprehensibility into another, from one obscurity into another still greater, and perhaps lead us into irreconcilable contradictions. If a dogmatical affirmative or negative answer is demanded, is it at all prudent to set aside the probable grounds of a solution which lie before us, and to take into consideration what advantage we shall gain if the answer is to favor the one side or the other? If it happens that in both cases the answer is mere nonsense, we have in this an irresistible summons to institute a critical investigation of the question, for the purpose of discovering whether it is based on a groundless presupposition and relates to an idea the falsity of which would be more easily exposed in its application and consequences than in the mere representation of its content. 
This is the great utility of the skeptical mode of treating the questions addressed by pure reason to itself. By this method, we easily rid ourselves of the confusions of dogmatism, and establish in its place a temperate criticism, which, as a genuine cathartic, will successfully remove the presumptuous notions of philosophy and their consequence, the vain pretension to universal science. If, then, I could understand the nature of a cosmological idea and perceive, before I entered on the discussion of the subject at all, that, whatever side of the question regarding the unconditioned of the regressive synthesis of phenomena it favored, it must either be too great or too small for every conception of the understanding, I would be able to comprehend how the idea which relates to an object of experience, an experience which must be adequate to and in accordance with a possible conception of the understanding, must be completely void and without significance, inasmuch as its object is inadequate, consider it as we may. And this is actually the case with all cosmological conceptions, which, for the reason above mentioned, involve reason so long as it remains attached to them, in an unavoidable antinomy. For suppose, first, that the world has no beginning. In this case, it is too large for our conception, for this conception, which consists in a successive regress, cannot overtake the whole eternity that has elapsed. Grant that it has a beginning, it is then too small for the conception of the understanding. For as a beginning presupposes a time preceding, it cannot be unconditioned, and the law of the empirical employment of the understanding imposes the necessity of looking for a higher condition of time, and the world is, therefore, evidently too small for this law. The same is the case with the double answer to the question regarding the extent, in space, of the world. For, if it is infinite and unlimited, it must be too large for every possible empirical conception. If it is finite and limited, we have a right to ask what determines these limits. Void space is not a self-subsistent correlate of things, and cannot be a final condition, and still less an empirical condition, forming a part of a possible experience. For how can we have any experience or perception of an absolute void? But the absolute totality of the empirical synthesis requires that the unconditioned be an empirical conception. Consequently, a finite world is too small for our conception. Secondly, if every phenomenon, matter, in space, consists of an infinite number of parts, the regress of the division is always too great for our conception. And if the division of space must cease with some member of the division, the simple, it is too small for the idea of the unconditioned. For the member at which we have discontinued our division still admits a regress to many more parts contained in the object. Thirdly, suppose that every event in the world happens in accordance with the laws of nature. The causality of a cause must itself be an event, and necessitates a regress to a still higher cause and consequently the unceasing prolongation of the series of conditions a parti priori. Operative nature is therefore too large for every conception we can form in the synthesis of cosmical events. If we admit the existence of spontaneously produced events, that is, of free agency, we are driven in our search for sufficient reasons 
on an unavoidable law of nature and are compelled to appeal to the empirical law of causality. And we find that any such totality of connection in our synthesis is too small for our necessary empirical conception. Fourthly, if we assume the existence of an absolutely necessary being, whether it be the world, or something in the world, or the cause of the world, we must place it in a time at an infinite distance from any given moment, for otherwise it must be dependent on some other and higher existence. Such an existence is, in this case, too large for our empirical conception, and unattainable by the continued regress of any synthesis. But, if we believe that everything in the world, be it condition or conditioned, is contingent, every given existence is too small for our conception, for in this case we are compelled to seek for some other existence upon which the former depends. We have said that, in all these cases, the cosmological idea is either too great or too small for the empirical regress in a synthesis, and consequently, for every possible conception of the understanding. Why did we not express ourselves in a manner exactly the reverse of this, and, instead of accusing the cosmological idea of overstepping, or of falling short of its true aim, possible experience, say that, in the first case, the empirical conception is always too small for the idea, and in the second, too great, and thus attach the blame of these contradictions to the empirical regress. The reason is this. Possible experience can alone give reality to our conceptions. Without it, a conception is merely an idea, without truth or relation to an object. Hence, a possible empirical conception must be the standard by which we are to judge whether an idea is anything more than an idea and fiction of thought, or whether it relates to an object in the world. If we say of a thing that in relation to some other thing it is too large or too small, the former is considered as existing for the sake of the latter, and requiring to be adapted to it. Among the trivial subjects of discussion in the old schools of dialectics was this question. If a ball cannot pass through a hole, shall we say that the ball is too large, or the hole too small? In this case, it is indifferent what expression we employ, for we do not know which exists for the sake of the other. On the other hand, we cannot say, the man is too long for his coat, but the coat is too short for the man. We are thus led to the well-founded suspicion that the cosmological ideas, and all the conflicting sophistical assertions connected with them, are based upon a false and fictitious conception of the mode in which the object of these ideas is presented to us, and this suspicion will probably direct us how to expose the illusion that has so long led us astray from the truth. End Section 5 Section 6. Transcendental Idealism as the Key to the Solution of Pure Cosmological Dialectic In the Transcendental Aesthetic, we proved that everything intuited in space and time, all objects of a possible experience, are nothing but phenomena, that is, mere representations, and that these, as presented to us, as extended bodies, or as a series of changes, have no self-subsistent existence apart from human thought. This doctrine I call Transcendental Idealism. Footnote. 
I have elsewhere termed this theory formal idealism to distinguish it from material idealism, which doubts or denies the existence of external things. To avoid ambiguity, it seems advisable in many cases to employ this term instead of that mentioned in the text. Back to text. The realist in the transcendental sense regards these modifications of our sensibility, these mere representations, as things subsisting in themselves. It would be unjust to accuse us of holding the long decried theory of empirical idealism, which, while admitting the reality of space, denies, or at least doubts, the existence of bodies extended in it, and thus leaves us without a sufficient criterion of reality and illusion. The supporters of this theory find no difficulty in admitting the reality of the phenomena of the internal sense in time. Nay, they go the length of maintaining that this internal experience is of itself a sufficient proof of the real existence of its object as a thing in itself. Transcendental idealism allows that the objects of external intuition, as intuited in space and all changes in time, as represented by the internal sense, are real. For, as space is the form of that intuition which we call external, and without objects in space, no empirical representation could be given us, we can and ought to regard extended bodies in it as real. The case is the same with representations in time. But time and space, with all phenomena therein, are not in themselves things. They are nothing but representations, and cannot exist out of and apart from the mind. Nay, the sensuous internal intuition of the mind as the object of consciousness, the determination of which is represented by the succession of different states in time, is not the real proper self, as it exists in itself, not the transcendental subject, but only a phenomenon which is presented to the sensibility of this, to us, unknown being. This internal phenomenon cannot be admitted to be a self-subsisting thing, for its condition is time, and time cannot be the condition of a thing in itself. But the empirical truth of phenomena in space and time is guaranteed beyond the possibility of doubt, and sufficiently distinguished from the illusion of dreams or fancy although both have a proper and thorough connection in an experience according to empirical laws. The objects of experience, then, are not things in themselves, but are given only in experience, and have no existence apart from and independently of experience. That there may be inhabitants in the moon, although no one has ever observed them, must certainly be admitted, but this assertion means only that we may, in the possible progress of experience, discover them at some future time, for that which stands in connection with a perception, according to the laws of the progress of experience, is real. They are therefore really existent, if they stand in empirical connection with my actual or real consciousness although they are not in themselves real, that is, apart from the progress of experience. There is nothing actually given. We can be conscious of nothing as real, except a perception and the empirical progression from it to other possible perceptions. For phenomena, as mere representations, are real only in perception, and perception is, in fact, nothing but the reality of an empirical representation, that is, a phenomenon. To call a phenomenon a real thing prior to perception 
means either that we must meet with this phenomenon in the progress of experience, or it means nothing at all. For I can say only of a thing in itself that it exists without relation to the senses and experience, but we are speaking here merely of phenomena in space and time, both of which are determinations of sensibility, and not of things in themselves. It follows that phenomena are not things in themselves, but are mere representations, which, if not given in us, in perception, are non-existent. The faculty of sensuous intuition is properly a receptivity, a capacity of being affected in a certain manner by representations, the relation of which to each other is a pure intuition of space and time, the pure forms of sensibility. These representations, in so far as they are connected and determinable in this relation, in space and time, according to the laws of the unity of experience, are called objects. The non-sensuous cause of these representations is completely unknown to us, and hence cannot be intuited as an object. For such an object could not be represented either in space or in time, and without these conditions intuition or representation is impossible. We may at the same time term the non-sensuous cause of phenomena the transcendental object but merely as a mental correlate to sensibility, considered as a receptivity. To this transcendental object we may attribute the whole connection and extent of our possible perceptions, and say that it is given and exists in itself prior to all experience. But the phenomena corresponding to it are not given as things in themselves, but in experience alone for they are mere representations, receiving from perceptions alone significance and relation to a real object, under the condition that this or that perception, indicating an object, is in complete connection with all others in accordance with the rules of the unity of experience. Thus we can say, the things that really existed in past time are given in the transcendental object of experience. But these are, to me, real objects, only in so far as I can represent to my own mind that a regressive series of possible perceptions, following the indications of history or the footsteps of cause and effect, in accordance with empirical laws, that, in one word, the course of the world conducts us to an elapsed series of time as the condition of the present time. This series in past time is represented as real, not in itself, but only in connection with a possible experience. Thus, when I say that certain events occurred in past time, I merely assert the possibility of prolonging the chain of experience from the present perception upwards to the conditions that determine it according to time. If I represent to myself all objects existing in all space and time, I do not thereby place these in space and time prior to all experience. On the contrary, such a representation is nothing more than the notion of a possible experience in its absolute completeness. In experience alone are those objects, which are nothing but representations, given. But, when I say they existed prior to my experience, this means only that I must begin with the perception present to me and follow the track indicated until I discover them in some part or region of experience. The cause of the empirical condition of this progression, and consequently, at what member therein I must stop, and at what point in the regress I am to find this member, is transcendental, and hence necessarily incognizable. But with this we have not to do. Our concern is only with the law of progression in experience, in which objects, that is, 
phenomena are given. It is a matter of indifference whether I say, I may in the progress of experience discover stars at a hundred times greater distance than the most distant of those now visible, or stars at this distance may be met in space, although no one has or ever will discover them. For if they are given as things in themselves without any relation to possible experience, they are for me non-existent. Consequently, are not objects, for they are not contained in the regressive series of experience. But if these phenomena must be employed in the construction or support of the cosmological idea of an absolute whole, and when we are discussing a question that oversteps the limits of possible experience, the proper distinction of the different theories of the reality of sensuous objects is of great importance in order to avoid the illusion which must necessarily arise from the misinterpretation of our empirical conceptions. End section 6 This recording is in the public domain. Section 29 the Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant Transcendental Doctrine of Elements Part Second Transcendental Logic Second Division Transcendental Dialectic Book Two of the Dialectical Procedure of Pure Reason Chapter Two The Antinomy of Pure Reason Sections Seven and Eight Section Seven Critical Solution of the Cosmological Problem The antinomy of pure reason is based upon the following dialectical argument. If that which is conditioned is given, the whole series of its conditions is also given. But sensuous objects are given as conditioned, consequently. This syllogism, the major of which seems so natural and evident, introduces as many cosmological ideas as there are different kinds of conditions in the synthesis of phenomena, insofar as these conditions constitute a series. These ideas require absolute totality in the series, and thus place reason in inextricable embarrassment. Before proceeding to expose the fallacy in this dialectical argument, it will be necessary to have a correct understanding of certain conceptions that appear in it. In the first place, the following proposition is evident and indubitably certain. If the conditioned is given, a regress in the series of all its conditions is thereby imperatively required. For the very conception of a conditioned is a conception of something related to a condition, and, if this condition is itself conditioned to another condition, and so on, through all the members of the series. This proposition is, therefore, analytical, and has nothing to fear from transcendental criticism. It is a logical postulate of reason to pursue, as far as possible, the connection of a conception with its conditions. If, in the second place, both the conditioned and the condition are things in themselves, and if the former is given, not only is the regress to the latter requisite, but the latter is really given with the former. Now, as this is true of all the members of the series, the entire series of conditions and with them the unconditioned, is, at the same time, given in the very fact of the conditioned, the existence of which is possible only in and through that series being given. In this case, the synthesis of the conditioned with its condition is a synthesis of the understanding merely, 
which represents things as they are, without regarding whether and how we can cognize them. But if I have to do with phenomena, which, in their character of mere representations, are not given, if I do not attain to a cognition of them, in other words, to themselves, for they are nothing more than empirical cognitions, I am not entitled to say, if the conditioned is given, all its conditions as phenomena are also given. I cannot, therefore, from the fact of a conditioned being given, infer the absolute totality of the series of its conditions. For phenomena are nothing but an empirical synthesis in apprehension or perception, and are therefore given only in it. Now, in speaking of phenomena, it does not follow that, if the conditioned is given, the synthesis which constitutes its empirical condition is also thereby given and presupposed. Such a synthesis can be established only by an actual regress in the series of conditions. But we are entitled to say, in this case, that a regress to the conditions of a conditioned, in other words, that a continuous empirical synthesis is enjoined, that, if the conditions are not given, they are at least required, and that we are certain to discover the conditions in this regress. We can now see that the major, in the above cosmological syllogism, takes the conditioned in the transcendental signification which it has in the pure category, while the minor speaks of it in the empirical signification which it has in the category as applied to phenomena. There is, therefore, a dialectical fallacy in the syllogism, a sophisma figurae dictionis. But this fallacy is not a consciously devised one, but a perfectly natural illusion of the common reason of man. For, when a thing is given as conditioned, we presuppose in the major its conditions and their series, unperceived, as it were, and unseen, because this is nothing more than the logical requirement of complete and satisfactory premises for a given conclusion. In this case, time is altogether left out in the connection of the conditioned with the condition, they are supposed to be given in themselves and contemporaneously. It is, moreover, just as natural to regard phenomena, in the minor, as things in themselves and as objects presented to the pure understanding, as in the major, in which complete abstraction was made of all conditions of intuition. But it is under these conditions alone that objects are given. Now, we overlooked a remarkable distinction between the conceptions. The synthesis of the conditioned with its condition, and the complete series of the latter and the major, are not limited by time, and do not contain the conception of succession. On the contrary, the empirical synthesis and the series of conditions in the phenomenal world, subsumed in the minor, are necessarily successive, and given in time alone. It follows that I cannot presuppose in the minor, as I did in the major, the absolute totality of the synthesis and of the series therein represented. For in the major, all the members of the series are given as things in themselves, without any limitations or conditions of time, while in the minor, they are possible only in and through a successive regress, which cannot exist except it be actually carried into execution in the world of phenomena. After this proof of the viciousness of the argument commonly employed in maintaining cosmological assertions, both parties may now be justly dismissed as advancing claims without grounds or title. But the process has not been ended by convincing them that one or both were in the wrong, and had maintained an assertion which was without valid grounds of proof. 
Nothing seems to be clearer than that, if one maintains, the world has a beginning, and another, the world has no beginning, one of the two must be right. But it is likewise clear that, if the evidence on both sides is equal, it is impossible to discover on what side the truth lies, and the controversy continues. Although the parties have been recommended to peace before the tribunal of reason, there remains, then, no other means of settling the question than to convince the parties, who refute each other with such conclusiveness and ability, that they are disputing about nothing, and that a transcendental illusion has been mocking them with visions of reality where there is none. The mode of adjusting a dispute which cannot be decided upon its own merits, we shall now proceed to lay before our readers. Zeno of Elia, a subtle dialectician, was severely reprimanded by Plato as a sophist, who, merely from the base motive of exhibiting his skill in discussion, maintained and subverted the same proposition by arguments as powerful and convincing on the one side as on the other. He maintained, for example, that God, who was probably nothing more in his view than the world, is neither finite nor infinite, neither in motion nor in rest, neither similar nor dissimilar to any other thing. It seemed to those philosophers who criticized his mode of discussion that his purpose was to deny completely both of two self-contradictory positions, which is absurd but I cannot believe that there is any justice in this accusation. The first of these propositions I shall presently consider in a more detailed manner. With regard to the others, if, by the word of God, he understood merely the universe, his meaning must have been that it cannot be permanently present in one place, that is, at rest, nor be capable of changing its place, that is, of moving, because all places are in the universe, and the universe itself is, therefore, in no place. Again, if the universe contains in itself everything that exists, it cannot be similar or dissimilar to any other thing, because there is, in fact, no other thing with which it can be compared. If two opposite judgments presuppose a contingent, impossible, or arbitrary condition, both, in spite of their opposition, which is, however, not properly or really a contradiction, fall away, because the condition, which ensured the validity of both, has itself disappeared. If we say, every body has either a good or a bad smell, we have omitted a third possible judgment. It has no smell at all. And thus, both conflicting statements may be false. If we say, it is either good-smelling or not good-smelling, vel suavolens, vel non suavolens, both judgments are contradictorily opposed, and the contradictory opposite of the former judgment, some bodies are not good-smelling, embraces also those bodies which have no smell at all. In the preceding pair of opposed judgments, per disparata, the contingent condition of the conception of body, smell, attached to both conflicting statements, instead of having been omitted in the latter, which is consequently not the contradictory opposite of the former. If, accordingly, we say, the world is either infinite in extension, or it is not infinite, non est infinitus, and if the former proposition is false, its contradictory opposite, the world is not infinite, must be true. And thus I should deny the existence of an infinite, without, however, affirming the existence of a finite world. But if we construct our proposition thus, the world is either infinite or finite, 
non-infinite, both statements may be false. For, in this case, we consider the world as per se determined in regard to quantity, and while in the one judgment we deny its infinite and consequently, perhaps, its independent existence, in the other we append to the world regarded as a thing in itself a certain determination, that of finitude, and the latter may be false as well as the former if the world is not given as a thing in itself, and thus neither as finite nor as infinite in quantity. This kind of opposition I may be allowed to term dialectical. That of contradictories may be called analytical opposition. Thus, then, of two dialectically opposed judgments, both may be false, from the fact that the one is not a mere contradictory of the other, but actually enounces more than is requisite for a full and complete contradiction. When we regard the two propositions, the world is infinite in quantity and the world is finite in quantity as contradictory opposites, we are assuming that the world, the complete series of phenomena, is a thing in itself. For it remains as a permanent quantity, whether I deny the infinite or the finite regress in the series of its phenomena. But if we dismiss this assumption, this transcendental illusion, and deny that it is a thing in itself, the contradictory opposition is metamorphosed into a merely dialectical one, and the world, as not existing in itself, independently of the regressive series of my representations, exists in like manner neither as a whole which is infinite nor as a whole which is finite in itself. The universe exists for me only in the empirical regress of the series of phenomena and not per se. If, then, it is always conditioned, it is never completely or as a whole, and it is, therefore, not an unconditioned whole and does not exist as such, either with an infinite or with a finite quantity. What we have here said of the first cosmological idea, that of the absolute totality of quantity and phenomena, applies also to the others. A series of conditions is discoverable only in the regressive synthesis itself, and not in the phenomenon considered as a thing in itself, given prior to all regress. Hence, I am compelled to say, the aggregate of parts in a given phenomenon is, in itself, neither finite nor infinite, and these parts are given only in the regressive synthesis of decomposition, a synthesis which is never given in absolute completeness, either as finite or as infinite. The same is the case with the series of subordinated causes, or of the conditioned up to the unconditioned and necessary existence, which can never be regarded as in itself, and in its totality, either as finite or as infinite, because, as a series of subordinate representations, it subsists only in the dynamical regress, and cannot be regarded as existing previously to this regress, or as a self-subsistent series of things. Thus, the antinomy of pure reason in its cosmological ideas disappears. For the above demonstration has established the fact that it is merely the product of a dialectical and illusory opposition, which arises from the application of the idea of absolute totality, admissible only as a condition of things in themselves, to phenomena, which exist only in our representations, and, when constituting a series, in successive regress. 
This antinomy of reason may, however, be really profitable to our speculative interests, not in the way of contributing any dogmatical addition, but as presenting to us another material support in our critical investigations. For it furnishes us with an indirect proof of the transcendental ideality of phenomena. If our minds were not completely satisfied with the direct proof set forth in the transcendental aesthetic, the proof would proceed in the following dilemma. If the world is a whole existing in itself, it must be either finite or infinite. But it is neither finite nor infinite, as has been shown on the one side by the thesis, on the other by the antithesis. Therefore the world, the content of all phenomena, is not a whole existing in itself. It follows that phenomena are nothing apart from our representations, and this is what we mean by transcendental ideality. This remark is of some importance. It enables us to see that the proofs of the fourfold antinomy are not mere sophistries, are not fallacious, but grounded on the nature of reason and valid, under the supposition that phenomena are things in themselves. The opposition of the judgments which follow makes it evident that a fallacy lay in the initial supposition, and thus helps us to discover the true constitution of objects of sense. This transcendental dialectic does not favor skepticism, although it presents us with a triumphant demonstration of the advantages of the skeptical method, the great utility of which is apparent in the antinomy, where the arguments of reason were allowed to confront each other in undiminished force. And although the result of these conflicts of reason is not what we expected, although we have obtained no positive dogmatical addition to metaphysical science, we have still reaped a great advantage in the correction of our judgments on these subjects of thought. End section 7《Regulative Principle of Pure Reason in Relation to the Cosmological Ideas》The cosmological principle of totality could not give us any certain knowledge in regard to the maximum in the series of conditions in the world of sense considered as a thing in itself. The actual regress in the series is the only means of approaching this maximum. This principle of pure reason, therefore, may still be considered as valid, not as an axiom enabling us to cogitate totality in the object as actual, but as a problem for the understanding, which requires it to institute and to continue, in conformity with the idea of totality in the mind, the regress in the series of the conditions of a given conditioned. For, in the world of sense, that is, in space and time, Every condition which we discover in our investigation of phenomena is itself conditioned, because sensuous objects are not things in themselves, in which case an absolutely unconditioned might be reached in the progress of cognition, but are merely empirical representations, the conditions of which must always be found in intuition. The principle of reason is therefore properly a mere rule, prescribing a regress in the series of conditions for a given phenomena, and prohibiting any pause or rest on an absolutely unconditioned. It is, therefore, not a principle of the possibility of experience or of the empirical cognition of sensuous objects, consequently, not a principle of the understanding for every experience is confined within certain proper limits determined by the given intuition. Still less is it a constitutive principle of reason authorizing us to extend our conception of the sensuous world beyond all possible experience. 
it is merely a principle for the enlargement and extension of experience as far as is possible for human faculties. It forbids us to consider any empirical limits as absolute. It is, hence, a principle of reason which, as a rule, dictates how we ought to proceed in our empirical regress, but is unable to anticipate or indicate prior to the empirical regress what is given in the object itself. I have termed it, for this reason, a regulative principle of reason, while the principle of the absolute totality of the series of conditions, as existing in itself and given in the object, is a constitutive cosmological principle. This distinction will at once demonstrate the falsehood of the constitutive principle, and prevent us from attributing, by a transcendental subreptio, objective reality to an idea, which is valid only as a rule. In order to understand the proper meaning of this rule of pure reason, we must notice, first, that it cannot tell us what the object is, but only how the empirical regress is to be proceeded with in order to obtain to the complete conception of the object. If it gave us any information in respect to the former statement, it would be a constitutive principle, a principle impossible from the nature of pure reason. It will not, therefore, enable us to establish any such conclusions as the series of conditions for a given conditioned is in itself finite, or it is infinite. For, in this case, we should be cogitating in the mere idea of absolute totality an object which is not and cannot be given in experience. Inasmuch as we should be attributing a reality objective and independent of the empirical synthesis to a series of phenomena. This idea of reason cannot then be regarded as valid except as a rule for the regressive synthesis in the series of conditions according to which we must proceed from the conditioned through all intermediate and subordinate conditions up to the unconditioned, although this goal is unattained and unattainable. For the absolutely unconditioned cannot be discovered in the sphere of experience. We now proceed to determine clearly our notion of a synthesis which can never be complete. There are two terms commonly employed for this purpose. These terms are regarded as expressions of different and distinguishable notions, although the ground of the distinction has never been clearly exposed. The term employed by the mathematicians is progressus in infinitum. The philosophers prefer the expression progressus in indefinitum. Without detaining the reader with an examination of the reasons for such a distinction, or with remarks on the right or wrong use of the terms, I shall endeavor clearly to determine these conceptions so far as is necessary for the purpose in this critique. We may, with propriety, say of a straight line that it may be produced to infinity. In this case, the distinction between a progressus in infinitum and a progressus in indefinitum is a mere piece of subtlety. For, although when we say, produce a straight line, it is more correct to say in indefinitum than in infinitum, because the former means produce it as far as you please, the second you must not cease to produce it. The expression in infinitum is, when we are speaking of the power to do it, perfectly correct, for we can always make it longer if we please on to infinity. And this remark holds good in all cases. When we speak of a progressus, that is, an advancement from the condition to the conditioned, this possible advancement always proceeds to infinity. We may proceed from a given pair in the descending line of generation from father to son, and cogitate, 
a never-ending line of descendants from it. For in such a case, reason does not demand absolute totality in the series, because it does not presuppose it as a condition, and as given, datum, but merely as conditioned, and capable of being given, dabile. Very different is the case with the problem, how far the regress which ascends from the given conditioned to the conditions must extend. Whether, I can say, it is a regress in infinitum or only in indefinitum, and whether, for example, setting out from the human beings at present alive in the world, I may ascend in the series of their ancestors in infinitum, or whether all that can be said is that, so far as I have proceeded, I have discovered no empirical ground for considering the series limited, so that I am justified, and indeed compelled to search for ancestors still further back, although I am not obliged by the idea of reason to presuppose them. My answer to this question is, if the series is given in empirical intuition as a whole, the regress in the series of its internal conditions proceeds in infinitum, but if only one member of the series is given, from which the regress is to proceed to absolute totality, the regress is possible only in indefinitum. For example, the division of a portion of matter given within certain limits of a body, that is, proceeds in infinitum, for as the condition of this whole is its part, and the condition of the part a part of the part, and so on, and as in this regress of decomposition an unconditioned indivisible member of the series of conditions is not to be found, there are no reasons or grounds in experience for stopping in the division, but, on the contrary, the more remote members of the division are actually and empirically given prior to this division. That is to say, the division proceeds to infinity. On the other hand, the series of ancestors of any given human being is not given in its absolute totality in any experience, and yet the regress proceeds from every genealogical member of this series to one still higher, and does not meet with any empirical limit presenting an absolutely unconditioned member of the series. But as the members of such a series are not contained in the empirical intuition of the whole, prior to the regress, this regress does not proceed to infinity but only in indefinitum, that is, we are called upon to discover other and higher members, which are themselves always conditioned. In neither case, the regressus in infinitum nor the regressus in indefinitum, is the series of conditions to be considered as actually infinite in the object itself. This might be true of things in themselves, but it cannot be asserted of phenomena which, as conditions of each other, are only given in the empirical regress itself. Hence the question no longer is, what is the quantity of this series of conditions in itself, is it finite or infinite? For it is nothing in itself, but how is the empirical regress to be commenced, and how far ought we to proceed with it? And here a signal distinction in the application of this rule becomes apparent. If the whole is given empirically, it is possible to proceed in the series of its internal conditions to infinity. But if the whole is not given, and can only be given by and through the empirical regress, I can only say it is possible to infinity to proceed to still higher conditions in the series. In the first case, 
I am justified in asserting that more members are empirically given in the object than I attain to in the regress of decomposition. In the second case, I am justified only in saying that I can always proceed further in the regress, because no member of the series is given as absolutely conditioned, and thus a higher member is possible, and an inquiry with regard to it is necessary. In the one case it is necessary to find other members of the series, in the other it is necessary to inquire for others, inasmuch as experience presents no absolute limitation of the regress. For either you do not possess a perception which absolutely limits your empirical regress, and in this case the regress cannot be regarded as complete, or you do possess such a limitive perception, in which case it is not a part of your series, for that which limits must be distinct from that which is limited by it, and it is incumbent upon you to continue your regress up to this condition, and so on. These remarks will be placed in their proper light by their application in the following section. End section 8 This recording is in the public domain. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant Section 30 The Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant Transcendental Doctrine of Elements Part 2nd Transcendental Logic Second Division Transcendental Dialectic Book 2 Of the Dialectical Procedure of Pure Reason Chapter 2 The Antinomy of Pure Reason Section 9 Of the Empirical Use of the Regulative Principle of Reason with Regard to the Cosmological Ideas 1 and 2. The Solution of the Transcendental Mathematical Ideas, and Introductory to the Solution of the Dynamical Ideas. Section 9. Of the Empirical Use of the Regulative Principle of Reason with Regard to the Cosmological Ideas. We have shown that no transcendental use can be made either of the conceptions of reason or of understanding. We have shown, likewise, that the demand of absolute totality in the series of conditions in the world of sense arises from a transcendental employment of reason, resting on the opinion that phenomena are to be regarded as things in themselves. It follows that we are not required to answer the question respecting the absolute quantity of a series whether it is in itself limited or unlimited. We are only called upon to determine how far we must proceed in the empirical regress from condition to condition in order to discover, in conformity with the rule of reason, a full and correct answer to the questions proposed by reason itself. The principle of reason is hence valid only as a rule for the extension of a possible experience. Its invalidity as a principle constitutive of phenomena in themselves having been sufficiently demonstrated. And thus, too, the antinomial conflict of reason with itself is completely put an end to, inasmuch as we have not only presented a critical solution of the fallacy lurking in the opposite statements of reason, but have shown the true meaning of the ideas which gave rise to these statements. The dialectical principle of reason has, therefore, been changed into a doctrinal principle. But in fact, 
if this principle, in the subjective signification which we have shown to be its only true sense, may be guaranteed as a principle of the unceasing extension of the employment of our understanding, its influence and value are just as great as if it were an axiom for the a priori determination of objects. For such an axiom could not exert a stronger influence on the extension and rectification of our knowledge otherwise than by procuring, for the principles of the understanding, the most widely expanded employment in the field of experience. 1. Solution of the cosmological idea of the totality of the composition of phenomena in the universe. Here, as well as in the case of the other cosmological problems, the ground of the regulative principle of reason is the proposition that, in our empirical regress, no experience of an absolute limit, and consequently no experience of a condition, which is itself absolutely unconditioned, is discoverable. And the truth of this proposition itself rests upon the consideration that such an experience must represent to us phenomena as limited by nothing, or the mere void, on which our continued regress by means of perception must abut, which is impossible. Now, this proposition, which declares that every condition attained in the empirical regress must itself be considered empirically conditioned, contains the rule in terminis, which requires me, to whatever extent I may have proceeded in the ascending series, always to look for some higher member in the series whether this member is to become known to me through experience or not. Nothing further is necessary, then, for the solution of the first cosmological problem than to decide whether, in the regress to the unconditioned quantity of the universe, as regards space and time, this never-limited ascent ought to be called a regressus in infinitum or in indefinitum. The general representation which we form in our minds of the series of all past states or conditions of the world, or of all the things which at present exist in it, is itself nothing more than a possible empirical regress which is cogitated, although in an undetermined manner, in the mind, and which gives rise to the conception of a series of conditions for a given object. Footnote. The cosmical series can neither be greater nor smaller than the possible empirical regress upon which its conception is based. And, as this regress cannot be a determinate infinite regress, still less a determinate finite, absolutely limited, it is evident that we cannot regard the world as either finite or infinite because the regress which gives us the representation of the world, is neither finite nor infinite. Back to text. Now, I have a conception of the universe, but not an intuition, that is, not an intuition of it as a whole. Thus, I cannot infer the magnitude of the regress from the quantity or magnitude of the world, and determine the former by means of the latter. On the contrary, I must first of all form a conception of the quantity or magnitude of the world from the magnitude of the empirical regress. But of this regress, I know nothing more than that I ought to proceed from every given member of the series of conditions to one still higher. But the quantity of the universe is not thereby determined, and we cannot affirm that this regress proceeds in infinitum. Such an affirmation would anticipate the members of the series which have not yet been reached, and represent the number of them as beyond the grasp of any empirical synthesis. It would consequently determine the cosmical quantity prior to the regress, although only in a negative manner, which is impossible. For the world is not given in its totality in any intuition. Consequently, its quantity cannot be given prior to the regress. 
it follows that we are unable to make any declaration respecting the cosmical quantity in itself, not even that the regress in it is a regress in infinitum. We must only endeavor to attain to a conception of the quantity of the universe in conformity with the rule which determines the empirical regress in it. But this rule merely requires us never to admit an absolute limit to our series, how far soever we may have proceeded in it, but always on the contrary to subordinate every phenomenon to some other as its condition, and consequently to proceed to this higher phenomenon. Such a regress is, therefore, the regressus in indefinitum, which, as not determining a quantity in the object, is clearly distinguishable from the regressus in infinitum. It follows from what we have said that we are not justified in declaring the world to be infinite in space, or as regards past time. For this conception of an infinite given quantity is empirical, but we cannot imply the conception of an infinite quantity to the world as an object of the senses. I cannot say, the regress from a given perception to everything limited either in space or time proceeds in infinitum, for this presupposes an infinite cosmical quantity. Neither can I say, it is finite, for an absolute limit is likewise impossible in experience. It follows that I am not entitled to make any assertion at all regarding the whole object of experience, the world of sense. I must limit my declarations to the rule according to which experience, or empirical knowledge, is to be attained. To the question, therefore, respecting the cosmical quantity, the first and negative answer is, the world has no beginning in time and no absolute limit in space. For, in the contrary case, it would be limited by a void time on the one hand and by a void space on the other. Now, since the world, as a phenomenon, cannot be thus limited in itself, for a phenomenon is not a thing in itself, it must be possible for us to have a perception of this limitation by a void time and a void space. But such a perception, such an experience, is impossible, because it has no content. Consequently, an absolute cosmical limit is empirically, and therefore absolutely, impossible. Footnote. The reader will remark that the proof presented above is very different from the dogmatical demonstration given in the antithesis of the first antinomy. In that demonstration, it was taken for granted that the world is a thing in itself, given in its totality, prior to all regress, and a determined position in space and time was denied to it, if it was not considered as occupying all time and all space. Hence, our conclusion differed from that given above, for we inferred in the antithesis the actual infinity of the world. Back to text. From this follows the affirmative answer. The regress in the series of phenomena, as a determination of the cosmical quantity, proceeds in indefinitum. This is equivalent to saying, the world of sense has no absolute quantity, but the empirical regress, through which alone the world of sense is presented to us on the side of its conditions, rests upon a rule, which requires it to proceed from every member of the series as conditioned to one still more remote, whether through personal experience or by means of history or the chain of cause and effect, and not to cease at any point in this extension of the possible empirical employment of the understanding. And this is the proper and only use which reason can make of its principles. The above rule 
does not prescribe an unceasing regress in one kind of phenomena. It does not, for example, forbid us in our ascent from an individual human being through the line of his ancestors to expect that we shall discover at some point of the regress a primeval pair, or to admit, in the series of heavenly bodies, a sun at the farthest possible distance from some center. All that it demands is a perpetual progress from phenomena to phenomena, even although an actual perception is not presented by them, as in the case of our perceptions being so weak as that we are unable to become conscious of them, since they nevertheless belong to possible experience. Every beginning is in time, and all limits to extension are in space. But space and time are in the world of sense. Consequently, phenomena in the world are conditionally limited, but the world itself is not limited, either conditionally or unconditionally. For this reason, and because neither the world nor the cosmical series of conditions to a given conditioned can be completely given, our conception of the cosmical quantity is given only in and through the regress, and not prior to it, in a collective intuition. But the regress itself is really nothing more than the determining of the cosmical quantity, and cannot therefore give us any determined conception of it, still less a conception of a quantity which is, in relation to a certain standard, infinite. The regress does not, therefore, proceed to infinity, an infinity given, but only to an indefinite extent. For the purpose of presenting to us a quantity realized only in and through the regress itself. Two. Solution of the cosmological idea of the totality of the division of a whole given in intuition. When I divide a whole which is given in intuition, I proceed from a conditioned to its conditions. The division of the parts of the whole, subdivisio or decompositio, is a regress in the series of these conditions. The absolute totality of this series would be actually attained and given to the mind if the regress could arrive at simple parts. But if all the parts in a continuous decomposition are themselves divisible, the division, that is to say, the regress, proceeds from the conditioned to its conditions in infinitum, because the conditions, the parts, are themselves contained in the conditioned, and, as the latter is given in a limited intuition, the former are all given along with it. The regress cannot, therefore, be called a regressus in indefinitum, as happened in the case of the preceding cosmological idea, the regress in which proceeded from the conditioned to the conditions not given contemporaneously and along with it, but discoverable only through the empirical regress. We are not, however, entitled to affirm of a whole of this kind, which is divisible in infinitum, that it consists of an infinite number of parts. For although all the parts are contained in the intuition of the whole, the whole division is not contained therein. The division is contained only in the progressing decomposition, in the regress itself, which is the condition of the possibility and actuality of the series. Now, as this regress is infinite, all the members, parts, to which it attains must be contained in the given whole as an aggregate. But the complete series of division is not contained therein. 
for this series being infinite in succession, and always incomplete, cannot represent an infinite number of members, and still less a composition of these members into a whole. To apply this remark to space, every limited part of space presented to intuition is a whole, the parts of which are always spaces, to whatever extent subdivided. Every limited space is hence divisible to infinity. Let us again apply the remark to an external phenomenon enclosed in limits, that is, a body. The divisibility of a body rests upon the divisibility of space, which is the condition of the possibility of the body as an extended whole. A body is consequently divisible to infinity, though it does not, for that reason, consist of an infinite number of parts. It certainly seems that, as a body must be cogitated as substance in space, the law of divisibility would not be applicable to it as substance. For we may, and ought to grant, in the case of space, that division or decomposition, to any extent, never can utterly annihilate composition, that is to say, the smallest part of space must still consist of spaces. Otherwise, space would entirely cease to exist, which is impossible. But the assertion on the other hand, that when all composition in matter is annihilated in thought, nothing remains, does not seem to harmonize with the conception of substance, which must be properly the subject of all composition, and must remain, even after the conjunction of its attributes in space, which constituted a body, is annihilated in thought. But this is not the case with substance in the phenomenal world, which is not a thing in itself cogitated by the pure category. Phenomenal substance is not an absolute subject. It is merely a permanent sensuous image, and nothing more than an intuition, in which the unconditioned is not to be found. But although this rule of progress to infinity is legitimate and applicable to the subdivision of a phenomenon as a mere occupation or filling of space, it is not applicable to a whole consisting of a number of distinct parts and constituting a quantum discretum, that is to say, an organized body. It cannot be admitted that every part in an organized whole is itself organized and that, in analyzing it to infinity, we must always meet with organized parts, although we may allow that the parts of the matter which we decompose in infinitum may be organized. For the infinity of the division of a phenomenon in space rests altogether on the fact that the divisibility of a phenomenon is given only in and through this infinity, that is, an undetermined number of parts is given, while the parts themselves are given and determined only in and through the subdivision. In a word, the infinity of the division necessarily presupposes that the whole is not already divided in se. Hence, our division determines a number of parts in the whole a number which extends just as far as the actual regress in the division, while, on the other hand, the very notion of a body organized to infinity represents the whole as already and in itself divided. We expect, therefore, to find in it a determinate, but at the same time infinite, number of parts, which is self-contradictory. For we should thus have a whole containing a series of members which could not be completed in any regress, which is infinite, and at the same time complete in an organized composite. 
infinite divisibility is applicable only to a quantum continuum and is based entirely on the infinite divisibility of space. But in a quantum discretum, the multitude of parts or units is always determined, and hence always equal to some number. To what extent a body may be organized, experience alone can inform us. And although, so far as our experience of this or that body has extended, we may not have discovered any inorganic part, such parts must exist in possible experience. But how far the transcendental division of a phenomenon must extend, we cannot know from experience. It is a question which experience cannot answer. It is answered only by the principle of reason which forbids us to consider the empirical regress in the analysis of extended body as ever absolutely complete. Concluding remark on the solution of the transcendental mathematical ideas and introductory to the solution of the dynamical ideas. We presented the antinomy of pure reason in a tabular form, and we endeavored to show the ground of this self-contradiction on the part of reason, and the only means of bringing it to a conclusion, namely, by declaring both contradictory statements to be false. We represented in these antinomies the conditions of phenomena as belonging to the conditioned according to relations of space and time, which is the usual supposition of the common understanding. In this respect, all dialectical representations of totality in the series of conditions to a given conditioned were perfectly homogeneous. The condition was always a member of the series along with the conditioned, and thus the homogeneity of the whole series was assured. In this case, the regress could never be cogitated as complete, or, if this was the case, a member really conditioned was falsely regarded as a primal member, consequently as unconditioned. In such an antinomy, therefore, we did not consider the object, that is, the conditioned, but the series of conditions belonging to the object, and the magnitude of that series. And thus arose the difficulty, a difficulty not to be settled by any decision regarding the claims of the two parties, but simply by cutting the knot, by declaring the series proposed by reason to be either too long or too short for the understanding which could, in neither case, make its conceptions adequate with the ideas. But we have overlooked, up to this point, an essential difference existing between the conceptions of the understanding which reason endeavors to raise to the rank of ideas. Two of these, indicating a mathematical and two a dynamical synthesis of phenomena, Hitherto, it was necessary to signalize this distinction, for, just as in our general representation of all transcendental ideas, we considered them under phenomenal conditions, so, in the two mathematical ideas, our discussion is concerned solely with an object in the world of phenomena. But as we are now about to proceed to the consideration of the dynamical conceptions of the understanding, and their adequateness with ideas, we must not lose sight of this distinction. We shall find that it opens up to us an entirely new view of the conflict in which reason is involved. For, while in the first two antinomies, both parties were dismissed, on the ground of having advanced statements based upon false hypothesis, in the present case, the hope appears of discovering a hypothesis which may be consistent with the demands of reason, and, the judge completing the statement of the grounds of claim, 
which both parties had left in an unsatisfactory state, the question may be settled on its own merits, not by dismissing the claimants, but by a comparison of the arguments on both sides. If we consider merely their extension, and whether they are adequate with ideas, the series of conditions may be regarded as all homogeneous. But the conception of the understanding which lies at the basis of these ideas contains either a synthesis of the homogeneous, presupposed in every quantity in its composition, as well as in its division, or of the heterogeneous, which is the case in the dynamical synthesis of cause and effect, as well as of the necessary and the contingent. Thus, it happens that in the mathematical series of phenomena, no other than a sensuous condition is admissible, a condition which is itself a member of the series, while the dynamical series of sensuous conditions admits a heterogeneous condition, which is not a member of the series, but, as purely intelligible, lies out of and beyond it. And thus reason is satisfied, and an unconditioned placed at the head of the series of phenomena, without introducing confusion into, or discontinuing it, contrary to the principles of the understanding. Now, from the fact that the dynamical ideas admit a condition of phenomena which does not form a part of the series of phenomena, arises a result which we should not have expected from an antinomy. In former cases, the result was that both contradictory dialectical statements were declared to be false. In the present case, we find the conditioned in the dynamical series connected with an empirically unconditioned but non-sensuous condition, and thus satisfaction is done to the understanding on the one hand, and to reason on the other. Footnote. For the understanding cannot admit among phenomena a condition which is itself empirically unconditioned, but if it is possible to cogitate an intelligible condition, one which is not a member of the series of phenomena, for a conditioned phenomenon, without breaking the series of empirical conditions, such a condition may be admissible as empirically unconditioned, and the empirical regress continue regular, unceasing, and intact. Back to text. While, moreover, the dialectical arguments for unconditioned totality in mere phenomena fall to the ground, both propositions of reason may be shown to be true in their proper signification. This could not happen in the case of the cosmological ideas, which demanded a mathematically unconditioned unity, for no condition could be placed at the head of the series of phenomena except one which was itself a phenomenon, and consequently a member of the series. End section 9 of the empirical use of the regulative principle of reason with regard to the cosmological ideas 1 and 2. This recording is in the public domain. Section 31. The Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant. Transcendental Doctrine of Elements. Part 2nd. Transcendental Logic. Second Division. Transcendental Dialectic. Book 2. Of the Dialectical Procedure of Pure Reason. Chapter 2. The Antinomy of Pure Reason. Section 9 of the empirical use of the regulative principle of reason with regard to the cosmological ideas. 
3. Solution of the cosmological idea of the totality of the deduction of cosmical events from their causes. There are only two modes of causality cogitable, the causality of nature or of freedom. The first is the conjunction of a particular state with another preceding it in the world of sense, the former following the latter by virtue of a law. Now, as the causality of phenomena is subject to conditions of time, and the preceding state, if it had always existed, could not have produced an effect which would make its first appearance at a particular time, the causality of a cause must itself be an effect, must itself have begun to be, and therefore, according to the principle of the understanding, itself requires a cause. We must understand, on the contrary, by the term freedom, in the cosmological sense, a faculty of the spontaneous origination of a state, the causality of which, therefore, is not subordinated to another cause determining it in time. Freedom is, in this sense, a pure transcendental idea, which, in the first place, contains no empirical element, the object of which, in the second place, cannot be given or determined in any experience, because it is a universal law of the very possibility of experience that everything which happens must have a cause, that, consequently, the causality of a cause, being itself something that has happened, must also have a cause. In this view of the case, the whole field of experience, how far soever it may extend, contains nothing that is not subject to the laws of nature. But, as we cannot by this means attain to an absolute totality of conditions in reference to the series of causes and effects, reason creates the idea of a spontaneity, which can begin to act of itself, and without any external cause determining it to action, according to the natural law of causality. It is especially remarkable that the practical conception of freedom is based upon the transcendental idea, and that the question of the possibility of the former is difficult only as it involves the consideration of the truth of the latter. Freedom, in the practical sense, is the independence of the will of coercion by sensuous impulses. A will is sensuous in so far as it is pathologically affected by sensuous impulses. It is termed animal, arbitrium brutum, when it is pathologically necessitated. The human will is certainly an arbitrium sensitivum, not brutum, but liberum, because sensuousness does not necessitate its action, a faculty existing in man of self-determination, independently of all sensuous coercion. It is plain that, if all causality in the world of sense were natural, and natural only, every event would be determined by another according to necessary laws, and that, consequently, phenomena, in so far as they determine the will, must necessitate every action as a natural effect from themselves, and thus all practical freedom would fall to the ground with the transcendental idea, for the latter presupposes that although a certain thing has not happened, it ought to have happened, and that, consequently, its phenomenal cause was not so powerful and determinative as to exclude the causality of our will, a causality capable of producing effects, independently of, and even in opposition to, the power of natural causes, and capable, consequently, of spontaneously originating a series of events. Here, too, we find it to be the case, as we generally found in the self-contradictions and perplexities of a reason which strives to pass the bounds of possible experience, that the problem is properly not physiological but transcendental. The question of the possibility of freedom does indeed concern psychology, but, 
as it rests upon dialectical arguments of pure reason, its solution must engage the attention of transcendental philosophy. Before attempting this solution, a task which transcendental philosophy cannot decline, it will be advisable to make a remark with regard to its procedure in the settlement of the question. If phenomena were things in themselves, and time and space forms of the existence of things, condition and conditioned would always be members of the same series, and thus would arise in the present case the antinomy common to all transcendental ideas, that their series is either too great or too small for the understanding. The dynamical ideas, which we are about to discuss in this and the following section, possess the peculiarity of relating to an object not considered as a quantity, but as an existence, and thus, in the discussion of the present question, we may make abstraction of the quantity of the series of conditions, and consider merely the dynamical relation of the condition to the conditioned. The question, then, suggests itself, whether freedom is possible, and, if it is, whether it can consist with the universality of the natural law of causality, and consequently, whether we enounce a proper disjunctive proposition when we say, every effect must have its origin either in nature or in freedom, or whether both cannot exist together in the same event in different relations. The principle of an unbroken connection between all events in the phenomenal world, in accordance with the unchangeable laws of nature, is a well-established principle of transcendental analytic, which admits of no exception. The question, therefore, is whether an effect determined according to the laws of nature can at the same time be produced by a free agent, or whether freedom and nature mutually exclude each other. And here, the common but fallacious hypothesis of the absolute reality of phenomena manifests its injurious influence in embarrassing the procedure of reason. For if phenomena are things in themselves, freedom is impossible. In this case, nature is the complete and all-sufficient cause of every event, and condition and conditioned cause and effect are contained in the same series, and necessitated by the same law. If, on the contrary, phenomena are held to be, as they are in fact, nothing more than mere representations, connected with each other in accordance with empirical laws, they must have a ground which is not phenomenal. But the causality of such an intelligible cause is not determined or determinable by phenomena, although its effects, as phenomena, must be determined by other phenomenal existences. This cause and its causality exist, therefore, out of and apart from the series of phenomena, while its effects do exist and are discoverable in the series of of empirical conditions. Such an effect may therefore be considered to be free in relation to its intelligible cause, and necessary in relation to the phenomena from which it is a necessary consequence, a distinction which, stated in this perfectly general and abstract manner, must appear in the highest degree subtle and obscure. The sequel will explain. It is sufficient at present to remark that, as the complete and unbroken connection of phenomena is an unalterable law of nature, freedom is impossible on the supposition that phenomena are absolutely real. Hence, those philosophers who adhere to the common opinion on this subject can never succeed in reconciling the ideas of nature and freedom. Possibility of freedom in harmony with the universal law of natural necessity. That element in a sensuous object which is not itself sensuous, 
I may be allowed to term intelligible. If, accordingly, an object which must be regarded as a sensuous phenomenon possesses a faculty which is not an object of sensuous intuition, but by means of which it is capable of being the cause of phenomena, the causality of an object or existence of this kind may be regarded from two different points of view. It may be considered to be intelligible as regards its action, the action of a thing which is a thing in itself and sensuous as regards its effects, the effects of a phenomenon belonging to the sensuous world. We should, accordingly, have to form both an empirical and an intellectual conception of the causality of such a faculty or power, both, however, having reference to the same effect. This twofold manner of cogitating a power residing in a sensuous object does not run counter to any of the conceptions which we ought to form of the world of phenomena, or of a possible experience. Phenomena, not being things in themselves, must have a transcendental object as a foundation, which determines them as mere representations and there seems to be no reason why we should not ascribe to this transcendental object, in addition to the property of self-phenomenization, a causality whose effects are to be met with in the world of phenomena, although it is not itself a phenomenon. But every effective cause must possess a character, that is to say, a law of its causality, without which it would cease to be a cause. In the above case, then, every sensuous object would possess an empirical character which guaranteed that its actions, as phenomena, stand in complete and harmonious connection, conformably to unvarying natural laws, with all other phenomena, and can be deduced from these as conditions, and that they do thus in connection with these, constitute a series in the order of nature. This sensuous object must, in the second place, possess an intelligible character, which guarantees it to be the cause of those actions as phenomena, although it is not itself a phenomenon nor subordinate to the conditions of the world of sense. The former may be termed the character of the thing as a phenomenon, the latter the character of the thing as a thing in itself. Now this active subject would, in its character of intelligible subject, be subordinate to no conditions of time, for time is only a condition of phenomena, and not of things in themselves. No action would begin or cease to be in this subject. It would consequently be free from the law of all determination of time, the law of change, namely, that everything which happens must have a cause in the phenomena of a preceding state. In one word, the causality of the subject, in so far as it is intelligible, would not form part of the series of empirical conditions which determine and necessitate an event in the world of sense. Again, this intelligible character of a thing cannot be immediately cognized, because we can perceive nothing but phenomena, but it must be capable of being cogitated in harmony with the empirical character, for we always find ourselves compelled to place, in thought, a transcendental object at the basis of phenomena, although we can never know what this object is in itself. In virtue of its empirical character, this subject would at the same time be subordinate to all the empirical laws of causality, and, as a phenomenon and member of the sensuous world, its effects would have to be accounted for by a reference to preceding phenomena. Eternal phenomena must be capable of influencing it, and its actions, in accordance with natural laws, must explain to us how its empirical character, that is, the law of its causality, is to be cognized in and by means of experience. In a word, 
all requisites for a complete and necessary determination of these actions must be presented to us by experience. In virtue of its intelligible character, on the other hand, although we possess only a general conception of this character, the subject must be regarded as free from all sensuous influences and from all phenomenal determination. Moreover, as nothing happens in this subject, for it is a noumenon, and there does not consequently exist in it any change demanding the dynamical determination of time, and for the same reason, no connection with phenomena as causes, this active existence must in its actions be free from and independent of natural necessity. For this necessity exists only in the world of phenomena. It would be quite correct to say that it originates or begins its effects in the world of sense from itself, although the action productive of these effects does not begin in itself. We should not be, in this case, affirming that these sensuous effects began to exist of themselves because they are always determined by prior empirical conditions, by virtue of the empirical character, which is the phenomenon of the intelligible character, and are possible only as constituting a continuation of the series of natural causes. And thus, nature and freedom each in the complete and absolute signification of these terms, can exist without contradiction or disagreement in the same action. Exposition of the cosmological idea of freedom in harmony with the universal law of natural necessity. I have thought it advisable to lay before the reader at first merely a sketch of the solution of this transcendental problem in order to enable him to form, with greater ease, a clear conception of the course which reason must adopt in the solution. I shall now proceed to exhibit the several momenta of this solution, and to consider them in their order. The natural law that everything which happens must have a cause that the causality of this cause, that is, the action of the cause, which cannot always have existed, but must be itself an event, for it precedes in time some effect which it has originated, must have itself a phenomenal cause by which it is determined, and consequently all events are empirically determined in an order of nature. This law, I say, which lies at the foundation of the possibility of experience, and of a connected system of phenomena or nature, is a law of the understanding, from which no departure, and to which no exception, can be admitted. For to accept even a single phenomenon from its operation is to exclude it from the sphere of possible experience, and thus to admit it to be a mere fiction of thought, or phantom of the brain. Thus we are obliged to acknowledge the existence of a chain of causes in which, however, absolute totality cannot be found. But we need not detain ourselves with this question, for it has already been sufficiently answered in our discussion of the antinomies into which reason falls when it attempts to reach the unconditioned in the series of phenomena. If we permit ourselves to be deceived by the illusion of transcendental idealism, we shall find that neither nature nor freedom exists. Now the question is, whether admitting the existence of natural necessity in the world of phenomena, it is possible to consider an effect as at the same time an effect of nature and an effect of freedom, or whether these two modes of causality are contradictory and incompatible. No phenomenal cause can absolutely and of itself begin a series. Every action, in so far as it is productive of an event, is itself an event or occurrence, and presupposes another state 
in which its cause existed. Thus everything that happens is but a continuation of a series, and an absolute beginning is impossible in the sensuous world. The actions of natural causes are, accordingly, themselves effects, and presuppose causes preceding them in time. A primal action which forms an absolute beginning is beyond the causal power of phenomena. Now, is it absolutely necessary that, granting that all effects are phenomena, the causality of the cause of these effects must also be a phenomenon and belong to the empirical world? Is it not rather possible that, although every effect in the phenomenal world must be connected with an empirical cause according to the universal law of nature, this empirical causality may be itself the effect of a non-empirical and intelligible causality, its connection with natural causes remaining, nevertheless, intact. Such a causality would be considered in reference to phenomena as the primal action of a cause, which is in so far therefore not phenomenal, but by reason of this faculty or power intelligible, although it must at the same time, as a link in the chain of nature, be regarded as belonging to the sensuous world. A belief in the reciprocal causality of phenomena is necessary if we are required to look for and to present the natural conditions of natural events, that is to say, their causes. This being admitted as unexceptionably valid, the requirements of the understanding, which recognizes nothing but nature in the region of phenomena, are satisfied, and our physical explanations of physical phenomena may proceed in their regular course, without hindrance and without opposition. But it is no stumbling block in the way, even assuming the idea to be of pure fiction, to admit that there are some natural causes in the possession of a faculty which is not empirical but intelligible, inasmuch as it is not determined to action by empirical conditions, but purely and solely upon grounds brought forward by the understanding, this action being still, when the cause is phenomenized, in perfect accordance with the laws of empirical causality. Thus, the acting subject as a causal phenomenon would continue to preserve a complete connection with nature and natural conditions, and the phenomenon only of the subject, with all its phenomenal causality, would contain certain conditions which, if we ascend from the empirical to the transcendental object, must necessarily be regarded as intelligible. For, if we attend, in our inquiries with regard to causes in the world of phenomena, to the directions of nature alone, we need not trouble ourselves about the relation in which the transcendental subject, which is completely unknown to us, stands to these phenomena and their connection in nature. The intelligible ground of phenomena in this subject does not concern empirical questions. It has to do only with pure thought, and, although the effects of this thought and action of the pure understanding are discoverable in phenomena, these phenomena must nevertheless be capable of a full and complete explanation, upon purely physical grounds, and in accordance with natural laws. And in this case, we attend solely to their empirical, and omit all consideration of their intelligible character, which is the transcendental cause of the former, as completely unknown, except in so far as it is exhibited by the latter as its empirical symbol. Now let us apply this to experience. Man is a phenomenon of the sensuous world, and at the same time, therefore, a natural cause the causality of which, 
must be regulated by empirical laws. As such, he must possess an empirical character like all other natural phenomena. We remark this empirical character in his actions, which reveal the presence of certain powers and faculties. If we consider inanimate or merely animal nature, we can discover no reason for ascribing to ourselves any other than a faculty which is determined in a purely sensuous manner. But man, to whom nature reveals herself only through sense, cognizes himself not only by his senses, but also through pure apperception, and this in actions and internal determinations, which he cannot regard as sensuous impressions. He is thus to himself, on the one hand, a phenomenon, but, on the other hand, in respect of certain faculties, a purely intelligible object, intelligible because its action cannot be ascribed to sensuous receptivity. These faculties are understanding and reason. The latter, especially, is in a peculiar manner distinct from all empirically conditioned faculties, for it employs ideas alone in the consideration of its objects, and by means of these determines the understanding which then proceeds to make an empirical use of its own conceptions, which, like the ideas of reason, are pure and non-empirical. That reason possesses the faculty of causality, or that, at least, we are compelled so to represent it, is evident from the imperatives which, in the sphere of the practical, we impose on many of our executive powers. The words, I ought, express a species of necessity and imply a connection with grounds which nature does not and cannot present to the mind of man. Understanding knows nothing in nature but that which is, or has been, or will be. It would be absurd to say that anything in nature ought to be other than it is in the relations of time in which it stands. Indeed, the ought, when we consider merely the course of nature, has neither application nor meaning. The question, what ought to happen in the sphere of nature, is just as absurd as the question, what ought to be the properties of a circle? All that we are entitled to ask is, what takes place in nature? or, in the latter case, what are the properties of a circle? But the idea of an ought or of duty indicates a possible action the ground of which is a pure conception, while the ground of a merely natural action is, on the contrary, always a phenomenon. This action must certainly be possible under physical conditions, if it is prescribed by the moral imperative ought. But these physical or natural conditions do not concern the determination of the will itself. They relate to its effect alone, and the consequences of the effect in the world of phenomena. Whatever number of motives nature may present to my will, whatever sensuous impulses, the moral ought, it is beyond their power to produce. They may produce a volition which, so far from being necessary, is always conditioned, a volition to which the ought enunciated by reason sets an aim and a standard, gives permission or prohibition. Be the object what it may, purely sensuous, as pleasure, or presented by pure reason, as good, Reason will not yield to grounds which have an empirical origin. Reason will not follow the order of things presented by experience, but, with perfect spontaneity, rearranges them according to ideas, with which it compels empirical conditions to agree. It declares, in the name of these ideas, 
certain actions to be necessary which nevertheless have not taken place, and which perhaps never will take place, and yet presupposes that it possesses the faculty of causality in relation to these actions. For, in the absence of this supposition, it could not expect its ideas to produce certain effects in the world of experience. Now, let us stop here, and admit it to be at least possible that reason does stand in a really causal relation to phenomena. In this case, it must, pure reason as it is, exhibit an empirical character. For every cause presupposes a rule according to which certain phenomena follow as effects from the cause. And every rule requires uniformity in these effects. And this is the proper ground of the conception of a cause as a faculty or power. Now this conception of a cause may be termed the empirical character of reason. And this character is a permanent one, while the effects produced appear in conformity with the various conditions which accompany and partly limit them in various forms. Thus the volition of every man has an empirical character, which is nothing more than the causality of his reason in so far as its effects in the phenomenal world manifest the presence of a rule according to which we are enabled to examine, in their several kinds and degrees, the actions of this causality, and the rational grounds for these actions, and, in this way, to decide upon the subjective principles of the volition. Now, we learn what this empirical character is only from phenomenal effects, and from the rule of these which is presented by experience, and for this reason, all the actions of man in the world of phenomena are determined by his empirical character and the cooperative causes of nature. If, then, we could investigate all the phenomena of human volition to their lowest foundation in the mind, there would be no action which we could not anticipate with certainty and recognize to be absolutely necessary from its preceding conditions. So far as relates to this empirical character, therefore, there can be no freedom, and it is only in the light of this character that we can consider the human will when we confine ourselves to simple observation and, as is the case in anthropology, institute a physiological investigation of the motive causes of human actions. But when we consider the same actions in relation to reason, not for the purpose of explaining their origin, that is, in relation to speculative reason, but to practical reason, as the producing cause of these actions, we shall discover a rule and an order very different from those of nature and experience. For the declaration of this mental faculty may be that what has and could not but take place in the course of nature, ought not to have taken place. Sometimes, too, we discover, or believe that we discover, that the ideas of reason did actually stand in a causal relation to certain actions of man, and that these actions have taken place because they were determined not by empirical causes, but by the act of the will upon grounds of reason. Now, granting that reason stands in a causal relation to phenomena, can an action of reason be called free when we know that, sensuously, in its empirical character, it is completely determined and absolutely necessary? But this empirical character is itself determined by the intelligible character, the latter we cannot cognize, we can only indicate it by means of phenomena, which enable us to have an immediate cognition only of the empirical character. Footnote. 
the real morality of actions, their merit or demerit, and even that of our own conduct, is completely unknown to us. Our estimates can relate only to their empirical character. How much is the result of the action of free will, how much is to be ascribed to nature, and to blameless error, or to a happy constitution of temperament, Mary to Fortune, no one can discover, nor, for this reason, determine with perfect justice. Back to text. An action, then, in so far as it is to be ascribed to an intelligible cause, does not result from it in accordance with empirical laws. That is to say, not the conditions of pure reason, but only their effects in the internal sense, precede the act. Pure reason, as a purely intelligible faculty, is not subject to the conditions of time. The causality of reason in its intelligible character does not begin to be. It does not make its appearance at a certain time for the purpose of producing an effect. If this were not the case, the causality of reason would be subservient to the natural law of phenomena, which determines them according to time, and as a series of causes and effects in time. It would consequently cease to be freedom and become a part of nature. We are therefore justified in saying, if reason stands in a causal relation to phenomena, it is a faculty which originates the sensuous condition of an empirical series of effects. For the condition, which resides in the reason, is non-sensuous, and therefore cannot be originated or begin to be. And thus we find, what we could not discover in any empirical series, a condition of successive series of events in itself empirically unconditioned. For in the present case, the condition stands out of and beyond the series of phenomena. It is intelligible, and it consequently cannot be subjected to any sensuous condition, or to any time determination by a preceding cause. But, in another respect, the same cause belongs also to the series of phenomena. Man is himself a phenomenon. His will has an empirical character, which is the empirical cause of all his actions. There is no condition, determining man and his volition in conformity with his character, which does not itself form part of the series of effects in nature, and is subject to their law, the law according to which an empirically undetermined cause of an event in time cannot exist. For this reason, no given action can have an absolute and spontaneous origination, all actions being phenomena and belonging to the world of experience. But it cannot be said of reason that the state in which it determines the will is always preceded by some other state determining it. For reason is not a phenomenon, and therefore not subject to sensuous conditions, and consequently, even in relation to its causality, the sequence or conditions of time do not influence reason, nor can the dynamical law of nature which determines the sequence of time according to certain rules be applied to it. Reason is consequently the permanent condition of all actions of the human will. Each of these is determined in the empirical character of the man, even before it has taken place. The intelligible character, of which the former is but the sensuous schema, knows no before or after, and every action, irrespective of the time relation in which it stands with other phenomena, is the immediate effect of the intelligible character of pure reason, which, consequently, enjoys freedom of action, and is not dynamically determined either by internal or external preceding conditions. 
this freedom must not be described in a purely negative manner as independence of empirical conditions. For in this case, the faculty of reason would cease to be a cause of phenomena. But it must be regarded positively as a faculty which can spontaneously originate a series of events. At the same time, it must not be supposed that any beginning can take place in reason. On the contrary, reason, as the unconditioned condition of all action of the will, admits of no time conditions, although its effect does really begin in a series of phenomena, a beginning which is not, however, absolutely primal. I shall illustrate this regulative principle of reason by an example from its employment in the world of experience. Proved it cannot be by any amount of experience, or by any number of facts, for such arguments cannot establish the truth of transcendental propositions. Let us take a voluntary action, for example, a falsehood, by means of which a man has introduced a certain degree of confusion into the social life of humanity, which is judged, according to the motives from which it originated, and the blame of which, and of the evil consequences arising from it, is imputed to the offender. We at first proceed to examine the empirical character of the offense, and for this purpose we endeavor to penetrate to the sources of that character, such as a defective education, bad company, a shameless and wicked disposition, frivolity, and want of reflection, not forgetting also the occasioning causes which prevailed at the moment of the transgression. In this the procedure is exactly the same as that pursued in the investigation of the series of causes which determine a given physical effect. Now, although we believe the action to have been determined by all these circumstances, we do not the less blame the offender. We do not blame him for his unhappy disposition, nor for the circumstances which influenced him, nay, not even for his former course of life, for we presuppose that all these considerations may be set aside that the series of preceding conditions may be regarded as having never existed, and that the action may be considered as completely unconditioned in relation to any state preceding, just as if the agent commenced with it an entirely new series of effects. Our blame of the offender is grounded upon a law of reason which requires us to regard this faculty as a cause which could have, and ought to have, otherwise determined the behavior of the culprit, independently of all empirical conditions. This causality of reason we do not regard as a co-operating agency, but as complete in itself. It matters not whether the sensuous impulses favored or opposed the action of this causality, the offense is estimated according to its intelligible character. The offender is decidedly worthy of blame the moment he utters a falsehood. It follows that we regard reason, in spite of the empirical conditions of the act, as completely free, and therefore, as in the present case, culpable. The above judgment is complete evidence that we are accustomed to think that reason is not affected by sensuous conditions, that in it no change takes place, although its phenomena, in other words, the mode in which it appears in its effects, are subject to change, that in it no preceding state determines the following, and consequently, that it does not form a member of the series of sensuous conditions which necessitate phenomena according to natural laws. Reason is present, and the same, in all human actions and at all times. 
but it does not itself exist in time, and therefore does not enter upon any state in which it did not formerly exist. It is, relatively to new states or conditions, determining, but not determinable. Hence, we cannot ask, why did not reason determine itself in a different manner? The question ought to be thus stated. Why did not reason employ its power of causality to determine certain phenomena in a different manner? But this is a question which admits of no answer. For a different intelligible character would have exhibited a different empirical character. And when we say that, in spite of the course which his whole former life had taken, the offender could have refrained from altering the falsehood, this means merely that the act was subject to the power and authority, permissive or prohibitive, of reason. Now, reason is not subject in its causality to any conditions of phenomena or of time, and a difference in time may produce a difference in the relation of phenomena to each other, for these are not things, and therefore not causes in themselves but it cannot produce any difference in the relation in which the action stands to the faculty of reason. Thus, then, in our investigation into free actions and the causal power which produced them, we arrive at an intelligible cause, beyond which, however, we cannot go. Although we can recognize that it is free, that is, independent of all sensuous conditions, and that, in this way, it may be the sensuously unconditioned condition of phenomena. But for what reason the intelligible character generates such and such phenomena, and exhibits such and such an empirical character under certain circumstances, it is beyond the power of our reason to decide. The question is as much above the power and the sphere of reason as the following would be. Why does the transcendental object of our external sensuous intuition allow of no other form than that of intuition in space? But the problem, which we were called upon to solve, does not require us to entertain any such questions. The problem was merely this whether freedom and natural necessity can exist without opposition in the same action. To this question we have given a sufficient answer, for we have shown that, as the former stands in a relation to a different kind of condition from those of the latter, the law of the one does not affect the law of the other, and that, consequently, both can exist together in independence of and without interference with each other. The reader must be careful to remark that my intention in the above remarks has not been to prove the actual existence of freedom as a faculty in which resides the cause of certain sensuous phenomena. For, not to mention that such an argument would not have a transcendental character, nor have been limited to the discussion of pure conceptions, all attempts at inferring from experience what cannot be cogitated in accordance with its laws must ever be unsuccessful. Nay, more, I have not even aimed at demonstrating the possibility of freedom, for this, too, would have been a vain endeavor, inasmuch as it is beyond the power of the mind to cognize the possibility of a reality or of a causal power by the aid of mere a priori conceptions. Freedom has been considered in the foregoing remarks only as a transcendental idea, by means of which reason aims at originating a series of conditions in the world of phenomena with the help of that which is sensuously unconditioned. Involving itself, however, in an antinomy with the laws which itself prescribes for the conduct of the understanding. 
that this antinomy is based upon a mere illusion, and that nature and freedom are at least not opposed, this was the only thing in our power to prove, and the question which it was our task to solve. End three. Solution of the cosmological ideas of the totality of the deduction of cosmical events from their causes. This recording is in the public domain. Section 32. The Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant. Transcendental Doctrine of Elements. Part 2nd. Transcendental Logic. Second Division. Transcendental Dialectic. Book 2. Of the Dialectical Procedure of Pure Reason. Chapter 2. The Antinomy of Pure Reason. Section 9. Of the Empirical Use of the Regulative Principle of Reason with Regard to the Cosmological Ideas. 4. Solution of the cosmological idea of the totality of the dependence of phenomenal existences. And concluding remarks on the antinomy of pure reason. In the preceding remarks, we considered the changes in the world of sense as constituting a dynamical series, in which each member is subordinated to another as its cause. Our present purpose is to avail ourselves of this series of states or conditions as a guide to an existence which may be the highest condition of all changeable phenomena, that is, to a necessary being. Our endeavor to reach, not the unconditioned causality, but the unconditioned existence of substance. The series before us is therefore a series of conceptions and not of intuitions, in which the one intuition is the condition of the other. But it is evident that, as all phenomena are subject to change and conditioned in their existence, the series of dependent existences cannot embrace an unconditioned member, the existence of which would be absolutely necessary. It follows that, if phenomena were things in themselves, and, as an immediate consequence from this supposition, condition and conditioned belonged to the same series of phenomena, the existence of a necessary being, as the condition of the existence of sensuous phenomena, would be perfectly impossible. An important distinction, however, exists between the dynamical and the mathematical regress. The latter is engaged solely with the combination of parts into a whole, or with the division of a whole into its parts, and therefore are the conditions of its series parts of the series, and to be consequently regarded as homogeneous, and for this reason as consisting, without exception, of phenomena. In the former regress, on the contrary, the aim of which is not to establish the possibility of an unconditioned whole consisting of given parts, or of an unconditioned part of a given whole, but to demonstrate the possibility of the deduction of a certain state from its cause, or of the contingent existence of substance from that which exists necessarily, it is not requisite that the condition should form part of an empirical series along with the conditioned. In the case of the apparent antinomy with which we are at present dealing, there exists a way of escape from the difficulty, for it is not impossible that both of the contradictory statements may be true in different relations. All sensuous phenomena may be contingent, and consequently possess only an empirically conditioned existence, and yet there may also exist a non-empirical condition of the whole series, or, in other words, a necessary being. 
for this necessary being as an intelligible condition would not form a member not even the highest member of the series the whole world of sense would be left in its empirically determined existence uninterfered with and uninfluenced this would also form a ground of distinction between the modes of solution employed for the third and fourth antinomies for while in the consideration of freedom in the former antinomy the thing itself the cause substantia phenomenon was regarded as belonging to the series of conditions and only its causality to the intelligible world we are obliged in the present case to cogitate this necessary being as purely intelligible and as existing entirely apart from the world of sense as an ens extra mundanum for otherwise it would be subject to the phenomenal law of contingency and dependence in relation to the present problem therefore the regulative principle of reason is that everything in the sensuous world possesses an empirically conditioned existence that no property of the sensuous world possesses unconditioned necessity that we are bound to expect and so far as is possible to seek for the empirical condition of every member in the series of conditions and that there is no sufficient reason to justify us in deducing any existence from a condition which lies out of and beyond the empirical series or in regarding any existence as independent and self-subsistent although this should not prevent us from recognizing the possibility of the whole series being based upon a being which is intelligible and for this reason free from all empirical conditions but it has been far from my intention in these remarks to prove the existence of this unconditioned and necessary being or even to evidence the possibility of a purely intelligible condition of the existence of all sensuous phenomena as bounds were set to reason to prevent it from leaving the guiding thread of empirical conditions and losing itself in transcendent theories which are incapable of concrete presentation so it was my purpose on the other hand to set bounds to the law of the purely empirical understanding and to protest against any attempts on its part at deciding on the possibility of things or declaring the existence of the intelligible to be impossible merely on the ground that it is not available for the explanation and exposition of phenomena it has been shown at the same time that the contingency of all the phenomena of nature and their empirical conditions is quite consistent with the arbitrary hypothesis of a necessary although purely intelligible condition that no real contradiction exists between them and that consequently both may be true the existence of such an absolutely necessary being may be impossible but this can never be demonstrated from the universal contingency and dependence of sensuous phenomena nor from the principle which forbids us to discontinue the series at some member of it or to seek for its cause in some sphere of existence beyond the world of nature reason goes its way in the empirical world and follows too its peculiar path in the sphere of the transcendental the sensuous world contains nothing but phenomena which are mere representations and always sensuously conditioned things in themselves are not and cannot be objects to us it is not to be wondered at therefore that we are not justified in leaping from some member of an empirical series beyond the world of sense as if empirical representations were things in themselves existing apart from their transcendental ground in the human mind and the cause of whose existence may be sought out of the empirical series this would certainly be the case with contingent things but it cannot be with mere representations of things the contingency of which is itself merely a phenomenon and can relate to no other regress than that which determines phenomena that is the empirical 
but to cogitate an intelligible ground of phenomena as free, moreover, from the contingency of the latter, conflicts neither with the unlimited nature of the empirical regress, nor with the complete contingency of phenomena. And the demonstration of this was the only thing necessary for the solution of this apparent antinomy. For, if the condition of every conditioned, as regards its existence, is sensuous, and for this reason a part of the same series, it must be itself conditioned, as was shown in the antithesis of the fourth antinomy. The embarrassments into which a reason which postulates the unconditioned necessarily falls, must therefore continue to exist, or the unconditioned must be placed in the sphere of the intelligible. In this way, its necessity does not require, nor does it even permit, the presence of an empirical condition, and it is, consequently, unconditionally necessary. The empirical employment of reason is not affected by the assumption of a purely intelligible being. It continues its operations on the principle of the contingency of all phenomena, proceeding from empirical conditions to still higher and higher conditions, themselves empirical. Just as little does this regulative principle exclude the assumption of an intelligible cause, when the question regards merely the pure employment of reason in relation to ends or aims. For, in this case, an intelligible cause signifies merely the transcendental and, to us unknown, ground of the possibility of sensuous phenomena, and its existence, necessary and independent of all sensuous conditions, is not inconsistent with the contingency of phenomena, or with the unlimited possibility of regress which exists in the series of empirical conditions. Concluding Remarks on the Antinomy of Pure Reason So long as the object of our rational conceptions is the totality of conditions in the world of phenomena, and the satisfaction, from this source, of the requirements of reason, so long are our ideas transcendental and cosmological. But when we set the unconditioned, which is the aim of all our inquiries, in a sphere which lies out of the world of sense and possible experience, our ideas become transcendent. They are then not merely serviceable towards the completion of the exercise of reason, which remains an idea, never executed, but always to be pursued. They detach themselves completely from experience, and construct for themselves objects, the material of which has not been presented by experience and the objective reality of which is not based upon the completion of the empirical series, but upon pure a priori conceptions. The intelligible object of these transcendent ideas may be conceded as a transcendental object, but we cannot cogitate it as a thing determinable by certain distinct predicates relating to its internal nature for it has no connection with empirical conceptions. Nor are we justified in affirming the existence of any such object. It is, consequently, a mere product of the mind alone. Of all the cosmological ideas, however, it is that occasioning the fourth antinomy which compels us to venture upon this step. For the existence of phenomena, always conditioned and never self-subsistent, requires us to look for an object different from phenomena, an intelligible object, with which all contingency must cease. But, as we have allowed ourselves to assume the existence of a self-subsistent reality out of the field of experience, and are therefore obliged to regard phenomena as merely a contingent mode of representing intelligible objects employed by beings which are themselves intelligences. No other course remains for us than to follow analogy and employ the same mode in forming some conception of intelligible things, of which we have the least knowledge, 
which nature taught us to use in the formation of empirical conceptions. Experience made us acquainted with the contingent. But we are at present engaged in the discussion of things which are not objects of experience, and must, therefore, deduce our knowledge of them from that which is necessary absolutely and in itself, that is, from pure conceptions. Hence, the first step which we take out of the world of sense obliges us to begin our system of new cognition with the investigation of a necessary being, and to deduce from our conceptions of it all our conceptions of intelligible things. This we propose to attempt in the following chapter. End Chapter 2 of the deduction of the pure conceptions of the understanding. This recording is in the public domain. In 33 of the Critique of Pure Reason. The Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant. Transcendental Doctrine of Elements. Part 2nd. Transcendental Logic Second Division Transcendental Dialectic Book Two Of the Dialectical Procedure of Pure Reason Chapter Three The Ideal of Pure Reason Sections One and Two Section One Of the Ideal in General We have seen that pure conceptions do not present objects to the mind except under sensuous conditions, because the conditions of objective reality do not exist in these conceptions, which contain, in fact, nothing but the mere form of thought. They may, however, when applied to phenomena, be presented in concreto, for it is phenomena that present to them the materials for the formation of empirical conceptions, which are nothing more than concrete forms of the conceptions of the understanding. But ideas are still further removed from objective reality than categories, for no phenomenon can ever present them to the human mind in concreto. They contain a certain perfection, attainable by no possible empirical cognition, and they give to reason a systematic unity to which the unity of experience attempts to approximate, but can never completely attain. But still further removed than the idea from objective reality is the ideal, by which term I understand the idea, not in concreto but in individuo, as an individual thing, determinable or determined by the idea alone. The idea of humanity in its complete perfection supposes not only the advancement of all the powers and faculties which constitute our conception of human nature to a complete attainment of their final aims but also everything which is requisite for the complete determination of the idea. For of all contradictory predicates, only one can conform with the idea of the perfect man. What I have termed an ideal was in Plato's philosophy an idea of the divine mind, an individual object present to its pure intuition, the most perfect of every kind of possible beings, and the archetype of all phenomenal existences. Without rising to these speculative heights, we are bound to confess that human reason contains not only ideas, but ideals, which possess, not like those of Plato, creative but certainly practical power, as regulative principles, and form the basis of the perfectibility of certain actions. Moral conceptions are not perfectly pure conceptions of reason, because an empirical element of pleasure or pain lies at the foundation of them. In relation, however, to the principle, whereby reason sets bounds to a freedom which is in itself without law, and consequently, when we attend merely to their form, they may be considered as pure conceptions of reason. Virtue and wisdom in their perfect purity are ideas. But the wise man of the Stoics is an ideal, that is to say, a human being existing only in thought and in complete conformity with the idea of wisdom. As the idea provides a rule, 
so the ideal serves as an archetype for the perfect and complete determination of the copy. Thus the conduct of this wise and divine man serves us as a standard of action, with which we may compare and judge ourselves, which may help us to reform ourselves, although the perfection it demands can never be attained by us. Although we cannot concede objective reality to these ideals, they are not to be considered as chimeras. On the contrary, they provide reason with a standard, which enables it to estimate, by comparison, the degree of incompleteness in the objects presented to it. But to aim at realizing the ideal in an example in the world of experience, to describe, for instance, the character of the perfectly wise man in a romance, is impracticable. Nay, more, there is something absurd in the attempt, and the result must be little edifying, as the natural limitations, which are continually breaking in upon the perfection and completeness of the idea, destroy the illusion in the story, and throw an air of suspicion even on what is good in the idea, which hence appears fictitious and unreal. Such is the constitution of the ideal of reason, which is always based upon determinate conceptions, and serves as a rule and a model for limitation or of criticism. Very different is the nature of the ideals of the imagination. Of these it is impossible to present an intelligible conception. They are a kind of monogram, drawn according to no determinate rule, and forming rather a vague picture, the production of many diverse experiences, than a determinate image. Such are the ideals which painters and physiognomists profess to have in their minds, and which can serve neither as a model for production nor as a standard for appreciation. They may be termed, though improperly, sensuous ideals, as they are declared to be models of certain possible empirical intuitions. They cannot, however, furnish rules or standards for explanation or examination. In its ideals, reason aims at complete and perfect determination, according to a priori rules, and hence it cogitates an object which must be completely determinable in conformity with principles, although all empirical conditions are absent, and the conception of the object is on this account transcendent. Section 2 of the Transcendental Ideal Prototypon Transcendentale Every conception is, in relation to that which is not contained in it, undetermined and subject to the principle of determinability. This principle is that, of every two contradictorily opposed predicates, only one can belong to a conception. It is a purely logical principle, itself based upon the principle of contradiction, inasmuch as it makes complete abstraction of the content and attends merely to the logical form of the cognition. But again, everything, as regards its possibility, is also subject to the principle of complete determination, according to which one of all the possible contradictory predicates of things must belong to it. This principle is not based merely upon that of contradiction, for, in addition to the relation between two contradictory predicates, it regards everything as standing in a relation to the sum of possibilities, as the sum total of all predicates of things, and, while presupposing this sum as an a priori condition, presents to the mind everything as receiving the possibility of its individual existence from the relation it bears to, and the share it possesses in, the aforesaid sum of possibilities. Footnote 64. Thus this principle declares everything to possess a relation to a common correlate, the sum total of possibility, which, if discovered to exist in the idea of one individual thing, would establish the affinity of all possible things, from the identity of the ground of their complete determination. The determinability of every conception is subordinate to the universality, algemenheit universalitis, of the principle of excluded middle, the determination of a thing to the totality, allheit universitis, of all possible predicates. End footnote. The principle of complete determination relates to the content and not to the logical form. It is the principle of the synthesis of all the predicates which are required to constitute the complete conception of a thing, and not a mere principle analytical representation, 
which announces that one of two contradictory predicates must belong to a conception. It contains, moreover, a transcendental presupposition, that, namely, of the material for all possibility, which must contain a priori the data for this or that particular possibility. The proposition everything which exists is completely determined, means not only that one of every pair of given contradictory attributes, but that one of all possible attributes, is always predicable of the thing. In it the predicates are not merely compared logically with each other, but the thing itself is transcendentally compared with the sum total of all possible predicates. The proposition is equivalent to saying, to attain to a complete knowledge of a thing, it is necessary to possess a knowledge of everything that is possible, and to determine it thereby in a positive or negative manner. The conception of complete determination is consequently a conception which cannot be presented in its totality in concreto, and is therefore based upon an idea, which has its seat in the reason. The faculty which prescribes to the understanding the laws of its harmonious and perfect exercise now, although this idea of the sum total of all possibility, in so far as it forms the condition of the complete determination of everything, is itself undetermined in relation to the predicates which may constitute this sum total, and we cogitate in it merely the sum total of all possible predicates, we nevertheless find, upon closer examination, that this idea, as a primitive conception of the mind, excludes a large number of predicates those deduced, and those irreconcilable with others, and that it is evolved as a conception completely determined a priori. Thus it becomes the conception of an individual object, which is completely determined by and through the mere idea, and must consequently be termed an ideal of pure reason. When we consider all possible predicates, not merely logically, but transcendentally, that is to say, with reference to the content which may be cogitated as existing in them a priori, we shall find that some indicate a being, others merely a non-being. The logical negation expressed in the word not does not properly belong to a conception, but only to the relation of one conception to another in a judgment, and is consequently quite insufficient to present to the mind the content of a conception. The expression not mortal does not indicate that a non-being is cogitated in the object. It does not concern the content at all. A transcendental negation, on the contrary, indicates non-being in itself, and is opposed to transcendental affirmation, the conception of which of itself expresses a being. Hence, this affirmation indicates a reality, because in and through it objects are considered to be something, to be things while the opposite negation, on the other hand, indicates a mere want, or privation, or absence, and, where such negations alone are attached to a representation, the non-existence of anything corresponding to the representation. Now, a negation cannot be cogitated as determined, without cogitating at the same time the opposite affirmation. The man born blind has not the least notion of darkness, because he has none of the light. The vagabond knows nothing of poverty, because he has never known what it is to be in comfort. Footnote 65 The investigations and calculations of astronomers have taught us much that is wonderful, but the most important lesson we have received from them is the discovery of the abyss of our ignorance in relation to the universe, an ignorance the magnitude of which reason without the information thus derived, could never have conceived. This discovery of our deficiencies must produce a great change in the determination of the aims of human reason. End footnote. The ignorant man has no conception of his ignorance, because he has no conception of knowledge. All conceptions of negatives are accordingly derived or deduced conceptions, and realities contain the data and, so to speak, the material or transcendental content of the possibility and complete determination of all things. If, therefore, a transcendental substratum lies at the foundation 
of the complete determination of things, a substratum which is to form the fund from which all possible predicates of things are to be supplied, this substratum cannot be anything else than the idea of a sum total of reality. Omnitudo realitatis. In this view, negations are nothing but limitations, a term which could not, with propriety, be applied to them, if the unlimited, the all, did not form the true basis of our conception. This conception of a sum total of reality is the conception of a thing in itself, regarded as completely determined, and the conception of an ens realissimum is the conception of an individual being, inasmuch as it is determined by that predicate of all possible contradictory predicates, which indicates and belongs to being. It is, therefore, a transcendental ideal which forms the basis of the complete determination of everything that exists, and is the highest material condition of its possibility, a condition on which must rest the cogitation of all objects with respect to their content. Nay, more, this ideal is the only proper ideal of which the human mind is capable, because in this case alone a general conception of a thing is completely determined by and through itself, and cognized as the representation of an individuum. The logical determination of a conception is based upon a disjunctive syllogism, the major of which contains the logical division of the extent of a general conception. The minor limits this extent to a certain part, while the conclusion determines the conception by this part. The general conception of a reality cannot be divided a priori, because, without the aid of experience, we cannot know any determinate kinds of reality, standing under the former as the genus. The transcendental principle of the complete determination of all things is therefore merely the representation of the sum total of all reality. It is not a conception which is the genus of all predicates under itself, but one which comprehends them all within itself. The complete determination of a thing is consequently based upon the limitation of this total of reality. So much being predicated of the thing, while all that remains over is excluded. A procedure which is in exact agreement with that of the disjunctive syllogism and the determination of the objects in the conclusion by one of the members of the division. It follows that reason, in laying the transcendental ideal at the foundation of its determination of all possible things, takes a course in exact analogy with that which it pursues in disjunctive syllogisms, a proposition which formed the basis of the systematic division of all transcendental ideas, according to which they are produced in complete parallelism with the three modes of syllogistic reasoning employed by the human mind. It is self-evident that reason, in cogitating the necessary complete determination of things, does not presuppose the existence of a being corresponding to its ideal, but merely the idea of the ideal, for the purpose of deducing from the unconditional totality of complete determination. The ideal is therefore the prototype of all things, which, as defective copies, ectipa, receive from it the material of their possibility, and approximate to it more or less, though it is impossible that they can ever attain to its perfection. The possibility of things must therefore be regarded as derived, except that of the thing which contains in itself all reality, which must be considered to be primitive and original. For all negations, and they are the only predicates by means of which all other things can be distinguished from the ans realismum, are mere limitations of a greater and a higher, nay, the highest, reality. And they consequently presuppose this reality, and are, as regards their content, derived from it. The manifold nature of things is only an infinitely various mode of limiting the conception of the highest reality, which is their common substratum, just as all figures are possible only as different modes of limiting infinite space. The object of the ideal of reason, an object existing only in reason itself, is also termed the primal being, ans originarium, 
as having no existence superior to him, the supreme being, ans summum, and as being the condition of all other beings, which rank under it, the being of all beings, ans antium. But none of these terms indicate the objective relation of an actually existing object to other things, but merely that of an idea to conceptions, and our investigations into this subject still leave us in perfect uncertainty with regard to the existence of this being. A primal being cannot be said to consist of many other beings with an existence which is derivative, for the latter presuppose the former, and therefore cannot be constitutive parts of it. It follows that the ideal of the primal being must be cogitated as simple. The deduction of the possibility of all other things from this primal being cannot, strictly speaking, be considered as a limitation, or as a kind of division of its reality, for this would be regarding the primal being as a mere aggregate, which has been shown to be impossible, although it was so represented in our first rough sketch. The highest reality must be regarded rather as the ground than as the sum total of the possibility of all things, and the manifold nature of things be based not upon the limitation of the primal being itself, but upon the complete series of effects which flow from it. And thus all our powers of sense, as well as all phenomenal reality, may be with propriety regarded as belonging to this series of effects while they could not have formed parts of the idea, considered as an aggregate. Pursuing this track, and hypothesizing this idea, we shall find ourselves authorized to determine our notion of the supreme being by means of the mere conception of a highest reality, as one, simple, all-sufficient, eternal, and so on, in one word, to determine it in its unconditioned completeness by the aid of every possible predicate. The conception of such a being is the conception of God in its transcendental sense, and thus the idea of pure reason is the object matter of a transcendental theology. But, by such an employment of the transcendental idea, we should be overstepping the limits of its validity and purpose. For reason placed it, as the conception of all reality, at the basis of the complete determination of things, without requiring that this conception be regarded as the conception of an objective existence. Such an existence would be purely fictitious, and the hypothesizing of the content of the idea into an ideal, as an individual being, is a step perfectly unauthorized. Nay, more, we are not even called upon to assume the possibility of such an hypothesis, as none of the deductions drawn from such an ideal would affect the complete determination of things in general, for the sake of which alone is the idea necessary. It is not sufficient to circumscribe the procedure and the dialectic of reason. We must also endeavor to discover the sources of this dialectic, that we may have it in our power to give a rational explanation of this illusion, as a phenomenon of the human mind. For the ideal, of which we are at present speaking, is based not upon an arbitrary, but upon a natural, idea. The question hence arises. How happens it that reason regards the possibility of all things as deduced from a single possibility, that, to wit, of the highest reality, and presupposes this as existing in an individual and primal being? The answer is ready. It is at once presented by the procedure of transcendental analytic. The possibility of sensuous objects is a relation of these objects to thought, in which something, the empirical form, may be cogitated a priori, while that which constitutes the matter, the reality of the phenomenon, that element which corresponds to sensation, must be given from without, as otherwise it could not even be cogitated by, nor could its possibility be presentable to the mind. Now a sensuous object is completely determined, when it has been compared with all phenomenal predicates, and represented by means of these either positively or negatively. But, as that which constitutes the thing itself, the real in a phenomenon, must be given, and that in which the real of all phenomena is given, is experience. 
one, sole, and all-embracing, the material of the possibility of all sensuous objects must be presupposed as given in a whole, and it is upon the limitation of this whole that the possibility of all empirical objects, their distinction from each other and their complete determination, are based. Now, no other objects are presented to us besides sensuous objects, and these can be given only in connection with a possible experience. It follows that a thing is not an object to us unless it presupposes the whole or sum total of empirical reality as the condition of its possibility. Now, a natural illusion leads us to consider this principle, which is valid only of sensuous objects, as valid with regards to things in general. And thus, we are induced to hold the empirical principle of our conceptions of the possibility of things, as phenomena, by leaving out this limitative condition to be a transcendental principle of the possibility of things in general. We proceed afterwards to hypothesize this idea of the sum total of all reality, by changing the distributive unity of the empirical exercise of the understanding into the collective unity of an empirical whole a dialectical illusion, and by cogitating this whole or sum of experience as an individual thing, containing in itself all empirical reality. This individual thing or being is then, by means of the above-mentioned transcendental surreption, substituted for our notion of a thing which stands at the head of the possibility of all things, the real conditions of whose complete determination it presents. Footnote 66. This ideal of the ens realissimum, although merely a mental representation, is first objectivized, that is, has an objective existence attributed to it, then hypostasized, and finally by the natural progress of reason to the completion of unity personified, as we shall show presently. For the regulative unity of experience is not based upon phenomena themselves but upon the connection of the variety of phenomena by the understanding in a consciousness, and thus the unity of the supreme reality and the complete determinability of all things seem to reside in a supreme understanding and consequently in a conscious intelligence. End footnote. End of section. Section 34 The Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant Transcendental Doctrine of Elements Part 2nd Transcendental Logic 2nd Division Transcendental Dialectic Book 2 Of the Dialectical Procedure of Pure Reason Chapter 3 The Ideal of Pure Reason Sections 3 and 4. Recording by M. L. Cohen, Cleveland, Ohio, March 2007. Of the arguments employed by speculative reason in proof of the existence of a supreme being. Notwithstanding the pressing necessity which reason feels to form some presupposition that shall serve the understanding as a proper basis for the complete determination of its conceptions, the idealistic and factitious nature of such a presupposition is all too evident to allow reason for a moment to persuade itself into a belief of the objective existence of a mere creation of its own thought. But there are other considerations which compel reason to seek out some resting place in the regress from the conditioned to the unconditioned, which is not given as an actual existence from the mere conception of it, although it alone can give completeness to the series of conditions. And this is the natural course of every human reason even of the most uneducated, although the path at first entered it does not always continue to follow. It does not begin from conceptions, but from common experience, and requires a basis in actual existence. But this basis is insecure, unless it rests upon the immovable rock of the absolutely necessary. And this foundation is itself unworthy of trust, if it leave under and above it empty space if it do not fill all and leave no room for a why or wherefore, if it be not in one word infinite in its reality. 
If we admit the existence of some one thing, whatever it may be, we must also admit that there is something which exists necessarily. For what is contingent exists only under the condition of some other thing, which as its cause, and from this we must go on to conclude the existence of a cause which is not contingent, and which consequently exists necessarily and unconditionally. Such is the argument by which reason justifies its advances towards a primal being. Now reason looks round for the conception of a being that may be admitted, without inconsistency, to be worthy of the attribute of absolute necessity, not for the purpose of inferring a priori from the conception of such a being its objective existence, parens, for if reason allowed itself to take this course, it would not require a basis in given an actual existence, but merely the support of pure conceptions, close parens, but for the purpose of discovering among all our conceptions of possible things, that conception which possesses no element inconsistent with the idea of absolute necessity. For that there must be some absolutely necessary existence, it regards as a truth already established. Now, if it can remove every existence incapable of supporting the attribute of absolute necessity, excepting one, this must be the absolutely necessary being, whether its necessity is comprehensible by us, that is, deductible for the conception of it alone, or not. Now that, the conception of which contains a therefore to every wherefore, which is not defective in any respect whatever, which is all-sufficient as a condition, seems to be the being of which we can justly predict absolute necessity, for this reason, that, possessing the conditions of all that is possible, it does not and cannot itself require any condition. And thus it satisfies, in one respect at least, the requirements of the conception of absolute necessity. In this view, it is superior to all other conceptions which, as deficient and incomplete, do not possess the characteristic of independence of all higher conditions. It is true that we cannot infer from this what does not contain in itself the supreme and complete condition. The condition of all other things must possess only a conditioned existence, but as little can we assert the contrary, for this supposed being does not possess the only characteristic which can enable reason to cognize by means of an a priori conception the unconditioned and necessary nature of its existence. The conception of an ans realism is that which best agrees with the conception of an unconditioned and necessary being. The former conception does not satisfy all the requirements of the latter, but we have no choice. We are obliged to adhere to it, for we find that we cannot do without the existence of a necessary being. And even, although we admit it, we find it out of our power to discover in the whole sphere of possibility any being that could advance well-grounded claims is such a distinction. The following is, therefore, the natural course of human reason. It begins by persuading itself of the existence of some necessary being. In this being, it recognizes the characteristics of unconditioned existence. It then seeks the conception of that which is independent of all conditions and finds it in that which is itself the sufficient condition of all other things, in other words, in that which contains all reality. But the unlimited all is an absolute unity, and is conceived by the mind as a being, one and supreme, and thus reason concludes that the supreme being, as the primal basis of all things, possesses an existence which is absolutely necessary. This conception must be regarded as in some degree satisfactory if we admit the existence of a necessary being and consider that there exists a necessity for a definite and final answer to these questions. In such a case, we cannot make a better choice, or rather, we have no choice at all, but feel ourselves obliged to declare in favor of the absolute unity of complete reality as the highest source of the possibility of things. But if there exists no motive for coming to a definite conclusion, and we may leave the question unanswered till we have fully weighed both sides, in other words, when we are merely called upon to decide how much we happen to know about the question, and how much we merely flatter ourselves that we know, the above conclusion does not appear to be so great advantage, but, on the contrary, seems defective in the grounds upon which it is supported. 4. 
admitting the truth of all that has been said, that namely the inference from a given existence, parentheses my own for example, and parentheses, to the existence of an unconditioned and necessary being is valid and unassailable, that in the second place we must consider a being which contains all reality, and consequently all the conditions of other things, to be absolutely unconditioned, and admitting too that we have thus discovered the conception of a thing to which may be attributed without inconsistency absolute necessity, it does not follow from all this that the conception of a limited being, in which the supreme reality does not reside, is therefore incompatible with the idea of absolute necessity. For although I do not discover the element of the unconditioned in the conception of such a being, an element which is manifestly existent in the sum total of all conditions, I am not entitled to conclude that its existence is therefore conditioned, just as I am not entitled to affirm, in a hypothetical syllogism, that where a certain condition does not exist, parens, in the present completeness as far as pure conceptions are concerned, close parens, the condition does not exist either. On the contrary, we are free to consider all limited beings as likewise unconditionally necessary, although we are unable to infer this from the general conception which we have of them. Thus conducted, this argument is incapable of giving us the least notion of the properties of a necessary being, and must be in every respect without result. This argument continues, however, to possess a weight and an authority which, in spite of its objective insufficiency, it has never been divested of. For, granting that certain responsibilities lie upon us, which, as based on the ideas of reason, deserve to be respected and submitted to, although they are incapable of a real or practical application to our nature, or, in other words, would be responsibilities without motives, except upon the supposition of a supreme being to give effect and influence to the practical laws, in such case we should be bound to obey our conceptions which, although objectively insufficient, do, according to the standard of reason, preponderate over and are superior to any claims that may be advanced from any other quarter. The equilibrium of doubt would in this case be destroyed by a practical addition. Indeed, reason would be compelled to condemn herself if she refused to comply with the demands of the judgment, no superior to which we know, however defective her understanding of the grounds of these demands might be. This argument, although in fact transcendental, inasmuch as it rests upon the intrinsic insufficiency of the contingent, is so simple and natural that the commonest understanding can appreciate its value. We see things around us change, arise, and pass away. They or their condition must therefore have a cause. The same demand must again be made of the cause itself, as a datum of experience. Now it is natural that we should place the highest causality just where we place the supreme causality, in that being which contains the conditions of all possible effects, and the conception of which is so simple as that of an all-embracing reality. This highest cause, then, we regard as absolutely necessary, because we find it absolutely necessary to rise to it, and do not discover any reason for proceeding beyond it. Thus, among all nations, through the darkest polytheism glimmer some faint sparks of monotheism, to which these idolaters have been led, not from reflection and profound thought, but by the study and natural progress of the common understanding. There are only three modes of proving the existence of a deity, on the grounds of speculative reason. All the paths conducting to this end begin either from the determinate experience and the peculiar constitution of the world of sense, and rise according to the laws of causality from it to the highest cause existing apart from the world, or from a purely indeterminate experience, that is, some empirical existence, or abstraction is made of all experience, and the existence of a supreme cause is concluded from a priori conceptions alone. The first is the physiotheological argument, the second the cosmological, the third the ontological. More there are not and more there cannot be. I shall show it as unsuccessful on the one path, the empirical, as on the other, the transcendental, and that it stretches its wings in vain to soar beyond the world of sense by the mere might of speculative thought. As regards the order in which we must discuss those arguments, 
it will be exactly the reverse of that in which reason, in the progress of its development, attains to them, the order in which they are placed above. For it will be made manifest to the reader that, although experience presents the occasion and the starting point, it is the transcendental idea of reason which guides it in its pilgrimage and is the goal of all its struggles. I shall therefore begin with an examination of the transcendental argument, and afterwards inquire what additional strength has accrued to this mode of proof from the addition of the empirical element. Section Roman numeral 4 Of the impossibility of an ontological proof of the existence of God. It is evident from what has been said that the conception of an absolute necessary being is a mere idea, the objective reality of which is far from being established by the mere fact it is a need of reason. On the contrary, this idea serves merely to indicate a certain unattainable perfection and rather limits the operations than, by the presentation of new objects, extends the sphere of the understanding. But a strange anomaly meets us at the very threshold. For the inference from a given existence in general to an absolutely necessary existence seems to be correct and unavoidable, while the conditions of the understanding refuse to aid us in forming any conception of such a being. Philosophers have always talked of an absolutely necessary being, and have nevertheless declined to take the trouble of conceiving whether, and how, a being of this nature is even cogitable, not to mention that its existence is actually demonstrable. A verbal definition of the conception is certainly easy enough. It is something the non-existence of which is impossible. But does this definition throw any light upon the conditions which render it impossible to cogitate the non-existence of a thing? Conditions which we wish to ascertain that we may discover whether we think anything in the conception of such a being or not? For the mere fact that I throw away, by means of the word unconditioned, all the conditions which the understanding habitually requires in order to regard anything as necessary is very far from making clear whether by means of the conception of the unconditionally necessary I think of something, or really of nothing at all. Nay, more, this chance conception, now become so current, may have endeavored to explain by examples which seem to render any inquiries regarding its intelligibility quite needless. Every geometrical proposition, a triangle has three angles, it was said is absolutely necessary, and thus people talked of an object which lay out of the sphere of understanding, as if it were perfectly plain what the conception of such a being meant. All the examples adduced have been drawn, without exception, from judgments and not from things. But the unconditioned necessity of a judgment does not form the absolute necessity of a thing. On the contrary, the absolute necessity of a judgment is only a conditioned necessity of a thing or of the predicate in the judgment. The proposition above mentioned does not announce that three angles necessarily exist, but, upon condition that a triangle exists, three angles must necessarily exist in it. And thus, this logical necessity has been the source of the greatest delusions. Having formed an a priori conception of a thing, the content of which was made to embrace existence, we believed ourselves, safe in concluding that, because existence belongs necessarily to the object of the conception, parens, that is, under the condition of my positing this thing as given, close parens, the existence of the thing is also posited necessarily, and that it is therefore absolutely necessary, merely because its existence has been cogitated in the conception. If, in an identical judgment, I annihilate the predicate in thought and retain the subject, a contradiction is the result, and hence I say, the former belongs necessarily to the latter. But if I suppress both subject and predicate in thought, no contradiction arises, for there is nothing at all and therefore no means of forming a contradiction. To suppose the existence of a triangle, and not that of its three angles, is self-contradictory, but to suppose the non-existence of both triangle and angles is perfectly admissible. And so it is with the conception of an absolutely necessary being. Annihilate its existence in thought, and you annihilate the thing itself with all its predicates. How then can there be any room for contradiction? Externally, there is nothing to give rise to a contradiction. For a thing cannot be necessary externally nor internally, for, by the annihilation of suppression of the thing itself, 
its internal properties are also annihilated. God is omnipotent. That is a necessary judgment. His omnipotence cannot be denied if the existence of a deity is posited, the existence, that is, of an infinite being, the two conceptions being identical. But when you say, God does not exist, neither omnipotence nor any other predicate is affirmed. They must all disappear with the subject, and in this judgment there cannot exist the least self-contradiction. You have thus seen that when the predicate of a judgment is annihilated in thought along with its subject, no internal contradiction can arise, be the predicate what it may. There is no possibility of evading the conclusion. You find yourselves compelled to declare, there are certain subjects which cannot be annihilated in thought. But this is nothing more than saying, there exist subjects which are absolutely necessary, the very hypothesis which you are called upon to establish. For I find myself unable to form the slightest conception of a thing which, when annihilated in thought with all its predicates, leaves behind a contradiction. And contradiction is the only criterion of impossibility in the sphere of pure a priori conceptions. Against these general considerations, the justice of which no one can dispute, one argument is adduced, which is regarded as furnishing a satisfactory demonstration from the fact. It is affirmed that there is one and only one conception in which the non-being or annihilation of the object is self-contradictory, and this is the conception of an ans realissimum. It possesses, you say, all reality, and you feel yourselves justified in admitting the possibility of such a being. Friends, this I am willing to grant for the present, although the existence of a conception which is not self-contradictory is far from being sufficient to prove the possibility of an object. Close parens. Footnote. A conception is always possible if it is not self-contradictory. This is the logical criterion of possibility distinguishing the object of such conception from the nihil negativum. But it may be, notwithstanding, an empty conception, unless the objective reality of the synthesis, but which it has generated, is demonstrated. And proof of this kind must be based upon principles of possible experience, and not upon the principle of analysis or contradiction. This remark may be serviceable as a warning against concluding from the possibility of a conception, which is logical, the possibility of a thing, which is real. End footnote. Now the notion of all reality embraces in it that of existence. The notion of all existence lies, therefore, in the conception of this possible thing. If this thing is annihilated in thought, the internal possibility of the thing is also annihilated, which is self-contradictory. I answer. It is absurd to introduce, under whatever term disguised, into the conception of a thing which is to be cogitated solely in reference to its possibility, the conception of its existence. If this is admitted, you will have apparently gained the day, but in reality have announced nothing but a mere tautology. I ask, is the proposition, this or that thing, prens, which I am admitting to be possible, close prens, exists an analytical or a synthetical proposition? If the former, there is no addition made to the subject of your thought by the affirmation of its existence. But then, the conception in your mind is identical with the thing itself, or you have supposed the existence of a thing to be possible, and then inferred its existence from its internal possibility, which is but a miserable tautology. The word reality in the conception of the thing and the word existence in the conception of the predicate will not help you out of the difficulty. For supposing you were to term all positing of a thing reality, you have thereby posited the thing with all its predicates in the conception of the subject and assumed its actual existence, and this you merely repeat in the predicate. But if you confess, as every reasonable person must, that every existential proposition is synthetical, how can it be maintained that the predicate of existence cannot be denied without contradiction? a property which is the characteristic of analytical propositions, alone. I should have a reasonable hope of putting an end forever to this sophistical mode of argumentation. By a strict definition of the conception of existence, did not my own experience teach me that the illusion arising from our confounding a logical with a real predicate, parens, a predicate which aids in the determination of a thing, and parens, resists almost all endeavors of explanation and illustration. A logical predicate may be what you please. Even the subject may be predicated of itself, 
for logic pays no regard to the content of a judgment. But the determination of a conception is a predicate, which adds to and enlarges the conception. It must not, therefore, be contained in the conception. Being is evidently not a real predicate, that is, a conception of something which is added to the conception of some other thing. It is merely the positing of a thing, or of certain determinations in it. Logically, it is merely the copula of a judgment. The preposition, God is omnipotent, contains two conceptions, which have a certain object or content. The word is, is no additional predicate. It merely indicates the relation of the predicate to the subject. Now if I take the subject, parentheses God and parentheses, with all its predicates, parentheses, omnipotence being one, close parentheses, and say God is, or there is a God, I add no new predicate to the conceptions of God. I merely posit or affirm the existence of the subject with all its predicates. I posit the object in relation to my conception. The content of both is the same, and there is no addition made to the conception which expresses merely the possibility of the object by my cogitating the object, in the expression, it is, as absolutely given or existing. Thus the real contains no more than the possible. A hundred real dollars contain no more than a hundred possible dollars. For, as the latter indicates the conception, and the former the object, on the supposition that the content of the former was greater than that of the latter, my conception would not be an expression of the whole object and would consequently be an inadequate conception of it. But in reckoning my wealth there may be said to be more in a hundred real dollars than in a hundred possible dollars, that is, in the mere conception of them. For the real object, the dollars, is not analytically contained in my conception but forms a synthetical addition to my conception. Parens, which is merely a determination of my mental state, close parens, although this objective reality, this existence, apart from my conceptions, does not in the least degree increase the aforesaid hundred dollars. By whatever and by whatever number of predicates, even to the complete determination of it, I may cogitate a thing, I do not in the least augment the object of my conceptions by the addition of the statement, this thing exists. Otherwise, not exactly the same, but something more than what was cogitated in my conception would exist, and I could not affirm that the exact object of my conception had real existence. If I cogitate a thing as containing all modes of reality except one, the mode of reality which is absent is not added to the conception of the thing by the affirmation that the thing exists. On the contrary, the thing exists, if it exists at all, with the same defect as that cogitated in its conception otherwise not that which was cogitated but something different exists. Now, if I cogitate a being as the highest reality without defect or imperfection, the question still remains whether this being exists or not. For although no element is wanting in the possible real content of my conception, there is a defect in its relation to my mental state. That is, I am ignorant whether the cognition of the object indicated by the conception is possible a posteriori. And here the cause of the present difficulty becomes apparent. If the question regarded an object of sense merely, it would be impossible for me to confound the conception with the existence of a thing. For the conception merely enables me to cogitate an object as according with the general conditions of experience, while the existence of the object permits me to cogitate it as contained in the sphere of actual experience. At the same time, this connection with the world of experience does not in the least augment the conception, although a possible perception has been added to the experience of the mind. But if we cogitate existence by the pure category alone, it is not to be wondered at that we should find ourselves unable to present any criterion sufficient to distinguish it from mere possibility. Whatever be the content of our conception of an object, it is necessary to go beyond it if we wish to predicate existence of the object. In the case of sensuous objects, this is attained by their connection, according to empirical laws, with some one of my perceptions. But there is no means of cognizing the existence of objects of pure thought, because it must be cognized completely a priori. But all our knowledge of existence, parens, be it immediately by perception, or by inferences connecting some object with a perception, close parens, 
belongs entirely to the sphere of experience, which is in a perfect unity with itself, and although an existence out of the sphere cannot be absolutely declared to be impossible, it is a hypothesis the truth of which we have no means of ascertaining. The notion of a supreme being is in many respects a highly useful idea, but for the very reason that it is an idea, it is incapable of enlarging our cognition with regard to the existence of things. It is not even sufficient to instruct us as to the possibility of a being which we do not know to exist. The analytical criterion of possibility, which consists in the absence of contradiction in propositions, cannot be denied it. But the connection of real properties in a thing is a synthesis of the possibility of which an a priori judgment cannot be formed, because these realities are not presented to us specifically. And even if this were to happen, a judgment would still be impossible, because the criterion of the possibility of synthetical cognitions must be sought for in the world of experience, to which the object and idea cannot belong. And thus the celebrated Leibniz has utterly failed in his attempt to establish upon a priori grounds the possibility of this sublime ideal being. The celebrated ontological or Cartesian argument for the existence of a supreme being is therefore insufficient, and we may as well hope to increase our stock of knowledge by the aid of mere ideas, as the merchant to augment his wealth by the addition of noughts to his cash account. End of section 34